Good morning, everyone. I know it's early. Well, it's early for me. Shouldn't be that early for the rest of y'all. Um, nice, okay. All right, so let's see what we got going on here. Oh, I may have to do this on my other account. We shall see. Okay, so this is Cassandra Faye Floyd, also known as the Daughter of the Fates, founder of the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence. And I... And back at y'all after a long hiatus. Greetings, Eve loves love. Greetings, the sage. Greetings, everyone tuning in via IG. You feel me? Chad Limity. Greetings, Akeem. So y'all know me, right? I don't usually get up early on no Sunday you know, on purpose, you feel me? But today is the day of days, and I said, Tajali, Taj, Tajali, Tajali. I got that right, my accent was messed up. Um, today is the day of days, I hope y'all ready. Today is the day of days. And so I said, let me get up early because I got to work today. To make up for a lot of time off, I was injured and couldn't work for a little while. And uh, so I have to work today. So I said, let me get up early because I can't let another day go by. I could just feel the angst growing up in you since, <laughs> since the last time I was live, yo. Because I know it was a lot that I dropped on y'all. I know it was a lot. Um, let me put on my little earrings that I love so much. Greetings, flow with earth on IG. Yeah, baby, let me tell you. So today is going to be one of them days where y'all are going to have to be prepared to take a walk with me. Okay? Yes. Greetings, Brahmana, Brahmana Bhava. <sighs> okay, let's see. Service is not connected. They will need to contact, let's see, connect their mic and cam before you can add them to the stream. RBL, who is RBL? Who is RBL? I don't know who that is. I sent out the um the little link for our people to join the stream pretty far and wide. But I'm going to need to know who you are before I let you on here. I don't need nobody ransacking my shit or trying to blindside me. You feel me? Yes. Yes. So anyway, all right. Yeah. I, hey, Marie, Kali, Carly. I know it's been a long time. It's, well, it seems like it's been a long time, but it's actually only been a, a little over a week, a day over a week since the last time y'all heard from me. And um, the last time y'all heard from me was deep. It was rabbit hole deep. It was wormhole deep. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, which I'm sure by this time, the majority of you who I see, hey, 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 sister friend. All right. Yeah, that last <laughs> that last one was a doozy. <laughs> I was like, what? Okay, listen, I'm about to post that. Um, yeah, I know, babe. It was for me too. It was for me too. And it, I'll be honest, I didn't want to rush um to do a follow-up. Um, let me tell you, I got plenty of emails and comments from so many of you, and I understand 
why I got those emails. And I understand the spirit of every single one of them because the same everything that everybody said was exactly the same way that I felt. When I tell you that was the reason that I got up when I did to do the live was because I was like, I don't, <laughs> I told you. It wasn't the first time I had received that download. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not putting that out. Greetings, Reverend Brianna Lynn. I ain't putting that out. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So I got up that morning and went ahead and did it. I'm going to try to keep this very concise because, um, yeah, anyway. Oh, Reverend Brianna Lynn, I see. I got it now. Okay, cool. So I'm going to bring you on in a minute because um, I want to do this little intro and then I'll segue to the section that I want you to um, come up on the live stream, darling. So anyway, this last week, for those that don't know, um, I got up one morning last week, Saturday, I think, and had a message for y'all. It was a straight download, came straight from out of left field. It was called, for those that don't know, it was the last live that I did was called um, God, is a, God is the Moment. God is the Moment, right? And to just keep this section brief, because there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. A lot happens in my life in a week, right? Let's see. Tajali said, um, I watched the God video yesterday. <laughs> she, she said she watched it yesterday and couldn't sleep. <laughs> it was, yeah, man, it was deep. It was deep. It was deep. And, um, and it continues to be um, impactful, daily impactful. And, um, and I want to say some things right away, right off the jump, because I don't think to, I think that is going to be like a separate deep dive. But I do want to say some things right off jump. Because I was still in my feelings about what had come through me, you know, I prefaced that live by saying, I don't know, I feel like it's going to change. It's going to change everything I've ever done. It's going to change everything I've ever said. It's going to change the way I do videos in the future. You know, I was really in my feelings. I was like, it's just going to change everything. Right. And it's not because upon going to sleep and re-waking and re-listening to it, it doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change a thing. I say this all the time. Multiple things can be true at the same time. Multiple things are true at the same time. Multiple things are true at the same time. The truth is the truth. But that doesn't mean that there is one truth. There are multiple things can be true at the same time. Right. And so. This thing. I, I still, I still believe the essence. Let me, let me correct that. I still accept the essence of that message that came through. That for me, the thing that made, made it make sense was the same thing I had said before about other things. Like um, I used to say when I was in the movement, kind of the same thing. This is years ago. When I was in the movement, I used to say the same thing. I used to say, you know, um, Black people cannot continue to say that we're the first, that we're the first on the earth, that we're the first. Black people cannot continue to say that without being able to do an honest, deep historical analysis of the role that we played that allowed us to be in this point, in this moment. All of the criticisms that we have, all of the grief and the beef, legitimate criticisms that we have of others, right? Because white people ain't our only problem. We've got 2,000 years of Arab slavery on the continent prior to white slavery, European slavery, right? 
And so we have to be honest enough with ourselves to do an assessment of history and the role that we played and how we got here, how we arrived at this moment in history, right? To accept this hyper romanticized idea that everything was blissful and um, utopian in Africa, uh, to accept, to believe that everything was awesome and utopian in Asia, to believe that everything was pristine uh, and utopian in the Americas. And the only thing wrong that ever happened to us was us meeting Europeans is it, <clears throat> kindergartenish at best. It's a really, it's a really, um, it is a real, we do, a, we do our people a real disservice to have that kind of analysis about how we arrived at this moment, how we got here. You understand? And, and then I, you know, it's easy to get sidetracked, not sidetracked. It's easy because it's difficult. It's easy to, um, it's easy to get hyper-focused on the present. So hyper-focused that, that you, you, um, that you, um, shirk the responsibility of doing the deep historical analysis that would allow you to change time. Listen to what I'm telling you. It's easy to get hyper-focused on this thing that we call colonialism or oppression, the many ways that it shows itself without doing a historical analysis, a genuine, deep, thorough historical analysis that changes time, that changes time. And so here we are again, me having this conversation, trying to understand best, because that's all I want to do. I want to understand how we arrived at this moment so that we can change it, so that we can um, be radically impactful. I'm looking for something in how we change it. Give me a second, because this is going to distract me if I don't find it. Now, let me tell you why this is all important. I had a, you know, I saw this video a few weeks ago of this girl who was talking about some kind of reading she got, some kind of spiritual reading she got, or maybe it's a psychological process, something like that. And then I heard it reiterated a couple of weeks ago by another girlfriend, and it reminded me of the kind of um, work I've been doing on myself, like in my journaling, going back, like I always tell you, I always tell y'all that it's important for us in this moment to go back into the foundational years of our life, which are zero to 18. Those are the years of our lives that kind of set the patterns, whether those are good patterns or bad patterns, set the patterns for how we are in the rest of our lives. And they are monumental these moments, but we spend so much time focusing on, quote, the traumas of our childhood that we miss monumental things that can help us in this moment. And so the key for me was using my journaling, using going back through my memory banks, jotting down huge moments and memories and rewriting them. And I heard this girl talk about it. And I was like, oh, my God, that's what I've been doing intuitively. She talked about maybe it was like, um, I can't remember the girl's name. It was something I saw in passing, but it stood out. She was saying how um, she had this memory when she was a child. And she was in her room by herself, right? It was at night. And she had this vision. It didn't feel like a dream. She said it felt like a vision that this woman came into her room, right? And 
Um, and the woman said something. I forget how it went. I'm going to see if I can find it. Probably not. But she basically, she was saying that two versions of her adult self had come to her room that night, but she thought they were some women that she didn't know. These women came to her in a waking vision, right? Because she was scared about something in her life. And so this woman who looked like she was in her 20s came to her in her room and took her hand or something. And then the older woman came and, and took her hand and walked her out of this place where she was scared, right? And it wasn't until she was an adult doing these like, um, you know, therapies or something that were like helping her to retrieve moments in her childhood that she realized that the two women that came to visit her that night in this waking vision was herself, right? And let me tell you, I have done this where I have gone back into my past with the information that I have now. And I started doing this as soon as I became a devotee of Ifa. Of course, I didn't know this was what I was doing, but I was going back to these, these monumental periods in my life that at the time I didn't have a language for. I didn't have the, the, um, the, the mores, the myths, the stories of the traditions of my ancestors. I didn't have that as a language. I didn't have African internationalism. I didn't have, you know, a direct lineage to Africa. So that was not a language that I had access to in my, you know, in my young, in my foundational years. So now that I had this language, right, I didn't have the language of, um, I didn't have the language of, you know, 10 years of medical school, of the language of traditional practices of medicine from all over the planet, from North and South and Central America, from India and from Europe and from Africa and from Asia. I didn't have that as context. I didn't have this as a language that would help to explain these things that had happened in my life. So I didn't have any impact at that moment, at that time in history, right? But now that I have this widely varied language, I can go back to my childhood and make sense, weave together these things that seemed like unrelated, crazy dreams or incidences that had nothing to do with what was to become my life, okay? That now that I have arrived at this place, will have this widely varied language through experiences, through through um, communication with others, through relationships, I can go back. I'm telling you crystal clear, go back to moments in my childhood and make something that didn't make sense become perfectly clear and know that that child in that moment is having an impact on me right now. Me going back and explaining self to this child with this new language has had an immediate impact on me. And I can give you examples. It ain't no shit I'm talking in conjecture. I am telling you, I can give you examples. Let me read some of y'all comments. Hold on. All the time, the victimization of self is crazy, but we yearn to return to those moments. We say that to claim a sense of superiority, but it's futile. I'm going to post this comment. Um, I'm gonna tell you, I ain't gonna go too deep into the incidences. Maybe that can, can, can somebody can timestamp this and that can be a whole live that I do the moments in my past that these languages gave life to and understanding to in my childhood and going back and telling that child what she was experiencing and how it was going to be impactful and it being immediately impactful. The reason that I am bringing this up is because we have been told this over and over and over again now. Re okay, like Reverend Brianna Land just says here, regression work, yes, inner child work, yes, based in indigenous practices and used in therapy, KKK, trauma-informed coaching, yes, this is a very effective work for healing, yes, and we do that. All of us are doing that now, you know, um, Facebook user. I don't know who Facebook user is. So if you tune in from Facebook, you have to announce yourself because all it says is Facebook user. It won't show me who you are. Um, Twitch and YouTube will, but, face, but um, Facebook, 
user. I, I don't know. It says mushrooms are very rich. In, uh, yeah. Okay. So this is a spammer. Anyway. So um, the reason I'm saying this is because we all hip to the game now. We didn't have this information in mass, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Right. This how we can, you know, um, you know, get past life regressions or regression work for our own personal childhood. You how do we how do we reparent our inner child and all of this stuff, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data that tells us why this is effective, how it is impactful to go back, to not ignore your childhood, to not see it something as something that you need to chronically escape from, right? Or chronically heal trauma from, right? So if that's the case, that we know, this is the point I was attempting to make with this. If we know that this thing works, too many people have talked about their experiences that this kind of work, right? To go back and know that when you go back and quote, reparent your inner child, when you go back and resolve or heal the trauma wounds from your childhood, when we go back and, um, you know, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, nourish, nurture our inner baby, right? When we go back and we do uh, all of this work, right? How the way that it heals is that it is immediately impactful in our present. Why? Because history is always present. Just like the future is always now, history is always now. It's always present in the moment, right this minute. Impactful in this minute, always and forever, always impactful, right? And so if that is the case, then it means we have to do the same work collectively to go back, to go back, not as if we're witnessing something that's long gone, to go back and to know, just like I told y'all last week, did I write it down? I don't know if I did, and, but I told y'all last week that um, when you're talking about the work that I am convinced it is going to take to be uh, to have a radical and rapid impact on the now is centering black women, but to not see that to not have a knee-jerk response and to not see that as something that's hierarchical or top-down, but to see that is more like the spiral. That this is where we are now. This is our origin. And if we can resolve, it's just like treat, it's just like, okay, this is homeopathy too. This homeopathy right here. Homeopathy says that yes, while you are here right now, this is where we is right now. This is where we began. Right, Jim. Homeopathy says that yes, in the present, this is where we are now. This is the present. This is where we began, right? This is the return to center. But what homeopathy teaches us is that, and it's a complicated system of medicine, but to attempt to oversimplify, right? Every disease ever on earth. It's um, the cause of the disease is called a miasm. I don't know how many of you remember this long conversation that I've had several times about the miasm, right? And the miasma, the miasm and the miasma. But all disease is the consequence of spiritual pollution. That's what homeopathy teaches. A spiritual pollution that continues for forever and if left unresolved becomes the origin or the seed, right? 
So in homeopathy, if you present right now, right now, with whatever you present with. So this is our collective condition. This is our collective disharmony we talking about. Is the now, is all the isms, right? That we are attempting to resolve. There's millions of them, you understand? Sexism, racism, colonialism, you know, capitalism, on all the isms and all the ways that the isms affect everybody on earth. Right? This is where we are right now. Homeopathy teaches that traumas, listen, Traumas left unresolved, right? Pile up on each other like the layers of onions. Because that trauma doesn't go anywhere if it's left unresolved, untreated. Another trauma happens and it piles on a layer. Another trauma happens and it becomes a layer. Another trauma happens and it becomes a layer. Until finally, when we have a, a physical expression of disease or disharmony, that's the final stage of years of the layering on or the piling on of trauma, right? Whether that's physical trauma, emotional trauma, spiritual trauma, right? And so homeopathy teaches that you have to do two things at once. You have to treat the symptoms to give, to give relief. But at the same time, you are still treating the, you are still treating, you are still healing the core, the origin, while peeling back the layers of the onion, peeling back the layers of the onion, peeling back the layers of the onion. You're doing two things at once. Now, my reason for using this as an analogy and why I say, because I say this is how we have to live. This is how we have to move, right? Centering the beginning knowing that everything we do to heal the beginning, to heal the origin, will have an immediate impact on the now. Everything that we do to uplift, raise, heal the center, heal the origin, heal the beginning, will have an immediate impact on the now, right? It will. It will reverberate through thousands of years of trauma simultaneously relieving the symptoms of the now while at the same time rooting out the core of what ails us all. And I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be over, overly simplistic, but my mother is always telling me, baby, keep it simple. Make it plain and keep it simple. And the thing that ails us all from the most malignant to the most benign is our separation, our perception of separation from our creator. That's what ails us all. And she is calling us all back. Everybody ain't going to heed the call, but she is calling us all back. There ain't no chosen. I hear a lot of people talking about the chosen, the chosen, the few, the few. Y'all, y'all are mistaken. Y'all are mistaken, at least in my estimation. Y'all are mistaken. Every woman whose body was parted in two to allow a being to come through her has been chosen, has been crowned with their mother's blood, baptized in their mother's water. This is the contract. This is the covenant. The only covenant is baptism in your mother's body and blood rituals on your crown, boo on your crown chakra, your, your crown consecrated in your mother's blood. That's it. We're all chosen. We all exist purposefully. And what that means is we all have the opportunity to heed the call. We all have the, op don't mean everybody will, but what we have to do is contend. We have to contend and we cannot contend with this old antiquated idea that it's going to be some talented 10th or it's going to be 1% of us, or it's going to be, you know, the chosen few who save the planet. It's not. We have to make the call far and wide. We have to weave the web and cast that motherfucker far and wide to call the mother's children back to her body, to end global isolation. Eight billion people on the planet, and we all feel like we by ourselves. We all feel like we alone. You understand? 
So that's what I'm telling you. And so I'm going to continue to reiterate it. Now, when I, let's see, uh, Akim says, it's like putting the pieces of a broken mirror back together and those fragmented lines disappear as you pick up, as you pick the piece, let's see, as you pick the pieces of you. Okay. Yes. I've been saying this for about four months now, separation, what we have brought into. Yes. So, okay. So let me go back to this thing that has got y'all all distraught. Because I had I had people genuinely and rightfully distraught about the download that I put on y'all a, a week ago. It hasn't changed. That's why I started by saying multiple things can be true at the same time, just like in the spiral. Right. Multiple things are happening in the spiral. You understand? And so. Um, what I said still stands. One of the things that we as women have to do is to accept that if we believe that we are microcosms of our mother, that we are um, we are the microcosms to her creative, her creative power, we are, right? That we are the conduits through which the mother's will to exist in different ways. Because what, what's the overall theme? For, for us, for the temple of evolutionary emergence. The overall theme is what um, Barbara Moore said in The Great Cosmic Mother when she was talking about this book here, The Search for Oneness. She said, mommy and I are one. These scientists said, I wonder what would happen if we ended the isolation that people experience, this, this, this severing in their minds from their mother. Mommy and I are one. And if that's the case, if mommy and I are one. And we have been told for 6,000 years that our mother is just some um, hmm, mechanical, faceless, nameless vessel responsible for keeping um, for keeping the ranks of the military um, well fed and to, to keep the assembly, the industrial assembly lines well stocked. That's all she's here for, is to crank out babies as cannon fodder and uh, as a cannon fodder and um, raw material for war and um, you know, raw uh, cheap material for um, industrial assembly lines. If that's all we are good for and our mothers have been turned into mechanized biological material for the sole purpose of cranking out babies under somebody else's control. You feel me? Um, there was a point I was going to make. Oh, then if, if there is no one, there's no wonder that we experience so much antagonisms, so many antagonisms, so much um, despair, so much split personalities where our mothers are concerned because we are born into a world that has been made miserable. And I know, like myself, at some juncture in our lives, we have blamed our mamas. We have said something, even if it's within ourselves, why she even had me? Why was I even born? This shit is terrible. The world is terrible. You know what I'm saying? Why they treat black people like this? Everywhere on earth, they treat black. Why my mama even had me? There's blame in that, right? There's despair in that. And we've all experienced it. That's a part of the severing, right? And so, um, but the download, the transmission from last week was about how, and it's not about blame. There were some women who emailed me really distraught. So what, you, you blaming women? Like, damn, man, I get so tired of people blaming black women for everything, blaming black women for everything. Maybe that's not what, that's not what the mother put on me. I get that's how it sound, it sounded, but that's not what the mother put on me last week. Greetings, Faith. I see you on here, boo. I'm, I'm making. I'm. You know me. My intros be kind of long, but I'm gonna pull y'all up in just a minute. Um. Okay. So anyway. Um. 
I think what I may have to do. Anyway, that's not what I was saying. And that's not what the mother was saying. That's not that's not what that's not what I felt when I said it, when I when I got it. What I felt was the same thing that I was saying about when I was in the movement and how, how we as African people can't we can't can't have it both ways. We can't talk about how we the first one here, how, you know, we gave technology and science to the world. And we did all these wonderful things and then not do an honest and thorough, complete historical analysis of the role that we played, of the role that we played and how we arrived at this moment. I just said to y'all last week, we all play a role in the maintenance of this bitch that we hate. We hate white supremacy. We hate white male domination of the planet. We hate patriarchy. But we daily, every last one of us, play a role in its preservation and its maintenance. That's how this bitch is designed, is for us to play a role in its preservation and its maintenance. That's the way the world is designed. We have to restructure. We have to recreate the now. That's the mission. The web that they have cast that have us all locked into it, guaranteeing that we participate, we have to recreate that. We are the fates. We have to reweave the whole world. So that those things that are a necessity in our lives, we do not feel burdened and guilty about having to own them because we know somebody else's suffering is intrinsically tied to our use of these products. That's what we have to do. We have to completely reshape and restructure the web. We have to recreate the world in the present. And so that's what got me on it is we as women, have to go back and say, okay, at what, what gave rise to this thing that we are witnessing? Because the violence that we see, the um, it's 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 like maniacal. It's it's maniacal, it's insane the quality and gravity of the violence that we see, especially against women, especially against children. The violence. The way it plays out, mass murder, serial killers, sadistic, insane, like wildly, we say stuff like, damn, how does this stuff even come up in a person's imagination? Like, where does this emanate from? Like, where does, how does, how does a mind come up with these kind of sick, twisted ideas, right? That's what I'm talking about. It's like maniacal insanity. It, and so I have to think about this like a doctor. I had to think about this like a person who understands Chinese medicine, who understands who understands five elements theory, right? And if I'm looking at it like that, and I know what happens um, pathologically, path, uh, pathogenically, how how one thing becomes another, the pathogenesis of how disease begins to express itself. And I know that all psychological disease, diagnosable, psychological conditions, psychopathy, sociopathy, bipolar disorder, manic depression, schizophrenia, all psychological disease, at least where five elements theory is concerned, where Chinese medicine is concerned, emanates from the heart, comes from the heart. How you treat these conditions is through treating the heart as the organ and the heart channel and the pericardium channel, right? But you treat the heart to stabilize conditions of the consciousness, of the mind, what we call the mind, right? This, this is science I am giving you, okay? This is science, that the heart is responsible in its expression of any kind of disharmony where the, or the organs may be impacting the heart. Causing this, causing the disharmony, but the heart governs the mind, the subconscious and the conscious mind. The heart does, okay. And you have the other organs that impact it, right? Those organs having their own emotional expressions: rage and resentment, frustration, anger. That's the liver, right? Fear and shock. That's the kidney. Grief. That's the lung. Um, worry, pensiveness, anxiety. That's the spleen. 
These are, these are the emotions and how they impact the organs. And all of those organs impact the heart because the heart is the emperor. The heart is the emperor. The heart directs everybody. The heart takes external information and allows the other organs to process it. Am I in danger? Am I in fear for my life? Do I need to survive in this moment? Is love present in my life? Is there something? Even so, all of these, all of the emotions they say are filtered by the heart and impact the other organs. So the heart is where joy and sadness are housed, right? But all of the emotions are filtered through the heart to go to be experienced by the other organs, right? Why am I telling y'all this? Because I just told y'all a week ago how the mother kicked my ass at five o'clock in the morning talking about you women have not allowed males to experience love the way you are afforded the opportunity to experience it. You have kept secret from your sons the what love feels like in your body when you become mother. They only experience half of that. They experience it as the recipient of this unbelievable love, this love that covers and protects and watches over, nourishes, works for, keeps your butt clean, keeps, make sure your, your baby cry in the middle of the night, you up. No questions asked. You ain't mad. You ain't angry. You ain't frustrated. You up, baby crying. They only experience that aspect of it. The all present, the ever present you as the loving, nurturing God to their baby, to their infancy, where it, I need mama to be two seconds away <laughs> because she is the center of, she the center of my universe, my mama, this, this person who I lived in her body for nine months, hearing her heartbeat on top of my head, feeling all her emotions on my body, in my body, surrounded on all sides by everything she was going through. And you have kept this a secret from your son. So while your sons can experience this massive amount of love as an infant to about two or three before we start telling them no and yelling at them and putting a nose in the corner and all of a sudden th that all that we can do no wrong them first two years right we can do no wrong they can cry 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 and all we do is want to make them happy all we want to do is heal the he, uh uh heal their hurt make them come bring them back to a state of happiness all we want to do is see them laugh all we want to do is see them smile all we want to do is create the environment that allows them to learn without fear. They have no fear as babies. We teach them that. And so we give our sons this a massive amount of love. And then they spend the next years of their life hearing everywhere, 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 everywhere that men ain't shit, that men are to be feared, that men are terrible, that men are always up to no good. And they hear that this is what they are to become after experiencing this enormous amount of love from their mother, from their mother. They are not to become mother. And so this, I was thinking about this because my grandson, I'm always talking about my granddaughter, Kalani, that's my boo, and how she changed me. Zane, my grandson, his birthday was yesterday. That boy softened me so much. And the reason why was watching him and my daughter together. This boy has such an incredibly big, big heart. And it is my fear that because I am not close enough and my baby is raising him by herself, that that bigness of his heart. He's such a gentle, sweet, sweet baby. He just turned four yesterday. And even now, just such a big hearted baby. Oh, he's so loving. He's so loving. And my fear is that society will take a hold of him and 
women nearby him, their hurt will take a hold of him and he too will become conflicted and angry in his little body because it's like manifest destiny. If he hears all the time that men are no good, men ain't shit, men are not to be trusted, la 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 la, that this is what he too will feel, will feel burdened to become. And how do we rectify this? This is not about blaming women. This is not about blaming women. This is also not about absolving men of fucked up behavior. It is not. Multiple things can be true at the same time. What this message said to me is that men are just as desperate as women to figure out what the fuck is wrong with them. And nobody is offering them a solution worth anything any goddamn way. Nobody is is offering them an explanation about even where their behavior comes from. We can call it things like toxic masculinity or misogyny or the this or the that or the this or the that. And none of that will be untrue. You feel me? What I am saying is, can we go deeper? Can we go deeper? Can we, while create, because this is what I'm always talking about with the temple. How do we create in real time what genuine independent sovereignty looks like? How do we create a safe space for human beings to be together, to be among each other and know that they are genuinely safe? What does independent sovereignty look like? Because we listen, we done all been there where we'd have been in these spaces among people that we quote trusted in spaces where we thought we were safe, where we felt safe, right? We'd have been in spiritual spaces. You feel me? We'd have been in political spaces. You feel me? revolutionary spaces. You feel me? We all on the same board. So we all want the same thing, you know, fight the power. I want to see a free and independent African nation. You feel me? I want to see a free and independent, um, uh, indigenous Western hemispheric indigenous people laying back, you feel me? And so we believe when we hear these, these dialogues, right? Come among us. And then to enter into these spaces, open hearted, because we like, yes, this is what it's about. This is what it's about to be betrayed in these spaces, to be betrayed in these spaces and to have another shell built up on our heart because we've been betrayed in spaces where we were supposed to be safe. But where did we establish in these spaces? Trust that is based on sovereignty, not some ambiguous bullshit that we just you know, pontificate. How do we establish genuine, because I am not one to be talking about in uh, national sovereignty. Y'all don't want to hear it. I do not give a fuck about national sovereignty. I don't. I don't. I don't. Ask me why I don't give a fuck about national sovereignty. Because every single solitary space that I have done political work, spiritual work, where the the leading dialogue is about national sovereignty, African sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty, 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 sovereignty for nations. In each one of those spaces, sovereignty was denied women in those spaces. Sovereignty was denied to individuals in those spaces. Sovereignty was denied to children in these spaces. Every time, every time. Tell, ask me an organization I've been associated with. I'll put them on blast. I don't care. Every single solitary space I have ever been in that purported to be the visionary that was going to change the world, the visionary organization, the visionary spiritual tradition, the visionary eh, 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 that was going to change the world while they talking out in the world about sovereignty and independence and freedom and shit for the group constantly, perpetually denying sovereignty to the individuals within the group that make up the group exploiting human beings labor in every organization in every under the guise of political unity in every single space yep 
treating children like appendages to the real work. Mm -hmm. That's happened. Yep. Um, exploiting the hearts of women in these organizations to create master multitaskers that just run, 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 do, 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 execute, 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 execute. While some do just pontificate all the time, don't bust grapes, but got all the ideas. Hmm? Yeah. So um, there was a reason I got on there. Oh, sovereignty. And so what, and I want y'all to hear me because again, 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 multiple things can be true at the same time, but something is changing. Something is shifting in us. And these narratives that we have adopted, the, though they have been meaningful and they have served purposes at different, at different times, they help to break open these layers. They help to, what did I say? Peel back the layers of the onions when we get new information that's been kept from us. When we understand new ideas that have been alien or foreign to us, they help crack, peel back the layers of this onion. But at some juncture, we're going to say, okay, that idea has served its purpose. Now, now, it's to, now it's time to go deeper. That idea has served its purpose. Now it's time to go deeper. Okay? That's what that was about last week. That while offering an, ex an honest explanation of how we arrived at this moment, how we got here, and the role that we, whether knowingly or unknowingly, as women, played and it, at this arrival, we were not, we are not and were not um, just strung along in history that everything that we see now is just the execution of malignant males and we was just drug along for the ride. We all, just like right this minute, just like I said, we all, whether passive or active, whether willing or unwilling, we all play a role in the maintenance and the preservation of this shit that we say we want done. We want to end this relationship that we have with the elite, with the 1%, with these mega gluttonous billionaires. We want to see an end to suffering and starvation, wars and violence. We want to see a world made well where the inhabitants of the mother's body are not at war with itself because that's what's happening, right? And so we have to, we as women, have to say that if we are God, we all are, by the way, but we as portal carrying versions of the mother, we as portal carrying embodiments of the she, of the one, of the creator of all that is. And we know that we were the first. We have a responsibility to honestly analyze how we got here because we have no stakes in its continuation. I don't have any stakes in the preservation of this shit the way that it is. So it behooves me to be open to what she says to me. Baby, you need to consider this. You need to consider this. It's hard to look at. It's not a condemnation. It is an analyzing of history and what gives rise to a baby that feels outcast by its mother. What happens to a child that experiences grief that lingers for so long that it becomes the slow burn that becomes rage? That rage, when it burns long enough, unchallenged, unmitigated, uncontrolled, untamed, becomes insanity. That's what she said. She said, why do you think I... She said, why do you think I gave you the science, baby? What does a little black girl from Alabama, from Dothan, Alabama, why would she go to fucking school for Chinese medicine to learn five elements theory when your ass was a musician? You wanted to be a rock star when you grew up. Why did you need this language? Why did you need this experience for right now? Because that's how the web works. That's how the strands of the web connect. You needed it for right now. You understand how. 
This is pathogenesis we're talking about. The world that we are experiencing is a sickness. It is a, it's an, it is a disharmony, not unlike what happens in our own bodies, not unlike what happens in our own flesh. And there is a methodology. There is a, what we call a path, a pathogenesis of how an origin, how a thing over time left unresolved transforms into a, a worse thing, transforms over long periods of time into a worse thing. Until fine, and then there are symptoms all along the way because your body is always trying to preserve itself. Your body is always trying to, to care for itself. Your body is always trying, trying to self-correct. Your body is always trying to self-heal. It's trying to warn you through symptoms. Symptoms are to warn you. Maybe something's wrong. It starts late. Maybe something's not right. Address it. Something's not right. That's a symptom. That's what symptoms are always attempting to give us enough information if we listen to ourselves to self-correct and to take on take out of mother's body that which can help bring us back into harmony right this is the planet the planet is experiencing a disharmony of grand proportion this is why understanding pathogenesis of the elements is important that when unresolved uh, shock and fear here you see this as the water element when unresolved shock and fear and unresolved um because this is the kidney in the urine the urinary bladder when unresolved shock and fear in the water element and unresolved grief in the metal element and unresolved worry and pensiveness anxiety an unresolved rage, resentment, frustration, anger, uh, depression, stress, um, what are the, uh, envy, and jealousy. That's all the liver. Huh? Unresolved sadness over millennia. This is the earth we're talking about now. We ain't just talking about our personal body. This is the earth we're talking about. Unresolved shock and fear, unresolved grief, unresolved anxiety, worry, pensiveness, huh? Anxiety, um, unresolved frustration, anger, rage, resentment, depression, stress, jealousy, and envy. Unresolved sadness, linger and linger and linger. And the heart is the emperor. The heart is the emperor that controls the mind controls the mind, then it makes sense that every single thing that we witness right now, everything that we see on earth right now is something that needs to be addressed, is something that needs a movement for it. What, four or five simultaneous genocides happening in real time right now? Um, you know, uh, but there are multiple wars even if we're not calling them genocide, there are multiple wars happening right now, right? Um, you name it, you name any ism, you feel me? The fact that human beings kill 24 million sharks in the ocean every year. This is, these are all symptoms. These are all massive symptoms of now what has become a tumor. Damn near inoperable at this moment in history, right? But the other thing is, is the heart controls the mind. These things, these isms that we talk about are the isms of psychopathy, of, soci of sociopathy, right? Of madness, madness, global madness, global insanity. That's the pathogenesis is when these things go on for now, 6,000 years unaddressed. What are the herbs that are going to cure this? <laughs> what are the therapies that are going to cure? Child, what are the herbs that are going to cure this? Needing now to address all the organs simultaneously because the sickness has gone on too long and threatens to kill the body of the whole. Hmm? What did I say about um, the other little diagram I got for y'all? Right. 
Here. What did I say last week? I said we got to flip this motherfucker upside down. You know, the yin yang usually looks like this. But over a slow period of time. Because this thing, I told you, is a five-dimensional diagram. We can only see it, obviously, two-dimensionally. But this is five-dimensional, this thing here. The yin and yang is five-dimensional. It exists in all dimensions, in all time, past, present, and future, and all potentialities rests within the yin and yang. But they exist within each other. They exist because of each other. But the mother, the substance is where the yang emanates from. The mother gives birth to yang. Mm -hmm. But the yang stimulates the mother. That's the healing aspect of the yang. The mother gives birth to the yang, but the yang stimulates and moves the mother. And I'm saying we got to flip this motherfucker upside down. And everybody exists within the yin and yang. We see that it's, we see this as black and white because the black and white are the poles. Dark and light are the poles. But all y'all exist within this dichotomy. And y'all always y'all always saying this cuz it's y'all it's y'all conditioning. Why everything got to be black and white? Why y'all always talking about black stuff? Why it's always got to be about black and white? Cuz this is it. This is it. <laughs> this is it. Y'all all exist within this. This is the issue of the age. Here we are, the mother, child, the progenitor of you all. I'm talking about blackness. I'm talking about black women. The progenitor to you all. Here we are. The oldest on the planet. You understand? The progenitor to you all. What about me when I say that? The parthenogen, parthenogen, parthenogenic, spontaneous procreator called the mitochondrial Eve, who is the mother to us all and was jet black in sub-Saharan Africa. All of you. You understand? We are the progenitor to you all. And so that means even white males. We your mama too. You understand? And you are currently the ones, not exclusively, I will continue to say that, you are the ones currently wreaking havoc on the planet, but not exclusively, and not historically exclusively either, right? These are the deconstructions that we have to do, because one of the things that defines, defines the Aquarian age uh, I think it was Brother um, Akim who said earlier, uh, he said something to the effect of, what did he say? Um, where he at? Dang, y'all got a lot of comments. I was just going and going and going, and I ain't even stopped to read these comments. Brother Akim said, um, damn, that was a good one, too. Shoot. Yeah, y'all been commenting on <laughs> My bad, y'all. I'm a slow down so I can bring some of y'all on the call. Um, oh, he said, I've been saying that all the time. The, victimiz uh, the victimization of self is crazy, but we yearn to return to those moments. It, um, we, say, we say that to claim a sense of superiority, but it's futile. So I appreciate what he had to say there, right? But I want to take it a step further. Um, good morning, everybody that I did not acknowledge that came in. Samara, uh, we are the product of the production we are producing from all we are, the byproduct of all we are. Um, most women condemn me for breastfeeding and not vaccinating. Okay, so let me, okay, so y'all got a lot of comments. I'm going to slow my roll for a minute so I can address some of these comments because I really do want this to be interactive, Okay. All right, so let me just say a couple of things and then I'm gonna go through these comments and then I see one person on that I want to switch gears anyway, but I wanted to, it is gonna have to be a live that we spend just talking about this, this download and like making it interactive so y'all can come on about it. Y'all can still ask questions about it, but I'm just saying as women, it's not about, it's not about blame. And I'm gonna say, I want you to hear me. It's not about blame. It is about a slow process through our time together on earth slow that emerges where all of a sudden because 
you know, we see our sameness in the environment. We see how all the higher animals, even some of the lower animals, have uteruses, how the relationships between the males and the females of these creatures um, show themselves, right? Um, or display themselves. We create mysteries. We create schools. We create sex. We create a way to continue the mystery, but in the process, we shut out the males. We do not teach them what it is to love like the goddess to experience the other side of that which they experienced as infants and continue to long for, always trying to recreate in malignant ways. That's what emperors do. That's what kings do. That's what rulers do. That's what presidents, they try to recreate this sense of complete and total surrounding, safety, love, but it's malignant. So they get all these people around them to do everything for them, to clean their, tell me I'm wrong. Emperors, kings, get somebody to clean their butt, you feel me? Get somebody to do their hair, take care, rub their body. This is an ill, uh, an ill attempt at re-experiencing that little period of time that they were completely surrounded by their mother, completely protected by their mother. They didn't want for anything. And in an attempt to recreate that, I feel like the attempt to recreate that comes from the denial of experiencing the other side of that, to be the giver of instead of just the recipient of. Because being the recipient of that kind of boundless love ends up breeding spoiled chill, spoiled brats who are who become toxic, right? Isn't that what this is the behavior? I want what you got, so I'm gonna come and take it. Ah! You can't have that. That's mine. Right? Because they've only experienced one half of it in a world that they have created after years and years and decades and decades and centuries and centuries of these unbridled, spoiled brats. That grief of isolation, of cast outness, becoming rage, resentment. That's how they behave when they the way they treat women. They treat women with rage. That's what we're experiencing. We say, okay, men hate women, you know, because they just hate women because patriarchy. No. Where does the rage come from? Like to be born of a mother, to be born of a woman, to have sisters and aunties and still have this deep, deep seated rage. That's how your behavior comes out. Whether you abuse your wife or whatever, or your kids um, whether you want is always getting in fights with other men, right? Whatever it is, or whether it's the bigger shit, like wars and shit, it's deep. It's not just, quote, love of money and power. It's deeper than that. The execution of the behavior is deep-seated rage, which makes you insane. We talk about it all the time, but not know what we're talking about when they talk about, in history, the madness of the king, right? It's the king who um, has ultimate power, nobody to be accountable to. And that kind of power drives them insane. And there's stories that exist in all cultures about the madness of the king. Shango is one of those kings. If we, if we honest about the story, Shango was one of them kings, right? And so... Um, I believe the things that we, and, and they, they, they try to recreate it too, even in their relationships with their partners, right? This whole idea of man being the head of the household and brings home the bacon and in return, he gets to be the father to his wife. Meanwhile, the wife is mothering her husband, right? She is not she is not being to him or needing from him or um, requiring from him because she doesn't know either. This is a lesson for all of us. She doesn't know either, right? That what they need to experience is that which has been kept secret from them for a millennia, right? Is what it is to experience that kind of selfless love that still feeds you. That's the, that's the relationship between the mother and her child. I am fed by the well, the health, the health and happiness of my babies. 
I'm, I am at ease in my own body when I know my babies are well, when I can care for them, when I can make sure that their needs are met. I'm, I'm not depleted by that. I am filled by that, right? And we haven't shown them that. We haven't allowed them to see that. And I wanted to bring up, I'm not going to look for it today, but I'm going to mention it later. In um, The Great Cosmic Mother, one of, ooh, I should try to find it. One of the things that Barbara Moore talks about that was so deep to me, and I still didn't have a, like a frame of reference for it at the time until this download came. But when she talked about us um, keeping our blood a secret. What, what chapter is it? It's 12 Dancing Circles, Blood. I'm going to see if I can find it really quick. But when she talks about us keeping our blood a secret, the damage that it has done to male consciousness, in us keeping our blood a secret, that story I told y'all many, 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 many videos back about how it had always been since my mom and my dad got divorced, it had just been the three girls, women in the house, me, my sister, and my mama. And when my stepdad moved into the house years later, one of the first conversations that she had, she took me and my sister into the bathroom. I think Erica might have been 10 or 11. So I was about 12 or 13. Yeah, I was about 12 or 13. And she took us into the bathroom to give us a long, you know, this is how the rules of the house are going to change. We need to keep our blood a secret from the man in the house. When you bleed, you wrap it up tightly. You wrap it up in the plastic. You put it in a separate plastic bag and you walk it right out of the house. He does not need to know our dirty little secret. So we keep our menstrual blood a secret from males, right? And one of the things that she talked about, because in matriarchal societies, the blood was the evidence of life continued right? The blood was this sacred ceremony that let everyone around us know that, yes, we can continue to be. This is a subconscious thing, a subconscious collective understanding. As long as the women bleed, we will continue to live. As long as the women bleed, we will continue. We have the ability to survive, right? And she says in here, I'm, I'm going to make a bigger mark of this cap um somebody the moon tree the moon blood in essence what she says if i can't find it and i really want to is that what we have done in denying males the knowing of our blood the memory of our blood um here it is holy shit i turn right to it she said, um, oh, listen, y'all got a minute. <laughs> I'm going to read something to you. This is um, for those who want to find it for yourself and mark it. She says, um, this is on page 193 of The Great Cosmic Mother, Rediscovering the Religion of the Earth. This is the essence, I think, of what came down. On 193, about the third paragraph down, we can go... Yeah, we can go back a little further, but oh, 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 yeah, we can. You can actually start on 192, the third, let's see, the second paragraph from the top. But she says, um, okay, so this chapter for you because you should reread this whole chapter or go back to my reading of the whole chapter. Menstrual rights, uh, menstrual rights, rights and taboos. That's the name of the chapter. That's on page 191. But in this little section that I wanted to read in particular, um, she said, men in patriarchal societies learn or reveal a great jealousy and fear of natural women. We created that. <laughs> we created that. We contributed to that. Of, of the sexual, mental, and spiritual abilities of fully evolved women living in harmony with the consciousness of our own bodies. The menstrual taboo is the consequence of this fear and resentment. This is what she said. 
as they are projected back onto women's lives. Under patriarchy, all life is dualized. Women are also dichotomized, cut in two. There is the good little ovulating wife who is supposed to be passive and not very sexual. It's hard for even a woman to feel sexy cleaning the toilet bowl. And then there is the witch, the sex fiend, the whore, the scarlet, red again, of active dynamic menstrual sexuality. As both female cycles and the wise wound show, these are books, the female cycles and the wise wound, um, there are two poles to women's sexuality, the pole of ovulation, which tends to express itself in the terms of wanting to surrender. Listen, wanting to surrender. It's white, clear discharge is called the river of life. And it is acceptable in patriarchy because it is receptive and fertile. And the pole of menstruation before, during, and after, which expresses itself in wanting to take erotic initiative, to capture, to demand, the red flow is also called the river of death. And its um, multi-orgasmic and aggressive sexuality is taboo in patriarchy. Our menstrual sexuality, which is non-fertile, is, is called masculine and castrating by uh, Freudian types who share in the cultural fear of a mature woman. In early patriarchy and in some contemporary indigenous cultures that have been colonized by misogynistic religions, the menstrual taboo is openly punitive. It's openly punitive. It codifies sexual hostility in societies where women are treated as currency in men's affairs. Under the menstrual taboos, women were to be punished for our powers, sexual, reproductive, and psychic powers. We were banished, we were banished to the menstrual hut, called unclean and dangerous to the man and his laws and his gods. In some tribal communities, we were imprisoned in dark cages or rooms for months for as long as three years with the first menstruation. In American Indian cultures, on the other hand, the menstruating woman is seen for what she is, a powerful life source. As Daughters of Copper, Daughters of Copper Woman shows us, Native American women have worked to keep alive for generations their affirmative and celebratory customs surrounding female puberty, including years of physical training to make women strong in both body and mind. They did this despite constant opposition from Christian missionaries and preachers who always view women's blood customs as savage and as satanic. Underneath the colonizing misogyny of Christianity and Islam, Black African women, too, have managed to keep alive ancient puberty and menstrual customs, which are energizing for women. Worldwide, much of women's sacred blood rites and magical instruments have simply been stolen by patriarchy or if not co-opted, completely repressed. Male initiation rites can ex express an envy and awe of women as men cut or wound their own penises in imitation of bleeding vaginas. These rites reenact birth and menstruation, but they also symbolize a violent separation from women, earth, and the maternal, more a guilty theft than a true participation in. Listen, listen. As Margaret Mead and others have shown, this was the crux of what I wanted to read to you, and then I'm gonna shut up and start reading some of y'all comments. As Margaret Mead and others have shown, Listen, 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 listen. Page 193, child of the great cosmic mother. Listen on this day. Third paragraph from the bottom. I mean, from the top. Oh, my arm, God. As Margaret Mead and others have shown, the more warlike and authoritarian a society is, the stronger its menstrual taboos. Do y'all hear what I'm telling y'all right now? The more warlike and authoritarian a society is, the stronger its menstrual taboos. In such societies, a paranoid emphasis is placed on women's co-opting, uh, debilitating influence. Sound familiar? 
practitioners of EFA. This sound familiar to y'all? Listen, co-opting, they have a paranoid emphasis placed on women's co-opting and debilitating influence and men's need to overpower, dominate, and devalue her. Male, tra listen, male training in aggression is linked with these taboos for both men and boys against any knowledge of or contact with men, women, listen, women's natural functions. Listen, y'all, this, this is what she was saying and I didn't get it. I got it, but I got it in a different context. This is what the mother meant. Male training in aggression is linked with taboos for both boys and men against any knowledge of or contact with women's natural functions. We did that. We keep, because of the taboos, multiple things can be true at the same time, but because of the taboos that we have accepted as dogma, as tradition, as culture, keeping our dirty little secret from the men and boys in our homes, listen, any knowledge of or contact with women's natural functions. This is where their training in aggression begins. It was seen that when there is no acknowledgement of women's bleeding, then there is instead a male acting out of ritual and violent bloodshed in war. Listen. I'm going to read that whole section again. Male training and aggression is linked with taboos for both men and boys against any knowledge of or contact with women's natural functions. It would seem that when there is no acknowledgement of women's bleeding, then there is instead a male acting out of ritual and violent bloodshed in war. Warlike, aggressive male societies are in rivalry with women over which sex sheds the most sacred blood. Woo. War is men's response to women's ability to give birth and menstruate. All three are blood shedding rituals. Women's blood rights give life, however while men's bloody rituals give only death. To compensate for this, such authoritarian societies culturally repress and degrade women's blood functions while evaluating, while elevating murderous war to a holy act. The women's menstrual mysteries of inspiration become, in war god worshiping patriarchy, the mysteries of resisted knowledge repression, and madness. Yo. 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 Y'all heard? Y'all with me? <laughs> Listen. She said, warlike aggressive male societies are in rivalry with women over which sex sheds the most sacred blood. War is men's response to women's ability to give birth and menstruate. All three are bloodshedding rituals. Women's blood rights only give life, however, <clears throat> while men's bloody rituals give only death. Now, why did I read this? Because the whole time I'm saying in my head, what role did we play? She says, there, she says, right, that they were envious, jealous. Wait a minute. She said, um, hmm. Yes, she says here, this great jealousy and fear of natural women, right? This, um, what else? This fear and resentment that they experience, right? Um, and yes, and in response, they do what? They dualize and dichotomize women to have power over. Is this the origin of all these stories where the son raises up against the mother and murders his mother, was out of jealousy and fear, out of resentment and fear of that which had been kept secret from him. That he was not embraced 
into the secrets, allowed into the secrets. And so his response was because, because she says in the earlier chapters, what does she say in the earlier chapters? In the earlier chapters, she talks about these, um, where these, these male blood rights uh, emerged from, whether it was the blood rights of the hunters going out to hunt together, the cave drawings of the men dressed in the skins, hoping to be injured in, in um, the protection of the clan or in their hunt for the animal, praying to receive an injury so that they could be like their mother and that they would call the injury that they received a vulva, like their mother. Having to be outside the group, what? The, co the egalitarian collective of women to create, left on their own, at their own, to their own devices to create their own blood ceremony because they have been left out of not given a place within the egalitarian collective of women. Seen as, even though, quote, mommy and I are one, that you, you are of my body. You are me. Whether you male, whether you other, you are me. Not an insignificant part of me, you are me. And that's what science did. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a scientist. So I accept like scientifically why the Y chromosome is important, what, what it's showing up um, evolutionarily did in terms of diversifying the gene pool, right? To reduce the likelihood of genetic diseases, right? But what we have done using science as the language have chronically demoted the significance of the male's presence on earth to help explain to us why, again, they are less than, they're lower than, they're not like us women, right? But they are us, they are of us. What do the, what do the great cosmic mothers say? Um, bio biologists say about who males are? They're half female. Why are they half female? Because they are of their mother's body. Their mitochondrial DNA comes from their mother comes from the one still. And so what we have done has contributed, <clears throat> even seeded this jealousy, this envy, this resentment in our children, in our, in our male children. And then their response, which is violent, because that's what she says, in the absence of being able to be a participant in a witness to the natural functions of the woman's body that's in their spaces, their mother, their sister, their auntie, whomever, their lover, their partner. We keep our dirty little secret away from them. And in the absence of being brought in to understanding the power and depth of these life-giving rituals that emanate and occur freely in the female body, their natural um, their natural response is aggression. They're, when we keep the secrets from them of where the love that we have shown them in the first two years of their lives and we keep the secrets from them, we do not embolden them. We do not give them the information. We do not give them the know-how to experience love in our bodies the way that we do. So the only way that they can express love is like a father. What is a father? Where does a father come from? A father is a son. A father begins as a son. The original father began as a son. Right? And so what that means is, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, when I talk about being able to allow males to experience love like a mother experiences love, to be able to demonstrate and feel in their body the love that they experienced on one side as the recipient and then were cut off from, from there on, right? All they can do is become patriarchal fathers because every father that we ha hail as a strong provider is a patriarchal father. He is fashioned after his God. He is fashioned after his God. 
damn, this is taking too long. Then he's fashioned after his God. And so that's so much longer than I intended to expend, expend on that. I'm going to have to do some other lives this week coming um, because we have this new moon. Uh, no, it's a full moon lunar eclipse happening to us today. Yet yeah, tomorrow, right? Uh, we just came out of this powerful eclipse. I still have to talk to y'all about the eclipse ceremony that we did this past week. But what we're going to spend the rest of this time, I'm going to actually bring on um, a woman if she's still down. I'm going to add to the stage. Um, Reverend Brianna Lynn, you still there? Well, I'll just leave this up in case she she probably multitasking. Um, and I'm going to read some of your comments. And I also, so I sent a bunch of you um, a link to allow you to join this live. Um, I'm going to put this link in the comments through StreamYard. So the only people who will see this link are those who are tuning in via YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. Um, use that link and follow the prompts in the link. And um, I can bring you on to the live if you want to ask your question verbally instead of in the comments. Those of you who would like to um, make a comment or ask a question that are tuning in via IG, um, type it in the comments and I will read it aloud. Um, so I'm going to read some of these comments. Um, uh, hey, good morning. Yay. <laughs> Everybody. Do you want to read some comments Reverend first? Or... Uh, no, let's talk for a minute. I am going to read okay. these comments, though, because y'all y'all was going in and I was going in. And so I wasn't even stopping long enough to, to look. Reverend Brianna Lynn, how you doing? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. That's what's up. So let me tell y'all about Reverend Brianna Lynn real quick. Um, the reason I sent her specifically an invite is because she was one of the women who joined me this past week for the death, inception, and rebirth cere equinox ceremony that we did out in Desert Hot Springs. And so I thought I was going to be a lot more disciplined about my time. So we will talk briefly. Because I want to do a, I probably want to do a whole like one hour live on just what happened at that ceremony and what the takeaway should be from that is from that. Um, I probably even want to do a private Zoom with the women that attended just to get some like one on one feedback of how they experienced it because it was intense, baby. <laughs> it was it was intense. It was it was it was like it was like next level, but. Um, so Reverend Brianna, for those who uh, do not know who you are, say a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then, you know, let's wrap. Amazing. Yeah, I am um, a student of life and I work mostly with elemental magic. Um, I run a mystery school and I support people in psychological and spiritual well-being and healing, healing generational trauma and seeing how it's connected to collective trauma. Uh, through the aspects of sacred sensuality, social justice, and art. Um, I run the Earth Temple, which is a church here in Southern California that works mostly with nature therapy and getting back into our, our indigenous ways, re-indigenization, connection to nature and the trees as ways of praying, our pagan ways. Um, and yeah, I found you because of the great cosmic mother, our, our mutual love for the Bible, <laughs> the, yes, the, the, the true book. And, <laughs> And our, and our deconstructing of the Abrahamic and pretty much any of the standing religions as they yes. be. And so, yeah, just grateful to to be here and continually be learning with you and learning from you. Right on, right on. So um, can you say a little bit, just a little bit, because I want to do a deep dive separate from this on the Equinox ceremony, but can you say a little bit about your experience out in the desert with us? Yeah, thank you so much. I, um, you know, I went personally because I've been feeling a lot of unprocessed grief and rage um, just in my own life with the completion of some patriarchal based friendships and relationships, navigating white light supremacy in my own life, um, being part of the spiritual world, especially in Los Angeles, there's an overemphasis on love and light. And I'm here for love and fight. Like I've always been a revolutionary 
and seeing the parts in me that started to get caught up in the white supremacy, light supremacy of wanting to be the pretty one and the perfect one and the podcasty one and the one who has it all together and seeing how that's so connected to the Christian Judeo foundation of yes. white skin, light skin, light supremacy, the light angels, this whole yes. paradigm. Come on. Tell the and truth. then connecting that with the movement of free Palestine, not as a nation state, but as a liberation movement, free Congo, free Sudan, free Ethiopia. These are calls to acknowledge that large corporations are benefiting from genocide of black and brown people on our planet. And to witness the majority of specifically white spiritual women who I used to call friends, be not only completely silent about these genocides, but to tell me to my face that they cannot speak about them because they will lose money for their retreats. They will lose money for their book deals. They will lose money and followers on their podcasts because people who are Zionists, which is another form of Nazism in my opinion, are Absolutely. following them and supporting their um, supporting their podcasts. And it just has blown my mind how someone could be could complicit. ever have a spiritual experience of oneness and then see abject genocide the complete abuse of a group of people there's no denying it at all the united nations amnesty international everyone is naming that this is what's happening we see it every day on social media and not only you're not saying something you tell me to my face that the reason you're not saying something is white supremacy and capitalism and so the rage that i've been feeling in my body and my bones of like these are people i love and i have a rage in them and a grief in my lungs and in my heart that has come up and, and a, a reinspecting of how I do my own work, you know, mm -hmm. how I've used my own, can, how can I use my own privilege for good? I still need to make money, but how do I do that in a way that is ethically aligned and tithing back yes. to people and organizations that are supporting the most oppressed and those who need voice and resource. So I came A, to commune with other women in nature, uh, B, because I love you and I trust the way that you listen um, as a student first. Like I really appreciate the way that you teach is from that perspective of you're also a constant student and I can't follow any experts anymore. I can't follow any motherfucking people who need, be, need to be on top of a pyramid. So I was like, mm -hmm. I will be in circles with this witch any day. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um and number three was like to let the grief come out of my body i'm totally okay feeling grief rage and wrath i just don't want it to live in my body and yes. start to feed off of my things yes. so um went with that intention and got to release a lot you know and i'm still processing i have you know this throat lung thing that has come up since then as well and i just see it as a continual release of this um Self grief, my generational grief, and grief for the planet right now—the poly crisis, yes. climate crisis, genocide, um, and apathy—I think are the yes. biggest things on our planet right now. The 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 murdering of the continual murdering murdering of our black and brown brothers and sisters. Um, a dear sweet young boy, 16 year old, was just murdered in Apple Valley, which is less than an hour away from me, with autism, and. Yes. Um, he was having an autistic panic attack and was shot on sight by a police officer. And um, these things affect my body deeply and I want to allow them to impact me without it staying in my body. So I wanna stay sensitized. I wanna stay awake and aware. And I also wanna continue forward and hone in on joy and utilize love as my main force. Um, but there's still there's still a lot of grief and rage processing. But the equinox ceremony, thank you again for holding it. Really creating circles with other powerful women. And I would love to invite men and non-binary people into this space too, because they they get to witness us. They need to witness it too. They need to be a part of the ways that we have learned and that we are remembering how mm -hmm. to mourn and grieve and wail, you know, be in yes. that wrath, that wrathful yeah. state. Of yes. this grief is so huge. All I know how to do is scream into the earth and like destroy something. Um, when we do that together, something magical really happens. And being under the stars and that moon with y'all in the water, I don't want to speak too much detail because I know you'll have another live about it, but just wherever two or more are gathered, we can transform, we can really create alchemy, turn this lead into gold, turn this yes. shit into something truly beautiful. Um, and I'm here for it. 
Let me tell you, um, it's, it's funny. One of the things that you said um, about how you had this little, you know, lung throat thing, right? Yeah. Coming back. So I slept for the first two days after we came back. I didn't get home till nine o'clock that night. Oof. I was like, after we had lunch together, when we left, you and I. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm I'm like totally, I'm white. I was done. I was white. I sat right in that parking lot, kicked my chair back and went to sleep in the car. I was like, oh my God. So I didn't get home till about nine o'clock that night. And I woke up the next morning with this, um, I lost you, Reverend Brianna. Okay. Yeah. I woke up with this terrible, like, it felt like I'd been struck by lightning, this terrible cramp in my neck now some of y'all know y'all see me kind of like adjusting throughout the show for the last three weeks i've been dealing with this this thing in my arm that i haven't been able to get any relief from and so to wake up the next day with this sharp stabbing cramp in my neck that made my right arm unable to move because i came back i'd already made a plan coming back from the desert okay i gotta work this day this day this day this i gotta work this many hours i gotta have at least three clients every every day and i'll be all right so i'd already made the plan that as soon as i came back i was gonna do what i do jump both feet first into busy shit and this was like debilitating right um yesterday was the first day i worked and it was Mm -hmm. like very light so it put me on my it put me on my ass for two days. I couldn't figure out what the hell happened, like what it was. And um, and then I spent all day from three o'clock in the afternoon to four o'clock in the morning at the spa, at the wee spa, uh, mm-hmm. going back and forth between the hot tub and the cold tub and the hot cu- and the cold tub and the sauna and the massage chair, like trying to figure out what the hell was happening with my body. And I just really, uh, and I haven't checked in um, that way with the other women that were there, but it was intense. And I and I don't think, and even Dave and I were talking the next day about. He was like, "Yeah, y'all should have y'all should have been here a, another at least another full day, you know, like come on a Sunday and stay till Thursday or something like that, because y'all yeah. did a lot in that three days, and to have to get up. He said the same thing we were saying to have to get up, clean up." get our lives together and then drive two hours in all these opposite directions. It was a lot. Right. And I, that's what I was feeling in my body was that I had not created enough space and time to really process how deep and how radical that shit was. I've been in a lot of ceremonies from different traditions. Um, You know, I've done Thomas Thomas Gow, um with um, Mashika Indigenous people. I've done Anipi with uh, Lakota and other people. I've done, you know, I've done plant medicines, right? I've done ceremony on a reservation. I've done ceremony, you know, with. Um, the, within the Ifa tradition, really radical, unbelievable ceremony. That thing that we executed on Tuesday, and and it wasn't just the the ceremony itself. Even setting up the space, even preparing the space that morning when you first got there, we put you right to work. <laughs> even, yep. even preparing oh, like the it. space. I, I didn't expect it to, you know, the erecting of the shrine and the, the purifying of the space where we were going to execute the ceremony. I didn't expect it to be that moving and that profound. It was profound to be out there. Yeah. And um, and I'm just really, and plus it was really a jack move for everybody involved because I didn't even put out the call to people until like a week before I was like, ain't nobody coming. I'm going to be out here in these woods by my damn self. <laughs> ain't nobody coming. I gave everybody a week. Listen, I'm doing this radical thing out in the middle of nowhere. You feel me? On this really radical land that sits on top of the San Andreas Fault. And it's got mm. all this magical stuff happening. Y'all come out here with me. Just take my word for it. Just take my word for it. It's going to be awesome and magical and amazing and change your life. And, and the other thing that you mentioned about the need for uh, males and uh, gender fluid people 
non-binary, trans, gender non-conforming people to be there. I put out a call to everybody I know. I put out a call literally to everybody that I know, males, females, uh, lesbians, uh, gender non-conforming, trans people. I put out the call to everybody I know. I did. Because initially I was like, yeah, we're going to do a goddess retreat, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, no, 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 no. Especially once I got that download two days before, two days before, I was like, ah, oh, yes, men need to be buried in the dirt too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Men need to be reborn from the body of the mother too. Yes. Right. And um, so, yeah, I was really grateful because these women came from, everybody was at least two hours away. Everybody was at least two hours away. Everybody came by themselves because of, you know, work and their work. This was during the week. And so, you know, uh, Brianna is a wolf mama. She owns two wolves. She had to find a wolf sitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying it was a lot for people it's to hard do work. on yeah. such short notice. Say that again. What'd you say? It's hard work to find a good to find a good wolf sitter. It's hard. <laughs> so um that's all I think we're gonna say about that for now because that is that needs to be its own separate live. I want to talk to y'all about what we did, about the why, how I came up with what it is we needed to do. And I told you this was going to be the initiation process for the temple moving forward. So once, you know, we get the website finally online, which is like the thorn in my side and to talk about like what membership looks like, what the process for initiation looks like, how that happens, um, what that means in terms of your level of commitment, because there will be levels of commitment. Everybody ain't going to want to go through the initiation process. It was deep. And I actually um, I actually uh, what do you, adjusted a lot. I adjusted a lot because being there in real time, I was like, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot. And so we all ended up in the earth for about an hour. And an hour was enough. An hour was enough. Child, listen, an hour was enough. It was so elect like you could lit it felt like millions of like electrical tentacles <laughs> not lying y'all all over your body Pulsing, it was it, it felt like this kind yeah. of i haven't even i haven't even talked about this out loud yet i haven't even written down anything yet but it mm. felt like um this um kind of symbiotic give give and take like i my whole thing was to leave with the mother that which i did not want to be reborn with it was to take into the earth that which i wanted to stay here in this life and what i wanted to leave what i wanted to unburden myself with because she can take and transform it all all of it. She can take and transform it all. all. It. And what I wanted to be consciously, to be a conscious creator of the new world, to be a conscious creator of this new me, taking seriously this charge that she set on our lives to change the world once and for all and to do it right now. What are the ways that that can happen right now? You heal you while simultaneously healing those around you. And baby, when I tell you, I got, I, it was freezing. Oh my God. So cold. It was so fucking cold. It was freezing. It was a cold that's not like any other cold. It wasn't like water cold. It's not yes. like air cold. Earth cold sucks the cold, the warm out of the body. It takes the warm. I can literally feel the warmth leaving my body into the earth in every direction. Yes. Oh my God. Cause I was like, well, surely once we here for a little while, you know, I will warm up, warm up the, warm up the dirt. Oh no. It was freezing. Mm -hmm. The whole time. Cold. All the way till they pulled us out. Freezing. Mm -hmm. Freezing. It was such a deep and borrowing like intense like bitch you in here now you about it <laughs> you ready <laughs> you about it and then something happened because i was silent for a long time 
I was just like, okay, trying to like, I was really in my head about how cold it was. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And then there was a moment where I just like let go of this sense of control. That's what it was, was me being rigid, like kind of against the cold where I allowed myself to relax into it. And baby, it felt like, there was a moment where I felt like I was time traveling. It was like, because my intention was set that whether I was conscious or not of what I was leaving, I wanted to make sure I was born new. And the only other time this has happened was the first time I did ayahuasca. The only time that this has happened was the first time I did ayahuasca, where mm. I saw my life flash before my eyes, but in goddamn slow motion. Mm. It was, and it wasn't just my life. I, it was my mother's life. It was my daughter's life. It was my granddaughter's life. It was my bit mama's life. It was my grandma Helen's. It was like simultaneously seeing like all this hurt and all this trauma and all this sadness and all this grief never spoken by these women, never yes, allowed to be spoken one. by these women. And I was feeling that shit all at one time. And I came unglued. I was feeling all the women of my family as far back as it is. I was seeing their faces, man, and feeling like it was in real time, all of their, all of their burdens. And she was like, baby, you got to leave it there for all of them. They didn't have this opportunity. They didn't know. They didn't have the sight. They didn't have the ability to hear. They didn't have the ability. They weren't afforded. Whoo, they weren't afforded the stillness, the rest, the silence, the safety, the covering. Y'all have done that for me, whether you know it or not. Y'all have provided that for me. The safety, the stillness, the ability to be able to take a day off if I need it. Y'all have done that. And she says, so you have to carry this for all of them and leave it here with me. Because when you are being born new, baby, they are being born new too. That all the way back to the little spiral I showed y'all in the beginning. To go back to the one, to go back to the beginning, to go back to the mother of us all and heal in her, care for her. Because this isn't just a spiral. This is a pregnancy right here. This is a pregnancy. This is the matrix of the womb right here. This is what it is right? This is what it is. This is us. This whole thing right here. This is the collective womb. This is every man, woman, child, uh, every, uh, every binary, per non-binary per person, not gender non-conforming, every trans, this is everybody on the planet. This, every, mm. this, this is our collective womb because what's being called on us is to birth the new world in real time. Right. We know that the new world is coming. So what do we do in preparation? Because we are certain that the new world is coming, just like the mama, even when the baby is just a little embryo, just a little, just a little egg. They hadn't even they hadn't even split apart yet. Right. She knows she is certain that once that happens, once that seed is sown, the outcome is a, is a whole nother entity, a whole nother human. This is us pregnant with the new world right now. This is us pregnant with the new age right now. And what that mother does is she cares for herself because to care for herself is to care for her baby. That one. To care for herself is to care for what is to come, even as she can't see it, even as she cannot feel it yet, even as she has not felt the quickening yet. She is certain. She is certain. And so she automatically Tailors her behavior. Okay, I got to stop drinking. I can't go out to the club because there's too much smoke in the club. I can't, you know what I'm saying? There's certain shit I can't do. I can't eat certain shit right now. There are things that she does to ensure the best possible outcome. To ensure the best. This is the pregnancy. And the original mother is who we are saying needs to be mothered right now. We are, we are planting the seed 
of the original mother. Be one, be black, primordial she that is the progenitor to us all. To embrace, to cover, to support, to nourish, to make happy the black mother on earth, knowing that we are all made well. This is all of us. This is black, brown, red, yellow, white people. That's the spiral. That's all of us. This is past, present, future. This is the spiral. This is all the relationships. This is us. This is all the genders. This is us. So when I say center black women, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about on no dumb shit. I'm talking about y'all all hate black women. And so therein lies the secret to your salvation. Therein lies the secret to your salvation. It, it is. When you care for the mother, you care for yourself. That's Just like when you pregnant with your own child, when you care for yourself, you care for the baby. Yes. You see how that is? Back and forth, forward and back. To go to the center, to return to the source is to ensure that the now, the now, which is where we are to, when we reparent our little baby and all of that, right? We know that it has an immediate, even though that is quote, the past, the past exists forever. The past is always ever present. To go back and care for our inner baby is to show up in us right now. We do the work knowing that it will have an immediate impact on our lives right now. Otherwise we wouldn't do it. What would be the purpose of past life regression? What would be the what would be the purpose of um uh child regret uh child regression work? What is it? Yeah, child regression work or whatever. So um that's why I took these women, I asked these women to go out into the desert with me and have enough confidence and trust and faith in me to allow me, allow me to bury them in the dirt in the dead of night at the Any peak day. of the equinox. In the middle of the desert, surrounded by coyotes and shit, <laughs> robbing stuff off the altar. <laughs> the coyotes jacking shit off the altar and shit. You feel me? And set any and six day. Women you, you make that call. You make that call any day, as long as my wolf babies are taken care of. That's like the only thing in my life that I've really got to like. You are one of those women, and I don't want to speak for everyone tuning in, but you, you beyond even womanhood, you represent a type of call on the planet right now that we are all very hungry for, which is the humble, fierce, no bullshit, equally soft and equally wrathful. And we motherfucking need that in leadership right now, especially spiritual leadership, yeah. where it's like, I will love you so good. And there is no bullshit allowed in this field. That, None. That part. And the children, that part. And the women are centered, and I've lived my life that way. You as an elder, I just want to speak life over you of like you as an elder, you as a ceremonialist, you as a mother, you as a student, you as a humble teacher, you as someone who's been fucking rocked by life, and still show up laughing, and you still show up playing the music, right? You still show, and you, your story, you could be anything you could be as as maniacal or downtrodden or or vengeful you have all the reason to be and the way you have transmuted your life that's what we need in leadership and i just really want to say thank you to you because a lot of people who um, have your abilities have used them for their own personal gain to create a brand or create a momentum of capitalistic gain and i speak abundance over you because for the temple and for you personally, because you have chosen the path that is the harder choice, which is truth and integrity and community and the children, uh, instead of going the path of the brand. And from this forward, may abundance weave itself into all that you do so that you can continue with your integrity and your truth and also bring in a place like what we visited for your own home, for your own temple. Um, so that you can continue yes. to do this work and yes. be fully taken care of. I see that for you. And I say, yes, and I'm here to support it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. I, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm telling you, even when it doesn't, even when it doesn't, like we pray in a way where, and it's our conditioning, but we pray in a way that is kind of like desperate. 
You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta, you know, please help me come up with the money to pay my bills. Please let me, mm-hmm. you know, it's like desperate. It's like chasing, right? And so when I started saying that we don't pray, we conspire, mm-hmm. right? I love that, that that what we say is certain because the mother wills it so. Why would I make a statement like that? Because all we have to do, most of us, um, all we have to do is look back at the quality of our relationship with our birth mother. I'm not saying across the board. I know some people have had very not great relationships with their mothers, but in general, right? She wants only that which makes us happy, only that which keeps us content, only that which keeps us giggling and thriving and healthy and meeting our little benchmarks, right? And so I know that my mother still has that she has that for me. Like, look, you have heeded the call. You, you've been, yeah, I don't require it. She doesn't require our obedience, by the way. She doesn't require our obedience to care for us. We breathe. You know, even though they try to put bars on it, you understand, blocks on it. Water still comes freely in a lot of places. You understand? Um, she gives abundantly. Because all she's interested in is our happiness. But at this period, we, we do have to be compliant. She's like, look, y'all didn't, you know, y'all didn't fuck this little utopia up that I gifted you and didn't require anything from you. I was just ecstatic witnessing your existence, witnessing you live and thrive in me. That's what she said. She said, but, but now we have to do world changing work. So those of you who comply know that I want you to be cared for while you win others back to me. That's all she's interested in. That's all she's interested in is us being one back to her, us becoming one with self instead of opposing self to oppose others, to oppose her, to oppose the planet is to oppose self. We are literally at war with ourselves. And she says, I want to end your isolation. I want you to remember what loving limitlessly feels like in your body. What pure ecstasy feels like as your norm, as the norm, as the standard, as the starting point, ecstasy. I want you to remember that because you are only hurting yourselves in these, in these isms that you side with. And um, I'm saying this because she cares for me. You understand? And I accept that most of the times it's my own blocks that make her ability to care for me a little bit more difficult than it probably should be. Right? It's still my own isms. It's still my own shit that I have to work through. You feel me? That makes it more difficult for her to care for me. Um, I accept that. But she shows up for me in radical ways. All the time, I tell y'all story after story after story of how, how the mother, and I tell you, when, when she shows up, she wants me to, she wants me to know, bitch, it's me. It's not your imagination. It's not a coincidence, bitch, it's me. So she talks to me loudly, right? And um, so how we met this person that gave us the opportunity to, we didn't have to go scavenging out in the wild somewhere to seek out you know, because I've been thinking about this for a long time. I'm like, oh, my God, where are we going to do it? How would it happen? Will we be supported? Will we be safe? Will we? Will... I was stressing about that even up till the, even up until we got there. But he already had a place stage for us. He told me, what did he say? He said, I want you to see this land as the place that you can feel safe executing your wildest dreams. That's what he told me when I approached him about this radical thing we wanted to do on his property, right? On his $8 million property. Dreamy <laughs> masculine statement. Like if we could just copy paste that for the men masculine training of like, this is how you respond to women who want to hold ceremony, obviously with discernment, because it's not all women. There's patriarchalized women too, but for like yeah. to deconstruct patriarchy in the men, they get to see women who are centering the great mother, mother earth, the dark yes. mother, 
and say, yes. how can I support you? How can I make sure you're protected? How can I dig holes for you? Can I provide come, you come candles? That one, that is like come the greatest the role. And then when we're ready, I think next time we invite him into that ceremony, you know what I mean? Like there does need to I be a time. I talked about it already. I talked yes, about great. it already. I was like, great. Yeah. Yes, yes. I feel comfortable with him now that he's proven. You know what I mean? It's almost like an initiation before the initiation. Before you can see my tits, I need to like see you interact with a few waitresses. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Come on, come on before you can come into the plan. ceremony, do make some work plan. around the property, move some wood, show up with no payment, and then you will get the reward of your lifetime. Listen, girl, listen. Listen, listen, listen. Yes, yes, you know? yes. Yes. Because listen, one of the things I, I had been kind of tiptoeing around, but it is a malignancy where men who become spiritual, men who become associated with the goddess, men who become feminist, um, men who are progressive, right? Somehow there is this default kind of um, way that they translate in their mind is to become less masculine. I don't know if that makes sense, but there yeah. is a, 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 a softening almost to an extreme, right? And as a matter of fact, uh, it's not my imagination because um, in the book Communion that I read to you guys um, by Bill Hooks, she had a chapter talking about this, about how in the 70s, men were becoming feminists, but they were becoming very um, docile. And the thing with feminists who were still having relationships, heterosexual relationships with men, didn't want punks. They wanted masculine men who still, as masculine men, had the ability to say yes this is how my ideas have changed. This is how it shows up in my relationship with my partner. This, this is how I will take my masculinity and switch sides, if you will, switch sides mm -hmm. from patriarchy to uh, you know feminism or to the matriarchy or whatever. And I'm going to tell you, I felt like, and I think that's what a lot of men reject too, who are quote masculine men, they reject the idea of the goddess. They reject the idea of the matriarchy. They reject the idea of mother goddess ideology because in their mind, they think it's going to make them a punk or it's going to make them a simp or it's going to make them you know, weak or it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean that the mother is going to be on top of them, right? They're going to be like in their childhood relationship with their mama just running around doing what mama say type of shit, right? And... That's not what we're trying. That's not what I'm interested in. That's not what I'm trying to create. Because even those men who become very soft and um, almost to an extreme, who become associated with the goddess or whatever, they become a feminist or whatever, they still have malignant, patriarchal, misogynistic ways that are now well covered, well hidden behind some well placed dreadlocks and, you know, some a little hard Christmas shirt. Yes. Uh, well, come on. Come on. Come the fuck home. Right. Yeah. They, they wear all of the tribal, uh, you know, uh, attire and regalia and shit and still just as malignant as the day is long. But now they're very um, well hidden and yeah. um, non-assuming for women yeah. that think they are safe in space with these men. So I appreciated this interaction with this man who Thanks. who, you know, you do not to look at him. You don't see a hippie who is like talking about crystals and rocks and healing and, and the chakras and shit. He's like a regular ex Navy dollars and cents. Ex kind Navy of guy. seal. Huh? He was a Navy seal. He's like the yes. elite of the elite. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when, I'll be honest, the first conversations that I had with him, I was like, look, are you police? <laughs> like, I need to know. Who are you? Are you the police? You feel me? Because everybody's suspect. But now you're telling me you ex-military. You feel me? You ex-Navy SEAL. You feel me? Um, are you the police? What do you want from me? Right? Yeah. These are our early conversations. Like, we didn't have some crazy conversations, this man and I. But even the fact that he was open to them. He, don't, he didn't know me from, from a hill of beans. You feel me? 
But what and, I love about Navy SEALs, and I've noticed this with a few military men, once they have a, a, an experience of oneness, and sometimes it's a near-death experience, an ND, sometimes it's plant medicine, sometimes it's through orgasm. Once a military man or woman or non-binary person has a oneness experience and they get on the path of Mother Earth, they are straightforward in their integrity, they are clear with their discipline, and they are no bullshit. And I appreciate them a lot more than these floppy motherfuckers who pretend like they're all soft and feminine up front, and when doors close behind, they are narcissistic assholes who are about to beat yes. my ass because they're so feminine out front, their toxic masculine shows up behind closed doors. I'm not interested yes. in that fake spiritual yeah. bullshit anymore, the sacred yeah. sun's fake spiritual bullshit, these fake medicine men stealing indigenous names and in indigenous medicine. I will take a, a military man, even if they're currently in the military, who's gonna be straight with me, who understands oneness and understands that we are serving. I'm not, you're not here to serve me. We are here to serve the great mother together. Yes. Yes, but I am one so iteration of her, and he one, can serve that. I'm, but like, yeah, before please. you go too far, because there was one thing I wanted to mention particularly about him, about his background is is the Navy, because it's something that I've been talking about and trying to work my mind around. Not even work my mind mind around, but like when I talk about uh, men particularly who, or men and women, but men particularly who have served in the Navy in any given, uh, not in the Navy, in the military in any way. Right over because I come from a mil military family, right? What I have been saying, especially the way the world is, because um, these things typically don't resolve themselves easily. It can, but there's typically resistance, right, to radical transformation, which is what we're trying to create. And so, the thing that was really helpful about this interaction that we all had with him in the space this this past week especially for what it was we were doing was this is how what I have said in the past is you men primarily have blindly you were conditioned, but still blindly, whether it was patriotism or whether it was the only way you could get a good job, have blindly executed the ambitions of patriarchy, blindly executed the ambitions of the corporatocracy for since day one, since we've been on this continent, right? And that enthusiasm, that that fervor, that discipline <laughs> that you use to defend bullshit, the mother still needs it. Can you execute that same kind of fervor, discipline, <laughs> radical action, disciplined, armed discipline, if need be? on behalf mm -hmm. of the mother. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Can you switch sides? Can you be a turncoat mm -hmm. on behalf of the mother? So I'm, yeah. So like, I think that was the reason that I really mentioned the whole, like, you know, men, uh, males, you know, feeling that sensing in sensing some rejection to the mother, to the goddess, to even feminism or anything like that as a, as a way to quote, turn them into punks. And that's not the ambition right there. There are reasons that we have differences in our experiences as male and females on earth at any given time. Those, those differences can change biologically or socially or culturally, but there's a reason. And right now, uh, the mother is saying, take the skills that I gave you, take the skills that you have, take the life experiences that you have and turn the world right side up. So I appreciated the way that man showed up in space. I do. And not only that, the way he used his resources to support us in that space. So much. That was Jenna. huge. Not just getting out there and digging our trenches for us, which was huge. I didn't want to do it with a jacked up shoulder, but I was ready. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, not only with, you know, making sure that the space was prepared for us to be welcomed into, right? But also how he used the resources that he had because that's all that's all we talking about you said it earlier you know as a as a white person how to use your privilege as a uh as a tool for good as an instrument for good right how to use your position of privilege in the world as a tool for good right he did that in real time that's what he did that's what he did and then checked on us throughout the night y'all need more wood y'all get y'all need water all night True brother. Water, water y'all good. Whispering outside the perimeter as to not disrupt the ceremony. Mm -hmm. 
You good? Y'all okay? Okay. It was it was, it was <sighs> big. It was really big. It was huge. You know. Shout out to you, Dave. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate you coming on here. I'm going to go ahead because it's two hours and 15 minutes now. Thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me at this most monumental event that we just did this past th last week that I'm sure is going to have a ricochet effect. I'm certain of it. Certain of it. Any blessings? I'll keep you posted on the, um, on the uh, Zoom call. All right, so Tajali, let's see. Hello? Hey, how you, you doing? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you ain't gonna let us see you? Um, <laughs> I'm in bed right now. <laughs> I don't know why y'all do that to me. Why y'all do that to me? <laughs> I know I like to see y'all faces. I don't like to be talking to no screens. Okay. Anyway, I ain't gonna put you on blast since you still in bed. <laughs> what you doing in bed? Where you at? Where you live? Pismo. Huh? Pismo. 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 Yeah. Pismo. Oh, okay. So you on my time zone? Okay, you get yeah. that. I was like, I always assume everybody's in another time zone. <laughs> I'm like, it's the earliest for me. You understand? Right. Okay, you get a pass. Okay. I, I so what's know. your question for comment? Well, it's it's more of a comment. I don't know what it is with my connection that I have to you because you have me up here. Early in the morning, I have not been to church in over 15 years. And you not only have me up early on Palm Sunday, but you have me here on StreamYard. And this is the first time I have ever done this. Because, you know, I'm a wallflower. I'm, I'm always, you know, I'll watch diligently, faithfully, but I'm going to stay quiet. <laughs> so this is my first time ever being here. So um, just bear with me. But um, I wanted to make the comment um, about uh, the, uh, it's kind of, uh, kind of goes along with the book club and how the, this last video you did, how it was in conjunction with that last book club that we had. And if we had the second book club that we canceled and now I think would be part six if we stayed on schedule. If we had those other two, I wouldn't have stayed in the space of permeating what was what we had talked about in the book club. And in particular, um, what keeps coming to what has has been coming to my mind is that one particular man, I can't remember his name, but he was the one that um, had vermin growing from his body. Yes, she known. Oh, okay. no, 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 no. I know what you're talking about. I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. I was trying to look for it in the book while I was waiting to get on. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. about. Hold on. Give me a second. Keep going, mm -hmm. though. Tell me. Tell me. What about so, him? So, okay. So, if I remember correctly, he, he's in this cave, and he's tethered to a rock inside the cave by a uh, leather strap. And yep. during the time that he's in there, this these... Um, uh, they use the term vermin, but bugs, you know, um, attach themselves to his body, right? right? And I remember in the moment when I was reading it and then in, in the book club, I didn't say anything because, again, yeah, I'm, I'm a shy person. But I had this thought at the time, and it's just been permeated over and over and over in my head that, okay, he's in this cave and he's tethered to a rock. I'm like, he put himself in the womb of the mother, and the Ooh. and the leather was the umbilical cord, girl. And he stayed in there until his actual physical body was impregnated by the vermin, Ooh. the children girl. of the earth, right? Mm. So, yo. So when he comes out of the cave, he doesn't want the this these bugs to leave his body. Right. So he puts himself on this pedestal. And I remember thinking at the time was like, OK, so he made his body into the mother. Like he went this far to 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 recreate to right to 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 create to turn his body into a womb and mm. then put himself on a pedestal, you know, to separate himself. And at the time, I thought he did to separate himself from the mother. But what I, now that I think about it, I, I feel as if he was 
showing other men how they can how they can be one with the mother without having to go through a woman. Because mm. like you said, the women weren't giving up the secret of life, right? Right, the, right. The secret right. of right. knowledge is so that. So the yep. the pedestal for for a while I thought the pedestal was him trying to separate, but I, I don't really believe that anymore. I think there was this was his his platform, if you will. Like this is his YouTube, right? to show these men like this is how i am i listen with the mother uh, 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 uh. not one with the mother no 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 okay no no, no, no. you're close uh -huh. this too is how i can become like the mother like the mother right 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 because you remember in that discussion about the different types of ascetics right and mm -hmm. it was um it was saint jerome by the way that's on um Page 36, the second okay. paragraph, uh, the third paragraph down. St. Jerome is the one that did that. Mm -hmm. um, but you remember in that conversation uh, about ascetics and and um, one of the aspects was, one, they have to punish the flesh. That's what that's what is at the core of asceticism, the hatred right. of the female. Right. Mm -hmm. The need to permanently punish anything tied to the female. The only tie that males have to the female is their flesh. So that's where the practice of asceticism comes from, the denial of the urges of the flesh, the denial of the flesh, and then eventually the punishment of the flesh, the, you know, the punishing of the flesh itself, right? But I like what you're saying about him going into the cave, him tethering himself to the stone with the strap. All of that is great because it's in par with what she uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Mary Daly eventually says is that those things that happen in the daily lives of women is their, their divine fate is to suffer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And the only thing that makes what these males have done is because they have taken upon themselves to suffer the way that only females are supposed to suffer. Remember what she said about Gandhi? She said, Gandhi did what he did in these relationships with women to do what? To absorb their power to become the male mother. That's what he said. He wanted to become the male mother of, an, of a liberated India. That was a quote. Mm -hmm. So it was about the usurpation of what they saw as the mother's power. So he wasn't trying to become one with the mother. He was trying, the platform was to raise him up as the male mother. Okay. I like what you're saying though, because I didn't see the tethering that way or him even going into the cave, you know, but yes, it makes sense what you're saying. Mm -hmm. the, the attempt, but it goes back to what I just read y'all about uh, in, um, in, Barbara Moore, um, in Barbara Moore's book in The Great Cosmic Mother, right? that these rituals that they create always lead back to a resentment of and an attempt to recreate that which they see in the mother. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? I do. I, I do. think what you said is sharp as shit, though. I, I wouldn't have seen it that way. <laughs> but the end result uh -huh. is not to become one with the mother. It is to, again, experience... Oh, yeah, so I, I see what you're saying. Yes, like, no, wait, 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 wait. It's, it's, out. it's so deep mm -hmm. because I think we're saying the both we're, we're both saying two sides of the same thing in their malignancy, trying to become the male mother. But the deep origin of trying to become the male mother is the resentment from being kept from the secrets of what it means to be mother. Yes. And this is what and. I can't remember how long ago our book club was, but this whole time I've been thinking about this particular person, this particular guy. It just kept permeating, kept permeating. And um, when I listened to your video, it 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 bookend this thought that I've been kind of struggling with because being black, being woman, being in in this world, and having to struggle and just having this rage and this anger inside of me and the only place that I have to project it is that patriarchy is that men 
right? So when I watched your video yesterday, it honestly, it it really, it, it, it didn't anger me, but it frustrated me in the sense of these these violations that men do they're doing it because they want access and it gave me a sense of compassion that wasn't there and now i'm still angry but i don't have a place to put my anger now ah yes oh my gosh baby look (laughs) let me tell you that's such a profound statement. Thank you so much. Because I've gotten so many emails, so many, since I did that live. And some were expressing, you know, like they some people, whether they articulated it articulated it that way or not, what I was sensing was like this feeling of betrayal, like I had betrayed them with this message. Mm-hmm. And some were like, damn. I never thought about it that way. And what I want to say now, because even when I I, I was very, very hesitant, man, I was very hesitant to say that shit that I said last week. I didn't want to say it. (laughs) That's how deep it was. And because I too was like, no, this can't, this can't explain everything. You feel me? And she said, go back to the medicine, baby. You know the medicine. If you and the earth are one, if the medicine was evolved by watching how our bodies mimic the environment around us, go back to the medicine. The theory is in the medicine. The cure is in this theory, right? She said, go back. And I know the pathogenesis of how all diseases occur, at least in this theory. And so when she started talking about this, the first thing I went to is my rage. Like I don't fucking trust men. And my lived experience has taught me enough to, it ain't some conjecture. It's saying it ain't some shit I heard from somewhere else about why I can't trust men. My lived experience since I was a little girl has taught me that I cannot trust males, that I have to protect myself in space with males, that I am never safe alone with males, even males I may love. Yeah, because boys will be boys. That shit. Yeah. And so when this comes through to say, Baby, this is not to blame women. This is not to blame black women as the progenitors of the world. This is to say there are some things that you need, Cassandra, to do this work. And force is not going to be the way that you get what you need from your male counterparts. They have to be able to love the way you loved those who inhabited your body. They have to be able, it's not something that you can teach them. We can't teach males how to love the way that we love when we give birth. We can't teach them that. The only thing that we can do is explain, allow them into the spaces that women inhabit. That don't mean all of them. That don't mean all in one lump sum. That doesn't mean anything crazy. But what it does mean is that they have to experience that love. That's the only way that they can, they can, um, They can give, they can administer that love. They can love, but the love that they experience right now, all of us, all of us experience love in a malignant way. All of us experience and express love in a way that is conditioned in some way or another about shoulds and students that we receive from patriarchy. All of us, men, women, all the genders in between, everybody, we experience and give and receive love as colonial subjects, (laughs) you understand, within the context of colonialism. The only time that love feels extremely true and unburdened by shoulds and shouldn'ts, you have to give me this, I have to give you that, you have to respect me, you feel me, before I give you love, you have to show me a certain amount of love before I show you love. None of that is in play. Is that little bit of time from zero to about two before our fears and shit, we start pouring into our babies where it's just 
Whatever makes you happy, baby, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever keeps you safe, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever you need to be is what I'm going to do. You don't have to do anything to, to get that love from me. Right. And, and so for me, I understand a thousand percent because my knee jerk response, even as I'm writing this shit out, that's coming through me was I can write the name of every male that has harmed me in my life. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And I can, I can visualize the faces of men who have ever said anything terrible to me, may not have put hands on me, but have said something terrible to me, whether it was the boy in high school talking about, you know, my body parts and what he would do to me or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me to say this, it felt like a betrayal. It did. I ain't gonna lie. It felt like a betrayal saying it. And that's why I was so subdued child. I was, I was, I was subdued. <laughs> I was beside myself. I've mm -hmm. been beside myself. I dreaded doing this live today. I'll be honest. Cause I ain't said nothing to y'all since then. <laughs> I ain't said shit to you <laughs> since. Babe. You understand? Reluctant to even return emails. Cause people were upset. People were upset, but I had to sit with it. I had to sit with her and hear without judgment the essence of what she was trying to communicate communicate it is not to take our rage from us it is not to absolve men that's what we spent the whole chapter on asceticism and absolution talking about it doesn't absolve anyone of wrongdoing of harm that they have caused it is to say that for babies like my dog my darling sweetheart grand my grandson zane it is to say that for young men, it is to say for men right now who are grown looking for an answer to end their own isolation and they cannot seem to find an answer anywhere, looking for a way to explain their rage and where it comes from and why it seems to be directed at females when this is not what they want to be. I've heard men express this. To create an answer that gives a solution, a real solution to the problem and gives them a way to demonstrate in real time what it is we feel and what it is they have presented and envied in us. That's all, is to say, baby, this is the slow emerging of things. We recognized it when we talked about the slow emergence of, of patriarchy itself. We said, damn, that makes sense. That it wasn't some sharp turning point. This, this happened over thousands of years, the slow emergence of patriarchy, right? Yeah, this and over thousands of years. And Say that again. I, and I really had to swallow hard when it was right there in my face that patriarchy is a reaction. Come on in the room. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because we talk about you know um, feminism being a reaction to patriarchy, but patriarchy is itself a reaction to. To something. I, to, yeah, to something. And I don't know what the matriarchal world looked like, but... Come on. It, something had to have gone askew in order for the world that we have today. Something had to go wrong. And if women, you know, were in power at that time, and this, this is just off the top of my dome, if women were in power at that time, then they have had to have men were probably in our place then like we are now. I don't I, that that ain't no shit I said. I just want I just want to be clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna say why I make that sharp distinction. Because under the matriarchy, and that's why, even when I was talking about Africa, how we have to do an honest assessment, and Africa's one of hyper romanticized Africa before um, before European colonization, and we have to do an honest assessment of what was happening in Africa that gave rise to this, that al allowed for us to be so destabilized that a small group of people could overpower Africa. Like, how did it happen? You feel, something was happening. Mm -hmm. And right. unless we do an honest assessment, unless we do an honest and thorough historical analysis of what was happening on the continent, we will always be stuck on white man is the devil 
And if we just kill all the white people, then everything will just go back to normal. That is ridiculous. That's yeah. stupid. That's that's ignorant as all hell is what it is. You understand? Mm-hmm. But it, but that's what happens when you have a short sighted understanding of human history. And that's why that's why those in power thrive is because they count on us being nationalists, because if we're a nationalist, then we'll only major in African-American studies. We'll only major in Mexica studies. That's not to make anybody feel bad about what they took as a major. But we have to learn the history of the whole world and our relationship to one another in it, because all things are linked. All histories are linked. Right. That's how I study astrology. If this was happening over here, what was happening in Asia, Africa, the so-called Latin Americas. I want to if this was happening on this period of time that's so significant, I want to know what was happening everywhere in the world of color at the same time. That's how you study history in a matrix, not in straight lines that do not touch. Right. Right. And for us, what we're talking about when we talk about the matriarchy, there is a reason under the patriarchy, under the father, that the female role of human history, the female role in human history as half the human population has been completely erased from the consciousness of all beings. The history of the mother of the earth, all womb holding people who have given birth to other humans, has been wiped clean from the collective consciousness of every every living uh, human on earth. There's a reason for that. So I do not think that what we're experiencing is the consequence of um, females doing to males what males currently do to females. That I do not accept. Because even when you look at old anthropologists and archaeologists uh, who talk about you know, the period in human history where there were no jails and there were no prison and there was no poverty and people were thriving and whatever, whatever. They just say, okay, well, that was primitive people. They never say, they never say that these societies existed under matriarchal, under matriarchal leadership. What I am saying is like when we talked about in the great cosmic mother, what she analyzes as having given rise to patriarchy was males becoming collectively unemployed essentially right all the rituals all the bonding rituals all the all the things that they had done as the collective of hunters right going out leaving the village for weeks and months at a time to hunt game and bring game back to the village creating ceremony around that creating societies of brotherhoods around that once hunting was obsolete as a primary uh, or an important source of um, food for the group. And they, she says, she's like, they walking around like, well, damn, (laughs) what the fuck we gonna do now? We had a whole millennia of our lives defined by hunting. Ritual passed down from man to son, man to son, man to son, about what it means to be a hunter, what it means to show up in this way for the community, for the tribe, for the clan. And now it's gone. So what the fuck are we going to do now? Women were the ones who had domesticated animals. And so the women were like, oh, well, y'all can take over this. Y'all can take over, you know, this new project that we got, domesticating animals. We'll still do the, the digging in the earth, right? We'll still do the agricultural stuff, but y'all going to take care of these animals. Y'all going to learn how to breed the animals and so on and so forth. And this was the beginning. This transition in their group identity this transition, this transformation in their group identity as hunters, right? As these strong, you know, militant providers for the community transitioned into the agrarian domesticator, the husband. That's where we get the whole idea of husbandry, the taking care and rearing and breeding of animals as husbandry. They became the divine husband, right? And once they learned the role, this was, this was not, the the um <clears throat> the mythologies the, the mythological stories are based on real world scenarios experiences and transitions through time and so this slow emergence of patriarchy was slow and it was happening everywhere at the same time it was happening across the planet at the same time so to ignore a Astrology, one, is an error on our part because astrological occurrences impact big ones like that 
impact the whole planet. That's why we can see during the last air sign, the air, uh, the sign of Gemini, all the pyramids were built during the last air sign, Gemini, all along the all along the equator, uh, among people who had not yet made contact with each other. How did it happen? How they knew to just build pyramids along the equatorial line from the Americas to Africa to Asia? How they did that? This happened during an air sign. Air sign is the rapid transformation of information across the whole planet. We're entering into this air sign now, right? Uh, new ideas, new architecture, new technologies, rapidly, <clears throat> rapidly um, disseminating over the entire planet, right? I'm not rambling. I'm making a point. No, I, I get you. I, I think that I probably said, I don't think I was communicating exactly what I was trying to get across. I think what I was trying to say was, was there a time in prehistory where men just felt second second class? Yes. That's, yes. that's all I'm trying to yes. not, not to say that women did the atrocities to men that men did okay. to yes. the world today. Absolutely, it's yes. That's, ex that yes. It, that's what yes, I mean. That's like, exactly I what I'm saying. It's hard because I'm like, okay, so patriarchy and I'm going to tell you, hold on. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, because whether, whether it was intentional or not, whether that was the intention of the mothers, the females, societies, the egalitarian society of women, whether that was the intention or not, that was how it was received. Because remember in the live, I talked about these mythologies and I was like, damn, why are they so pervasive in so many spaces of these mythologies of male deities feigning to be female in order to enter into secret spaces? It's in Greek mythology, it's in Roman mythology, it's in Ifa tradition, huh? It's because uh, yeah. Obatala talks about how um, in the story where Oshun gets mad with the other Orisha for treating her all messed up when they were sent down to prepare the earth for humans. Right. And um, and uh, Olodumare tells him, look, y'all better take y'all asses back down there and do what you got to do to bring Oshun back. She y'all offended her and she mad and you have to make peace with her before anything is going to go right on earth. And so she came back to earth and did all the stuff, but she said, I'm still mad. Like I still got an attitude because what y'all did was that bullshit. You feel me? So I'm a, she says, I'm going to make myself pregnant. That's what she said. I'm going to make myself pregnant. And um, you better hope that the baby that I have is a male. Because if the baby that I have is a female, it's a wrap for all y'all. It's a wrap. And at that moment, they say, is when Obatala was a it was, yeah, it was about to lie that changed the baby in her womb from a female to male, right? So there are all these stories in Greek mythology, even Shango. There are certain um, mythology stories about Shango that talk about how beautiful he was, that he was so beautiful that he was loved by males and females. Um, that is the story of um, Aquarius, because that's what, why Shango is Aquarius. In um in the African Patreon, Shango is the planet Aquarius. And Aquarius was said to be so beautiful that people could not tell if he was male or female. That all the gods, male and female, wanted him. He was so beautiful. Um, what's his name? Um, Hermes. Is that his name? Hermes, the one, the one with the angel, the angel wings on the shoes. He was yeah. the messenger. Or Mercury. Between, yeah. Uh Earth and the gods, right? Mm -hmm. Hermes is um is who is also Mercury in Mercury. Roman mythology is um is a shoe it's a leg by it's a leg by right mm. well in in um Greek mythology Hermes was a consort of um of Af who is Venus Oshun. Right. Hermes was a consort to Aphrodite, but Aphrodite only allowed females to keep her temples, to know the secrets of the goddess. She only allowed females into the temple. So her Hermes was her consort. This was her child. Right. And um, but because he was so thirsty for these secrets that were being kept away from him because he was male. This is where we get um, the term hermaphrodite from, by the way, is Hermes in the story, right. okay? Hermes dresses as a female, disguises himself as a female 
so that he can enter the temple to his mother and learn all the secrets of his mother, right? That's where the term hermaphrodite comes from, was when Hermes dressed himself as a female to go and uh, steal the secrets of his mother from her temples, right? These stories are all throughout these different societies of the male that disguises himself as a female to get close to the goddess, to get close to these secrets that are kept from him because he is male. It's indicated even throughout some of these places like in Egypt and, and all throughout Europe, where if a male presented in a way that was very effeminate, right? The only way he could work, he could become a consort in the temple was to do what? Was to become a eunuch, was to self-castrate. This may be where some of the resentment comes from. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We Even in that movie, what was the movie? The Woman King, right? The Woman King. Remember that movie? I do not. Um, with Viola Davis. It came out maybe two years ago. But anyway, in The Woman King, you should watch it. They have a, they have a temple eunuch there, <clears throat> a male who lives as one of the priestesses in the um in the temple in, in the in the in the palace so eunuchs existed in every culture right these people who we may today would call would call like uh two spirit people or um you know um multi gendered people like africa has stories about multi gendered people people who present with more than one gender um but <clears throat> it may be that it would be an interesting thing to understand. Um, it may be that the denial of access to our sons in these spaces where we've kept these secrets, quote, of the mother, it may be that she's just saying, now we, we can't afford secrets that the males have to, the only way to heal them is to understand how, what love looks like coming from a mother, how to experience that as a male. Since you are half female, you have the capacity to love. You have the capacity to love deeply, even if you do not have the capacity to give birth. That you don't have to envy the blood rituals of women. You don't have to control and dominate the blood rituals of women to experience the love of the mother both ways. Giving the love of the mother and receiving the love of the mother. We have a responsibility to teach them that and then trust them enough to experience and demonstrate that. Do you understand? Yes. I and, Go ahead. And this and this thought that men have the capacity to experience love like women love flies in the face of today's ideology. You know, I would yes. never say this in a B in a BWE space, right? I'd be crucified. What's that? DWE. BW Black Women Empowerment. Space, oh, okay, okay. Right, because the the pervasive thought is that men can't love. Men don't have the capacity. They're not only do they not have the capacity to love, but they are. Uh, what's the word um when something doesn't work right <laughs> like they are they're, they're born uh, dysfunctional they're born i'm sorry the word is not coming to me right now but defective that's the word they're born <clears throat> defective and there's no Come way on. that they can love now let's pause what does that say about us if we accept the, I, cause I think you listen, you know, I'm always telling y'all, I think everything is the police. Everybody mm -hmm. is, the, everybody's suspect <laughs> until they right. think suspect. Right. Every, everything that does not like hit right with my spirit. Sound like mm -hmm. some patriarchal shit. Sound like some patriarchal manipulation to further create divisions among those who otherwise should be allies. That's what it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. To say that males are born flawed is to say that the mother is flawed is to say that the process is not perfect. What is the process? The process of maintaining our presence on the planet, the regenerative process that emanated from the body of the um, parthenogenic producing mother. To say that that is inherently flawed, why? Be because again, females are flawed. Because again, females are dirty. Females 
right? It still right. goes back to that kind of patriarchal condemnation of female flesh and mm -hmm. all the processes associated with it being filthy, dirty, flawed, inherently flawed. That's the only way we can, we as women can accept an idea, whether we recognize it or not, that somehow our, our sons who are half us yeah. are inherently flawed. Yeah. It makes it easy for us to be okay with hating men. Um, it makes it easy. It gives us it gives us an explanation. And there's plenty that patriarchy does to give us an explanation about why we should hate men, why we should be, why we should feel unsafe around men. And I am not listen, just as just as I say that I would never deny a black person or brown person or a red person or a yellow person their right to say I hate white people. They have a lived experience that teaches them that they have every right to hate white people. They have every right to fear white people. They have every right to fear that for their safety. There's sanity in space with white people. I would never deny somebody that. Never. Right. I would hope that over time, through what it is we trying to build, that we can we can right these wrongs that exist between us. But I would not deny nobody saying, look, I don't fuck with white people like that. You got it, Cassandra. That's you. You understand? <laughs> right. Same way with a woman that says, I don't fuck with men, period. I don't trust them. I don't like them. I hate them. She has enough of a lived experience that tells her this is what it takes to, to self-preserve. This She has it. I have that. Every female I know has enough experiences in their life to say, okay, I can't trust motherfucking men. I would never deny a woman saying, oh, you got it. This is the world you're trying to create. I get it. But right now, this is the way the world is. And I don't fuck with them. <laughs> I don't fuck with them. And I'll be like, that's all right, baby. No judgment. Really, no judgment. Hopefully, we can create in real time a world where that world disintegrates. That world where we do not feel safe in space with our sons. We have to, we have to like, we have to claim ownership of them. <laughs> they all can't, we can't have it both ways. The temple of evolutionary emergence is what? We say the temple of evolutionary emergence is the uterus. It's the one thing that binds us all. It's the, it's the one thing we all got in common. Can we make that the center? Can we say, okay, the, rev, the, the temple of evolutionary emergence, the uterus that, that gave us all permission to be, gave us all permission to exist, right? right? This is the thing that unifies us all. This is the thing that binds us all. And can, can, I, can I honor your sovereignty for that reason alone, that you got a mama and I got a mama and there, they are the evidence of God on earth, God in the material realm. They're, they're bleeding over us to ensure that we existed. They're feeding us even when they didn't know if we were going to be made real or not. The care that they took for us, the protection that they showed for us. This is the unifying thing. And males are half females. They're not mutants, though we would like to call them that. They aren't malignant versions of us the mother saw fit for them to exist continues right. to see fit for them to be born and exist right and so until she says okay pump the brakes on that no more males until she says that what role can we play as females to try to win in them that one, just to hear, maybe this is the cause of your isolation and we should bring you into space, still creating processes that guarantee sovereignty and safety in space. I ain't saying just run the fuck out and embrace any man you see because all oh, he acting out because uh, of this old shit that happened and what he's suffering from is separation anxiety because we as the egalitarian collective of women didn't let the males into the space. To That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm still saying everything that I have said before. Women need to take self-defense classes. Women need to learn how to fire arms. Women need to learn how to break somebody's kneecaps if they need to. This is the world that we live in. But multiple things can be true at the same time. Right. Recognizing the rage that we're experiencing in the behavior of men. It's not just some blanket hatred of women or want to quote, dominate women. It is a deep and seething rage that is old and not yet resolved. How do we provide 
as the mothers, as the first ones here, who else is going to come up? Who else is going to express an ideology like this? It can't be anybody who is not sitting in ceremony all the time with the mother saying, look, we can you make this shit plain so we can go ahead and get this shit to popping already? Can we go ahead and solve this shit already? I don't care how uncomfortable it is. If I need to know it, let me see. If it's going to make this work easier, let me hear. I did not want to say that shit to y'all. But she said, now sit your ass down for a week, bury your ass in this dirt, and let me tell you what they suffer from. This seething rage that they have, its seed is grief. It's seed. When we talk about resentment, when we talk about fear, you when she talked about that in The Great Cosmic Mother, the mm -hmm. seed of that is grief. Remember I said in the live that 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 damn um, quote that what's his name in um, the Panther movie? What's what's the what's what's the um, that Michael B. Jordan's character? What was his name? Oh um, God, I can't remember. Um, right? And they said um, he said something to the effect of, um, you know, the child not embraced by the village, the child made outcast by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Isn't this the behavior of males that we see in the world? Yeah. Destructive even to their own end? Mm -hmm. That's rage. But that rage is centered in grief. There is a longing there to feel the warmth of the village that it has been denied. That, that longing, that isolation, that grief becomes the seething flames of rage that become insanity that become wild insanity, untamed insanity. That's the pathogenesis of how grief becomes insanity in traditional Chinese medicine and five elements theory. Grief untreated becomes the heat and the fire that harasses the heart that causes mental illness. That's what we're seeing. I'm saying um, the treatment for that is, you know, cool and cold herbs you feel me uh cool and cold therapies um or love <laughs> i hate to say it but we can love and still love from afar we can love and still protect ourselves we can still demonstrate what it's going to take for men to be made well to not feel like somehow they're sacrificing a half of themselves they they present certain ways because they they need to i'm not asking men to deny themselves masculinity I'm not I'm not asking men to deny themselves access to power. I'm not asking men. I'm not I'm not demanding of men to um, to be more female like because that's what happened with the eunuchs. The, the female priestesses in the temple required that the males be more female like in order to be in the space, be more female like to to have access to the to the secrets of the mother. They had to literally castrate themselves in order to worship in the temple or to be guardians in the temple. That's not what I'm asking of men to be more female like. I'm not asking men to do that, to become um, worshipers of the mother, to become those who center and protect the ambitions of the mother to reemerge, to be reborn in the new age. I'm not asking men to deny themselves power. Or, I just want them to embrace true power and not malignant power. True power is in the mother, right? And so that's what we have to teach them even while we are taking self-defense classes and learning how to fire a piece and learning how to break kneecaps and doing all the things that we need to preserve our own selves. But what we're calling on men to do is what I've been saying all this time. All this time, we've been protecting men. We've been covering men. We've been taking care of men. Einstein's wife was his mama. Einstein's wife was his mama. She made sure he ate on time. She cleaned up after him. All that shit that y'all want from us it's your turn to be the mother to the hmm, to be the mother to the reemerging black goddess to be the re to be the mother that's all of us that's the whole collective this is the whole global womb right here surrounding the little baby embryo that is the mother reemerging yeah the mother reemerging i know that sound deep we have to make that something that becomes a political statement that people can resonate with. They may not be able to hear 
males <laughs> becoming the mother to the reemerging mother. But that's how they have to love. They cannot continue to love like the father because the father is a malignant version, a toxic version of the mother's love. It always has been. There's no place in human history where the father's, the father I'm talking about as an archetype, where the father's execution and uh, administering of love was not always antagonistic to the administering of the mother's love. Always. It was always conditional. Father's love it was always conditional. That's why it's so, so what's, easy. Go so ahead. What's the pr I, I have, this is open up a whole different line of questions. I know you have other people coming down. <laughs> well, nobody but, else has clicked on the link to be oh, like okay. to talk. So you're, you're fine. Problem. So it's you and me. We got this. <laughs> so this is like a two part question. This new okay. world that we're birthing. Say that again. I, this new world that we're birthing. And I'll uh -huh. tie this back into what you're talking about the father. This new world that we're birthing. Do we even know what this looks like? And, and and if so, what does it look like in in personal life? Like how 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 do we take this this high concept and bring it down into your personal everyday life to live it authentically? What does um, that look are, like? Those things are happening simultaneously. Okay. So those 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 things have to happen simultaneously, right? So when I and, talk to and, and before you answer, this is going to tie back into the, the father, because like you said, men are here because they have a purpose. So the 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 idea or the creation of the father had to have a purpose as well. How do we reposition the father into its correct position so that it works and functions the way it was meant to? And what is that? What is that function? OK, so that's a deep question. Let's go back to the first one. Okay. <clears throat> the um, so, and I feel like this is one of the things that were that's happening in real time. Whether it's in the book club, because I tell y'all everything that I do is purposeful. Everything that I do is for this unfolding of this vision. I have a I have a clear vision of what the future looks like. I have a clear vision of what technology looks like in the future. I have a clear vision of the role of AI in creating this world that we're talking about. I do not fear AI at all. I do not fear AI. I, the reason that AI is profound and it's important right now, and the reason that there's so much narrative trying to gener trying to get, and there has been for about 40 or 50 years, this narrative trying to get us to fear the age of robots, fear the age of AI and shit like that is because of the potential that it represents to free us from labor. That's what it represents. And if you have four motherfucking men who control all the technology, then all it's going to do is deepen and exacerbate our, our lack and our longing and our suffering. But if AI is in the hands of the global population, AI liberates us from labor. Because what capitalism has done is turned all of us into commodities. Every person born on this planet is a commodity for, for the, creation, the creation and recreation of real life for the selected few, for the selective few. We all, whether we're upper middle class or whether we're working class, we are all commodities. And our proximity, just what it does is it provides a buffer for those who run and control the world the way that it is. AI represents a real threat to that dichotomy. AI represents a real opportunity to completely destroy the chasm between those who have and those who don't have. For the first time in human history, AI really represents the possibility of a global revolution that completely does away with the systems of workers and bosses. It does, depending upon who holds control of that technology when it is unleashed in mass. You understand? And so all of these movies that have been made over the last 50 years or so, getting us terrified of AI and, oh my God, I'm going to have to compete with a robot for my job. Mm -mm, that ain't it. If you, as the worker, as the prior worker, I don't call us workers anymore, but you as a global population 
Now everything that we produce is for the benefit of the global population. AI becomes an instrument that expedites that process of completely eliminating the need for human labor. See, whenever we have technological advances, what they're supposed to do is make life easier as we evolve. These all technologies are supposed to make life easier is to take us further and further away from the, the brunt force of labor, having to labor as a commodity to earn your right to exist on the planet. That's what it does. That's what it means to be a commodity, to work, to labor, to earn your right to drink water, to earn your the right to electricity, to earn your right to X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. What, a, what AI represents for the first time in history is a radical technological leap forward that has the ability to liberate us from labor. Everybody who incarnates is fully cared for because the production of real life, the production of resources, the production of things that we can buy on the market, the, the productions of things that we need is now animated. It doesn't require human suffering. It doesn't require human blood, sweat, and tears to, to generate these things. Now our intellect has created an apparatus, an instrument that can produce for us liberating our higher chakras so that we can think more profoundly. We can rest more deeply. We can contemplate greater things. This happened during the last age, uh, the last air age, where now they're saying the last air age is when, you know, like the universe was charted and, you know, and people started writing and the medical schools at Timbuktu were created and all of it, all of this leap forward in the imagination, the freeing up of the higher chakras. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says the same thing. It's theft, of course, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about once those foundational needs are met, it allows you to evolve through your own chakras to where you can contemplate deeper. You can't contemplate deeper ideas when you got to work a 40 hour work week and do two hours a night of homework with your kids, right? AI represents an opportunity for the first time in a very long time to come ever for the first time ever to completely animate the workforce, liberating human beings from the toil of labor. So you're saying that if AI beings are, hold on. If mm -hmm. liberate, if human beings are liberated from the toils of labor, will prisons exist? Will prisons need to exist? Once every incarnate has a right to exist on the planet, cared for, needs met by the earth the way she intended it in the first place. Once the workforce is liberated, right? Animated, right? Um, the preschool to prison pipeline. Will, will there be a need for hierarchies at all? Right? Will, um, there will be no need to glorify millionaires and billionaires if the workforce is animated and we are all guaranteed the ability and the ease to live. This is the, this is the vision that I have and the role that AI plays in that. Go ahead and say what you were going to say, but there's something else I want to add to that. Um, in, in Christian mythology, work was punish was punishment. Yes. For sin. So yes. are you saying that spiritually speaking, AI is the redeemer? <laughs> you took it way, way left field. That is not what the fuck I'm saying. Okay. But I can see how I can see how I can see that was deep. That that was not what I was expecting. Um <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yo, that was girl, where that came from? No, I, I wouldn't say well, you, AI is the redeemer. Because you were saying that we will be released from the toil of work. AI and like you that. and like you said, mm -hmm. and it's not just Christian mythology. Christian mythology, a lot of what we know as Christian mm -hmm. mythology that we think is all was actually created Correct. within the last four hundred years. Yeah, right? I just, that's just what I grew up on, and I, I know I did too. I'm not. Okay. I'm not demoting. I'm just saying yeah. a lot of what we we think is a couple thousand years old is actually only two to four hundred years old. Right. Yeah. They just started adding shit as they came along yeah. and as their relationships with the means of I'm talking about um, I'm talking about the um, the progenitors 
of mm -hmm. um, Christianity. As their relationship to the means of production changed, you can see how the how the theology changed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it there are things that are added as needed. So like when we were reading in Pure Lust, she was talking about how um, you know the whole what it, um, what was it called um, the um, the insect um, what is it called the um, fuck. Divine, it's not, it's not divine. Is it divine inception? When he talked about how the only way Jesus, uh, the only way Jesus, the only way Mary could give birth to Jesus is if she, the immaculate conception, immaculate conception. The, immac the immaculate conception, that the immaculate conception literally was um, created in the late 1800s as a response to the first wave of feminism. Do you remember reading that in Pure Lust? Mm -hmm. So they pick and choose and create theologies based on their based on the changes in their relationship to the means of production because the church is fed by the means of production and whoever controls the means of production at any given time, whether it's the nobility or whether it's the state. And what the what the what the ideology does is justify the behavior of the state. And that ain't my opinion. V.I. Lennon talked about it. Karl Marx talked about it. Mary Daly talked about it from a feminist perspective. These ideologies change and are malleable based on their change in relationship to the means of production. How they going to get they loot? How they going to keep themselves fat at the expense of the workers? So it becomes a, it, workers. And that's why we accept it, that we have to work these bullshit and ass jobs. For, my mom worked the same job for some from the time I was... 11 and she just retired two years ago from the time I was 11 and she just retired two, two years ago, back breaking work, especially for a woman. She worked at a nuclear plant mm. all them years and her body's paying for it. Right. And so, um, but we do it because, you know, that is the language that exists all throughout it. Work hard labor is Punishment for crime, some sin you committed, some some flaw, some inherent flaw of your sinful, lowly self. And so that idea becomes ingrained in us. And so we create narratives to make ourselves feel a little bit better about it. Hard work, discipline, perseverance, a life defined by struggle. You start to wear struggle as a badge of honor. Look at how many struggles I've gone through. Look at how many struggles I've persevered through. I'm a survivor. I'm, I'm a, a strong survivor. black woman. <laughs> okay everything becomes a badge of honor that concretizes in your brain and everybody around you that the only way is to suffer the only way is to struggle the only way is laborious while everything in your flesh is resisting it Everything in your body is like, you don't want to fucking go to work at no six o'clock in the morning. You don't want to be up at four o'clock in the motherfucking morning to go to some job that you ain't even getting paid the value of your labor. What is the value of your labor? What you say it is. Not somebody telling you, you got to work for $4 an hour, $7 an hour, $15 an hour, while you generating all the wealth around you that you see. Imagine the dichotomy. I told y'all last week about this damn condominium. I thought it was $350,000. My neighbor was like, girl, you crazy. She said the cheapest condo in there is $1.3 million. They, they, I'm telling you, these Mexicans built this goddamn condominium complex behind our apartment complex in less than eight months. I, I'm, 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 I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be outside the possible. It was like six months. Cause I was like, we had just moved in here. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is what we going to wake up here every day for a year, two years. Like how long is it going to take them to build this shit? Charlie had this shit erected out of a flat earth in goddamn six to eight months. $1.3 million is the cheapest unit in there. But then Mexicans was getting paid 25 goddamn dollars an hour on this institution that will generate wealth as long as it stands. Were they getting paid the value of their labor? The value of their labor is these 1.5 million, 1.3 million, 2.5 million goddamn dollar condominiums. That's the value. But they don't benefit from the value of their labor. Right. You see what I'm saying? Mm hmm. And so, um, so this thing will continue to generate wealth and generate wealth and generate wealth and generate wealth. And everybody that lives in them will flip them and flip them and turn them over and become wealthy. And 
Meanwhile, he got paid $25 an hour to build this institution of wealth, continuing wealth, where he got to go find another bullshit Nash job for another $25 an hour, just to hope that with his full-time working partner, they can keep living in the city of Los Angeles where the, where the cheapest, my rent is $2,365 now, $2,365 now. You understand? Where they can hope to live bare minimum because I live in my rent my I live in rent control my rent control I, I have rent control so they don't go up every year right or they can only go up a certain percentage every year <clears throat> but so all he can do is struggle to hope that he um can make another find another job where he erects another monument of wealth generation mm. and never not have the opportunity to have stock in the place or nothing don't get kickbacks every time it's Nothing. You see what I'm saying? So um, the future, I think AI is going to play a radical role if we can get our minds around how AI is not an enemy from Terminator or fucking iRobot or some shit like that, where we don't have to be co competing with robots for a job. That's not the future of humanity is looking for a fucking job. Is having a job that defines who you are as a person. The first thing you ask somebody that's a potential boo is what you do for a living. Yes. I live for a living. Yes. I live for a living. Now, ask me about who I am as a person. Ask me. Yeah, ask me about my mama. <laughs> ask me about what what artistic vision I have for how I can contribute to this beautiful world we have created. Not what you do for a living, mm -hmm. right? That's one yeah. thing. Um, I want to build a school. I want to build a school. I want to build. I want to build a Harry Potter style, big, giant, wonderful school that's full of magic and science and mathematics and agriculture and health and wellness. I want to teach little kids where babies come from. <laughs> right. I mm -hmm. want to teach teenagers how to be midwives. You know, or mid people, let's we gotta come up with a new word for it. How mm -hmm. do we get boys just as enthusiastically excited about the birth giving process as little girls? Right? How do we create a? I want all, I want to build a school. That is, as a matter of fact, I think it's the temple's first order of business. I want to build a school. I have a sense of urgency because I got grandbabies that I don't ever want to enter into the public school system. I got grandbabies that I want to build a school for. But I'm like, what do I want that school to look like? I want that school to be immersive. I want them to be outside. I want them to be able to put their feet in the raw earth. I want them to learn how to fish. <laughs> I want them to learn how to weave together. And what does this symbolically mean when groups of people come together and create a tapestry where everybody's, everybody's skills are necessary and represented in the tapestry? I want them to learn that with their hands, like I, I did in the fifth grade, learning how to weave a rug. Right. I want them to learn that magic is real. What is the evidence of magic in the real world? What does it look like? How does it how does it show itself? And I want them to learn all the deep sciences and that science is the language of spirit. It's not separate from spirit. It's the language It's how spirit communicates is through science. Right. So. Yeah. And then I want old people to be in the school. I want old people to be in the school. I want to have a, a what is it? A zero through through ninety nine school with skills and trades if people want them. But I want people's minds to be blown the fuck open. That's what I want. I want I want the unity of heaven and earth. Let me take a note before I forget. Oh, that might be the name of the school. Shall that might be the name of the school? We got the name of the school for the simple y'all. The school <laughs> of unity of heaven and earth. Anyway, <clears throat> let me read some of these comments, woman. We going on the three hour mark. I'm just running my mouth. <laughs> You ain't got to go nowhere, though. Hold on. <clears throat> Being chosen is, to me, so 
uh, is elitist. Oh, yes. Come on. I, I don't know who Akeem is, but I like him. Being chosen is so elitist to me, a false sense of pride. That's why these elites feel like it's OK for them to spill so much blood because they feel that they like they are chosen to be like the mother. <clears throat> yes, uh, I've always felt uncomfortable with that. The idea of like a talented 10, the chosen few, you know, the 144,000. I don't care what tradition it is. I don't care where it comes from, um, you know, in the party. You know, the chairman used to say, you know, we are the best sons and daughters of Africa. The fuck? Right. That sounded great at the time, but like, damn. Yes, that I appreciate that comment. And yet they spill the blood that's never their own. Yesterday, I was thinking about how psycho sounds like cycles in a way. Oh, wow. That's kind of deep. I like it when y'all get deep on me like that. This is so profound, yet so naturally obvious. Thank you, 4K Walks and Travels. Keep it coming, God. <laughs> um, yes, I was telling my family this yesterday. We got to take care of our heart. Yes. It, listen, I, I might need to, so I did um, the liver. Um, I did. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I did the liver. Remember, I started telling I was telling you I was going to teach y'all five elements theory. And I started with the liver because we're in the liver season. Um, the next on the the next on the. The cycle is the heart. So we'll, we're going to spend some time next this coming week on the heart. I'm still going to talk to you guys a little bit about the liver. There's still some things I wanted to share with you about the liver, but we're going to do the heart next this coming week. I'll let you guys know when. Right. I slowed down and said, I get it. I grasped it's being caught in these cycles of our time. And it start to uh, and it's start to fragment us in a different way, like a DVD or a record that has a scratch. Interesting. Earth equals heart in point of a new beginning. Um, let's see. Yes, yes. This is everything because we are always in the womb. We are always within the body of our mother. So it's like being in the womb, being hit triple time with those projections. Um, uh, they get a demonstration from their fathers and make and makes in the environment. I don't know what is meant by that. Amen, sis. Um, um, I'm an only son and the youngest. I got a lot of that from my mother. I was expecting that from black women. I love, I love me some black women. All I date is black women. I love the goddess. Um, my little brother, when he was born, my heart melted. I love him so much. All <laughs> happy Earth Day to your grandson, my little boo. That's my y'all don't understand that boy. That is my boo. He. He is such a, but he is also a pandemic baby. He was born three weeks after lockdown. And so there, I think that these pandemic babies are here to teach us something because Zane Kalani is very loving, very sweet, very, but she's very sensitive. She's her feelings are so easily hurt. Zane is a typical Aries baby. He is an Aries baby. You feel me? He is rambunctious. He off the chain, but but he represents the two extremes, like harmoniously fluid in his own little body. Is as rambunctious and off the chain as he is. Is as sweet and loving. And because he's, I, this is a theory, because these pandemic babies spent the first year of their life not seeing people's mouths move as they were learning to talk. Right. This is a sensory deprivation, not seeing their mouths move, not seeing people's whole faces. I feel like their other senses like heightened. And so his heightened sense is touch. He is such an empath empathic baby. He is such an intuitive baby. He feels people. You don't have to say anything. And he'll walk up to you since he was little bitty. You OK? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You OK? I, I could be just, you know, not even thinking about anything deep, just like in my mind, like I be, I get this look on my face when I'm determined, when I'm like, and he'll be like, Yaya, you okay? You okay, Yaya? He feels everything. And he is so thirsty for skin on skin touch. 
we'll be sitting on the couch watching TV and he'll lift my shirt up just enough that his arm can touch my belly while he's leaning against me while we watching TV. He is very, very empathic, very, very loving. And I think these, these babies that were born within that, that uh, from the time pandemic, you know, lockdown happened to about two years, any baby born in that period of time, these are going to be radical babies and we have to pay attention because people will be attempting to medicate these babies. People will be attempting to, to, to diagnose this ex, these extremes in their sensor, their heightened senses in the other areas that they were deficient from being able to watch people's mouths to learn to speak, their deep hearing, their deep sensing, their deep emotional intuition. People will be attempting to stifle that. We have to watch these babies. Zane just turned four. Like I said, he was born three, literally three weeks after lockdown. We have to be careful, one, not to stifle this in these babies, not to stifle because we are uncomfortable what these babies are expressing. They're here to teach us something. And two, not to let somebody diagnose your baby is somehow deficient. ADD, ADHD, behavioral disability, learning disability. We have to sharpen and protect these babies. They're here to teach us something. This baby is so profound. And every pandemic baby that I have met is equally profound. Okay. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, um, I'm never, I never blame women. I just want to figure, figure it out. So we together can coexist and express love. That is from Ty, uh, Ty, Ty Yazid. Free Palestine says, uh, Reverend Brianna Lind. Um, a great mother loves her son. He is my son. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, the brother that's on the temple committee, the founding committee for the temple of evolutionary emergence of Basi says, um, he says, before I even learned anything about the great cosmic mother, when I was just a revolutionary, I always used to say, uh, um, you know, I'm my mother's son. That's who I am. I'm my mother's son. Right. My son, Jaw's son. I like this. Uh, my daughter's over. My daughter's over through her as well. And now it's up to us to correct this mess. <clears throat> <clears throat> men need to be taught to face the challenges of being men. They need to expect to be tried. It looks like women and children together and men in separate places at minimum. That's the first step. I don't know that that's the first step. I think that among, I don't know that that's the first step. That's not what I'm trying to create with the temple. I'm not trying to create separation. I've been telling y'all that from day one, that when, even if it's just these two moments, these two hours that we're in space together, like once we have an actual brick and mortar temple, once we're in the space together, what can we command of the space that guarantees individual sovereignty in the space. Even if it's for these two hours, this is what the future looks like. Men, males, females, all the genders, um, all the races, co from old to baby, <clears throat> coexisting harmoniously in a space because there is an oath that we take to not only um, protect, but to honor everyone's sovereignty in the space, no matter your background, no matter who you came from, no matter where you came from, no matter your ideology, that in these two hours, in this ceremony, in this space where we hold temple services or whatever, this is the guarantee, this is the promise that we make to one another to see the future right now in this space, in these two hours, to be an example of what the future can be, to create the future in real time. Yes, those isms still exist in the world, but can we create the future in real time? This is what it looks like. This is what is required. This is the this is the commitment that we make to one another in this space. And then if you do not fulfill the commitment, then we'll have you escorted the fuck out the out the space. You can't have access to the space if you cannot if you cannot commit to honoring the future. If you cannot commit to honoring sovereignty in the space. It's that simple. Because I'm not talking about no frou-frou shit. I really am not. I am crystal clear about what, um, what radical transformation usually brings out. 
in those that do not see themselves in the future. It brings out sharpening of rage, right? So I'm not I'm not talking about no frou-frou shit. I'm talking about when we come together as the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence, we have protocols. This is the honor that you make before you walk into the space, before you even walk in the doors. This is the this is the oath that you have to take that applies to these two hours that you're in our space. What you do outside the space is on you. What we hope is that we create in you through this process a way to see the future made real in your mind's eye. Damn, that was radical what happened in them two hours. Everybody from every space and every walk of life existing harmoniously, honoring each other's sovereignty, seeing sameness in each other because we have that thing that unifies us all in common. The temple of evolutionary emergence. The uterus is what binds us all. The portal that transforms all the potentialities of the entire universe into a material force to execute a destiny in real time. This is what I'm trying to create. So I don't know. I don't I don't accept that. I do accept what I said before. Because I still, I'm not trying to create frou-frou. Hippie shit, let's all just stop in place. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about absolutionism. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. Let's just all start over. It's just a restart button. We all, that we all equal and we all the same. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying even as we have to create these spaces that are exemplary of the future that we want to see made real, right? That we still have to recognize that we live in a world that has been completely swayed off balance and to be able to cover and protect ourselves while creating this world. To be able to create and implement protocols when we bring strangers into a space to say, do you agree to take this oath to honor the sovereignty of every, in, every incarnate in the space? These are the consequences if you fail to if you fail to meet this if you fail to meet this commitment. You can't be up in here um, challenging and encroaching on people's sovereignty. You can't be in a space like that. We'll toss your ass the fuck out of here. <laughs> That's what that means. That at all costs we will protect and defend everybody's sovereignty up in the space. And then you walk out of the space, hopefully implementing that feeling of what true individual sovereignty looks like within the whole within the whole right that's what i'm trying to create i was i was um responding to 4k walks and travels when she said it looks like women and children together and men in separate spaces at minimum um, that's the first step i just don't i don't accept that i think that's the that's part of the problem that's the problem that we're saying that this download came from in the first place was the casting out of the males of the egalitarian circle of women. There are enough males that we know. That's why I talked about the man that allowed us to facilitate this ritual on his property, who there is something in them calling to them, just like she's calling to us. This regular, seemingly regular, everyday, middle-aged white guy who owns this multi-million dollar property in the middle of the desert meets a a working class black woman and I say look I got this radical idea for this property how radical can I, can I get like are, are there some boundaries you feel me he was like do what you will and I will support it do what you will and I will support it I can't even tell you what that meant he charges $17,000 for a four day retreat on his space child that is not what the fuck he charged us <laughs> not even remotely close. Not even remotely close. You understand what I'm saying? That's what that's what's called putting your money where your mouth is. I may not agree with everything that you say, but I support what it is you're trying to create. Let me let me demonstrate that to you. That's what that's what I'm talking about when I mean for men giving men the opportunity to show up with the mother's love. To to demonstrate with the love of a mother you're invested in, you protect, you cover, you surround, you support. That's what I mean when I say the world has to give birth to the, the re-emerging Black mother. To cover, support, surround. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. He was still his very alpha male self. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was still his very, very alpha male self. 
but it is like, I am on board. How can I show up for you? How can I support what it is you're doing? Just tell me. And that's what he did. Seemingly everyday, regular white guy from Cleveland. You understand? We and and we were able to completely let go. We were able to fully be safe and relax in our bodies to do this thing that we needed to do. Completely certain that we were covered, that we were surrounded, that we were going to be OK. While we could be completely focused on what it was we were trying to do with the mother. Right. So um, that's the world we're trying to create. I'm not trying to create malignant versions of men. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not trying to create eunuchs, spiritual eunuchs in males. I'm not trying to do that. I'm saying males are of our body. The mother saw fit for them to exist just as they are in their bodies. How can they tap in to the maternal side of themselves, their X chromosome? How can they tap into that to become harmonious expressions? Just like we need to become harmonious expressions. Because women ain't perfect. We are impacted by colonialism and patriarchy too. How do we become harmonious expressions of the divine harmony between the sacred, the sacred masculine and the divine feminine, the mother and the son within all of us, right? We need to, we need to demonstrate that to them, even as we're working it out for ourselves and vice versa. I'm not asking males to, you know, to kowtow or anything like that. I'm telling you to show up because you feel the call, because you hear the call and you see how it can ease your suffering. It can, it can alleviate your isolation. It can end your longing. It can alleviate the resentment and the jealousy and the fear that you have felt by being cast out from the circles of women. There are men that we can bring into that space now and know that we can be okay. We know them. We know men close to us who are able to hear, we can start with them. They can become the example, just like this brother that's on the founding committee of the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence. I tell him all the time, you have to be the articulator of what it means to, what does he call himself? He calls him a gorilla, a gorilla, of, the matri, a gorilla of the matriarchy or something to that effect. You have to be able to articulate to males who cannot yet, who cannot yet hear what I'm saying, saying coming out of my mouth. They can hear it coming from a man. That's okay. Your conditioning is deep. You can't hear the truth coming from a woman right now. That's okay. I get it. Your conditioning is deep. So we need males who can articulate the ambitions of the mother. The will of the mother. And males be able to see this manly man, this masculine man saying, look, I'm a gorilla for the matriarchy. I fight on behalf of the mother. Whatever her will is, that's what I'm about. Say what? And what? <laughs> I will defend and protect the spaces that the mother creates. And what? Yeah. So, yes. What you got to say? I hear you took a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> Forgive I heard. Me. I hear it all. <laughs> Girl, I could hear you thinking, okay? <laughs> yes. The wheels and the smoke right now. Um, Say that again. I said the wheels and the smoke right now. Girl, I can feel, I can hear the engine turning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just trying to picture what this looks like for Taj and Taj's daily life. Huh? I'm trying to, I'm trying to picture what this looks like for Taj and Taj's daily life. How how does Taj facilitate the love for the the the, the mother's love for? I, I'm I'm probably not saying this right, but I'm hoping you're understanding where I'm coming from. How how do I live that every day? How do I live that authentically every day? Well, <clears throat> I'll say this. It's <clears throat> I've said this before actually, where I. I take into myself um, criticisms from others that I think will be impactful for what it is I'm trying to execute. I'm going to say this, uh, like I was saying earlier, I don't condemn people, black, brown, red, yellow people who say they hate white people, right? 
and those same people who have criticized me for my relationships um, or proximity to white people, right? I don't uh, condemn women who say, I hate men. I don't trust them as far as I can throw one. Um, I don't fuck with them. That's you. And why are you so close to men? I don't know. Why you still be seeking relationships with men? Uh, so along with their expression of their opposition to these things, there is a criticism that they also, they also afford for my proximity to these spaces. Yeah. I am still a human. I am still, I still have human um, longings and, and things that I need to unlearn uh, because, you know, capitalism, colonialism, those things are ever present. They're constantly teaching us something and the work of deconstructing and reconstructing is ongoing. And I share that with y'all all the time. I don't keep shit secret. If it's a breakthrough for me, I feel like it's probably going to be a breakthrough for somebody else. And I'm going to share, I'll put my shit out in the open. I'll lay my shit bare and hopefully somebody can, can get fed from it or whatever. I'm saying that because in my daily walk, <clears throat> The thing that has been um, the most difficult for me to do, but the thing that I'm doing much more often is um, I, there's a there is a time where uh, I would keep under the guise of keeping the peace. I wouldn't check the shit out of people. Right. Um, and that is something that was very difficult for me. I'm a Virgo. That is a very Virgo I don't have many Virgo attributes, but that is definitely one that I have, the peacekeeper, right? Mm -hmm. To a fault, right? And um, so that's one thing that I've been really struggling with because I do, I've always been clear since I was very young that there was a reason that all of these different types of people would come into my life. Even though I grew up in a Black community, ever since I was little, I always the first boy I ever had a crush on was Vietnamese. You know what I'm saying? Relationships with Hawaiians and Filipinos and like how how do these these things happen where I am drawn and other people are drawn to me since I was very young. I was five years old. I had a crush on a boy named Bo. I was five. I can I can remember it clearly. Five years old, kindergarten, had a crush on this little Vietnamese boy named Bo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. these v seemingly randomly chaotic events that have always brought broad spectrums of people into my life, right? It didn't make any sense um, for most of my life. And then I got my Akashic Records opened in 2017, 2000, nope, 2018. And in the Akashic Records, that's what it was. That's what was revealed to me is that there's no accidents. There's no there's no randomness. Um, this is how you're going to have to communicate in the world Too many. You're going to have to be able to communicate in a way that no matter what language you speak, the whole world will be able to understand what you are communicating. This requires relationships with the many. This is what this has always been about. This is what it's always been about. Now, I'm mind blown because I was like, the fuck? But I'm saying that because <clears throat> in, in response to your question, how do I live this daily? Mm -hmm. The way that I live this daily, and it's hard, baby. It's a discipline. It's not something that just comes easily because people's conditioning can piss you the fuck off and it can show up in subtle and not so subtle ways, even among people that you like or you fuck with or you that you even love, Right. But I keep my eyes on that, which I have always, so as an adult, as a conscious adult, been clear about. I want to change the world. I know that is why I am here. So I can maneuver through y'all bullshit because I know y'all colonized. I know y'all conditioned. So I am only going to let you get on my nerves so much. But I'm going to give I'm going to administer some grace. I'm not telling anybody else that they have to do that. Black women are well within their rights to be cussing everybody the fuck out right now. <laughs> well within their rights. And I'm not telling nobody to to move through the world the way that I do. My my walk through this life is peculiar to me. It is the mother's peculiar ex expression of something that she needs through me. 
And we all have a peculiar expression. My expression may not be what is necessary for you, but I'm telling you in my daily walk, having a clear image in my eye, in my mind's eye of what I want the world to be, whether I am here to witness it or not, the world that I want to create radically and rapidly so that my grandchildren can experience. Okay. Yeah. Having that in my mind, even when I was a black, black nationalist, still the same world, boo, still the same world. Having that in my mind's eye and letting that guide my interactions with human beings and saying, situation to situation, how do I respond to this situation? Because what's one of the very first things that I've said in doing these lives and shit, right? Is that even the, the live that I did last week, it was called God is the moment. Not God is in the moment. God is the moment. What is the thing that I've been saying through the last five years of doing lives? Is that there, every moment, we are planting a seed. Every moment, we are creating a future. Are we recreating the past in the future? All the ails of the past? All the terrible things of the past? Or are we recreating Are we creating the new? Are we recreating the old or are we creating the new? In every single moment, that guides me. It's exhausting, but it guides me. Because... I will be the determining factor in someone's life, whether I'm conscious of it or not, how I behave, how I talk to them, how I show them mercy, how I choose not to cuss them out when they cross me, but instead educate them in a moment. The, the seed that I choose to plant, do I confirm in someone that the world is shit and never going to be made well? Or do I affirm in them that there is a possibility for something more, for something better? That happens every single moment. And that is a discipline. I'm not I'm not telling you it's easy and I'm not telling you that's the way for everybody, but it is the thing that guides me. It is the thing that guides me. Right? Yeah, I guess live recognizing that God, what we know as God, what we know as the power of whoo, of all potentialities, what we know as the cosmic egg up here. The cosmic egg all potentialities existing within the cosmic egg, surrounded by the infinity of the Ouroboros, right? All potentialities exist in every single moment. Multiple dimensions, multiple impacts on multiple dimensions. In every word, in every breath, in every conspiracy that we speak, whether positive or negative, every moment. We are creating a future. What is the future that we are creating in this moment? What is the, that requires you to be present? That's why I keep going back. We need to be, right. what is the saying? It is only through a well-rested you that I do my best work. That's why we have been turned into machines of labor, 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 labor. Gotta eat, gotta sleep. Can't sleep if I can't make no money. Can't eat if I can't make no money. Cause then I won't have no house. That's why we're turned into machines so that we cannot be present in the moment. We cannot be God as, as creators, as God in the moment. That's why I named it that. God is in the moment. Not in the moment. God is yes, the, moment. the moment. Is the moment. Mm -hmm. It's all the potential that exists in every moment. How I treat people, how I show up for people, how I care for people's feelings, even when they be in douchebags. I do. That's my burden. That's my labor. Mm -hmm. I ain't saying this for everybody. I'm not saying this for everybody. Some some people, their labor is going to be to cleave motherfuckers' heads off. I'm, I totally accept that. That once we get this shit to cracking, once the once the, the temple of evolutionary emergence is alive and in your in everybody's face, because <laughs> that's that's what I'm scheming on. Mm -hmm a marketing campaign, right? Finding a brick and mortar, calling into our existence, the brick and mortar that already belongs to us, creating a global committee, right? Once the temple of evolutionary emergence is in your face as a force to be reckoned with, which it will be, because I'm still all about building institutions, of dual and contending power, building institutions, of dual and contending power, um, there's going to be blowback. 
there's going to be blowback. And so we're going to need people who are not me. <laughs> we're going to need people who are not me. We're going to need people who are, um, you know, like my homeboy Abasi, who are going to be like, you know, the soldiers for the execution of the mother's will to secure the execution of the mother's will. We're going to need, you know, witches and wizards who function to energetically and spiritually protect, cover, and support the mother, the execution of the mother's will while we remain what? As black women, as women of color, and as women in general. Well-rested, centered, and able to connect to the moment, to God as the moment, so that we can radically and rapidly execute the will of the mother on earth in real time. I hope that was clear. What yeah. You daily, you can sit in ceremony, whatever that looks like for you. Ceremony don't have to be psychedelics. They help. But ceremony don't have to be psychedelics. It can be taking a deliberate day off and saying, I am turning off my phone for a 24 hour period. I am going to some space where all I can hear is the natural sounds and my own thoughts. Tell me what it is. You Be prayerful, though. My prayer has always been, allow me to be open to receive what you have for me, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Allow me to be open enough to receive what is for me, even if it makes me uncomfortable. That's a hell of a prayer to leave yourself open for spirit to do and say to you what she needs to. Allow me to be, I said that, maybe when I say I said that prayer for six weeks on the open road all the way across this country, and she put on she put on a fucking fireworks show for me the whole way, every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Allow me to be open to receive what is for me, what you need for me to hear, what you need for me to see, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Start with that. Take your ass out somewhere. You in California, take your ass to the beach or to the mountains or to the woods. Sit at the base of some tree with your bare feet. You feel me? And allow her to speak to you. Now be able to see signs, be able to see, see omens, read omens. Like um, I'm going to post some more pictures, but this hummingbird at, while we were at the retreat hit the glass window and fell on the ground. So we thought it was her. Oh, poor little hummingbird. He fell. He's hurt. He wasn't moving. He was alive, but he wasn't moving. So my whole girl put a little stick out and he crawled right up on the stick. So we right we went right into crisis management. Oh my God, there's got to be like a bird. You know how they have like bird, what do you call them? Um, sanctuaries, bird sanctuaries. Almost every city has them, right? They got like little bird sanctuaries. So I'm going on the phone trying to Google bird sanctuaries in the able in the area because the little hummingbird and broke a wing or something because he ain't moving. We all then came up to the bird, hummingbirds. This girl has a hummingbird in her hand just chilling. We all pat his little head, rub his little, his little underbeak. He's just cooing and carrying on. And she was like, oh my God, I think he's really hurt. He's, he's just not going nowhere. I ain't never seen the hummingbird be this still. As soon as we walked back outside and she put the stick on the ground, he didn't got love from seven women. As soon as she puts the stick back on the ground, he takes off like nothing ever happened. She held in her hand a hummingbird. Do you know how big that is? She didn't even think it was big. I was like, boo. That was a message just for you. You saw him when he fell. You picked him up. I said, that was something for you. You need to sit still for a moment and hear what that, what that message was for you, right? Um, so that's what I mean when I say see the signs, learn to read omens. Um, if you... What my practice has been is if I see an animal of any kind, if they cross my path, if they do something unusual, I will take a moment to just Google what is the spiritual meaning of this animal? What are they, what are they drawing? What are they drawing my attention to? Because contrary to popular belief, animals aren't here to just decorate the earth for our pleasure. They are, they are communicators too. Spirit chooses to use them too, right? So that's what I would say. I would say, especially now, right? You know, we on the eve of this lunar eclipse, no better time than the present. Take your ass outside today. I am. 
I'm going to the beach as soon as I finish this damn four hour live. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be two hours. I apologize, everybody. (laughs) It's my fault. That ain't you, shoot. It's me. (laughs) But that's a word for all y'all. Take um, it's um, it's the Virgo lunar eclipse in uh, um, in Aries. I think that's right. I might be wrong. I think it's a Virgo lunar eclipse. Um, but take um, take your ass outside today on the eve of this lunar eclipse, which is, um, if you're on the East Coast, it's, I don't remember, but Google it. For me, it is 7, 7.53 a.m. tomorrow on the Pacific Coast. Uh, so go outside today and tomorrow. I know most of you work on Mondays, but go outside between today and tomorrow. We're in the crest of this lunar eclipse. Go outside, um, go somewhere and get naked if you can. Um, go get in the ocean or a fresh body of water where you live or sit at a tree. If the desert is what you got, go outside, bathe in the energy of this lunar eclipse, which is a preview of things to come with this massive eclipse that's happening on April 8th. But for the next few weeks in particular, just be really mindful, very present. Let that be the mantra that God is the moment. That whatever I can think of, whatever I can create, whatever I can imagine, I can do it with this moment. Every interaction with every human being is creating a future. What is the what is the future I'm creating in this moment in my interactions with other human beings? Do I look at them and say men ain't shit? So I don't even say, hey, when somebody speak, I get it. I get it. But for these next few weeks, let's try to imagine the future and make it present. Without all the isms. Let's try to imagine the future and make it present, at least for these powerful energies that we about to move into. We just came out of this equinox, which was preceded by that powerful last of the year new moon. We entering into this full moon, which is also a lunar eclipse. And and just a few days after that, we got the um, what's happening on. Okay, no, that. uh, So we got we had the equinox. Then we had this lunar eclipse coming up. And then a few weeks after that, two weeks after that, we got this big, massive, giant, conspiracy theory laden uh, um, equinox, solar eclipse, I mean, solar eclipse um, happening across the country. So, you know, I know there's a lot of noise. There will continue to be a lot of noise, especially over these next few weeks. They're going to create so much noise, boo. They're going to create so much noise, boo. They're going to create so much noise. If you can't if you can't scroll through social media without getting caught up on all the gruesome headlines that are about to come down the pike because they are without all the terrible the world is gone to hell in a hell basket uh, feeds. It's not to tell you to ignore what's happening in the world It's to say, take the time that you would spend lamenting about that shit and focus on this world that we want to create in this moment sovereignty for every individual on earth sovereignty means safety sanity wholeness support fearlessness courageousness fully supported from the time they're born until the time they are reborn in the mother they are replanted in the earth this is this is the future i'm creating in this moment that represents all potentialities this new earth this new world, this new age, this evolutionary leap forward for all of humankind. That's what I'm focusing on. If you want victory for Palestine, if you want victory, victory is what we want. Victory is what we want for the people suffering on earth. Victory is what we want. Victory is what we want, right? Victory is what we want. Put that in your prayers. Victory for the people of Palestine. Victory for the women of Palestine. May the mother emerge. Uh, may the mother emerge, you know, and show her face, you know, for the people of Palestine, for the people of Congo, and so on and so on and so on and so on. May the mother, um, we welcome, uh, put it in the present. We welcome the emergence of the great one. We welcome, we welcome the reemergence of the mother. May her love you know, scatter through the earth like the waters of heaven. 
of great Aquarius or whatever. You feel me? Make it your own. Make, but willing the future into the now. Willing the future into the now. Right now. Every moment. Especially for these next big energetic movements, man. I can't I can't think of any 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 way to Yeah, I was just looking at the calendar and it looks like the eclipse is in Libra. Uh, the lunar eclipse? Yeah. Like this one tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh-huh. Okay, Libra. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you for that. And um and then what about the one on um uh, on April eighth? It's in Taurus. Oh, nice. Yeah. Which is interesting because both of those are ruled by Venus. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Come on in the room, mother. <laughs> Come on, 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 on in the room. Come on in the room. So that's another, that's another job for y'all the next three, four weeks is be pretty on purpose. I'm telling you, adorn yourself. I'm going to have to discipline my, because I got up this morning saying I was going to put some makeup on and then. I didn't, but that's going to be in, be beautiful on purpose. Not because you're trying to win anything, but because you're trying to show off for the mother. I'm my mother's daughter. I'm my mother's son. I'm my mother's child. And I am going to put my best self on display. Beauty, because that's what she represents. Venus, Oshun, that's that's the mother, right? Inanna, Ishtar, Ishtarath, Ashtarath, that's Venus, Right. I'm sorry. Um, I, I said Taurus. I'm sorry. I think it's Aries. I apologize for that. Is it? Yeah, it's happening in Aries. It's happening in Aries. Say that again. I said sometimes I get my symbols mixed up. I think it's Aries. The, the um the eclipse is happening. So each each movement has a sign that it's in, but it happens, mm -hmm. you know, in so like, all right, um, the 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 new moon that we just moved out of, right? Mm -hmm. It was what was it? It was it was Pisces, wasn't it? It was a Pisces new moon in. Child, I gotta learn astrology. That's that's on my list of shit to do. It's to like learn the science, not just listen to other astrologers, but like learn the science. I can't remember. It was a Pisces new moon, but I don't I don't know how that go. Chad, we'll see. I'll mm -hmm. figure it out and tell y'all later. But um even still, um still that still holds. You said this was uh, this uh this eclipse tomorrow is in what did you say? Libra. Oh nice. Okay. Oh nice. Because Libra is about justice. Libra is the mother to Virgo, right? It's uh, yeah. So yeah, some things might be coming down the pike this week. Like somebody was telling me, somebody was telling me something this morning that happened. What did she say? Oh, yeah. I read so much every day. This woman sent me an email saying, oh. I don't remember just that fast. Okay, so I will do the dirty work. I will keep my eyes on the headlines, but y'all don't. I still say, um, pretty up. Be beautiful on purpose. Adorn yourselves. Even if you just go into the corner store, you know, adorn yourself. Make yourself beautiful. I'll dig in my ear. Um, and let me find out some more information about these eclipses and especially one on April 8th. I'm still trying to get out of the state. I'm still trying to go to Arkansas, but they price gouging on all the tickets for the cities that are in the line of totality, like crazy price gouging. I look for a round trip airline ticket and a rental car. I was like, fuck it, I'll just sleep in the car. I wanted to go where I did crystal quartz and um, get some more quartz up under the, the eclipse. $1,200. $1,200 for a round trip airline ticket to Arkansas and a rental car for three days. 
$1,200. So they price gouge on like hell. So we'll see. But um, just be deliberate over the next few weeks. I'll look for more details about which ways that we can be deliberate. But still the same thing. We're in a wood dragon year. Um, anything centered around the mother. Offerings to the mother. More time outdoors, especially in the wood element. Grass, trees, so on and so forth. But the woods element, the wood element's mother is the open water. It's the sea. It's the ocean. It's deep primordial water. So those are some things to start with. I'm going to make a calendar for this week of the lives that I'm going to do. They're mostly going to be morning, um, morning lives because I have got to work a lot of overtime this week to make up for the time that I took off from my injury and for the retreat. But I think I'm going to have to close this down. I'm exhausted now. I've been talking for four hours. There's a lot of really good com comments. Let's, let's see. Uh, Goddess Essence Energy says, I was just saying that to myself. Wow, what we have done to this earth body. That's why our bodies are in the spaces they're in. <clears throat> it's all encoded when we slow down and actually hear funny, hear how funny that correlative to the heart uh, is. Walking blueprints. Uh, I feel there are many mysteries about the mother that the son will never understand, even if we explain it. Why? So why can't the sons be reborn as daughters to truly understand our mystery? Um, again, um, I said in that in that live, the key is not explaining. The key is only experiencing. But explaining is necessary to teach. We still haven't, you still haven't created the spaces for them to experience. That's what it is. That's the mystery, right? And so we have to create that. I don't know what the answer is. I thought, I feel like what we did on the equinox is a beginning. I feel like the ceremony that we did to, to lay to rest the L's of this life and to deliberately be reborn in the body of the mother is a starting point. And what we did was we functioned, we split the group in half and we functioned as midwives to each other's birth. So the first four women went down, we buried them. This was their death ceremony. We buried them in the earth and we cared for them. If they needed water, if they needed snacks or whatever, we gave that to them. We functioned as their doula and midwives during the period that they um, were in utero, if you will. Right. And then when they were ready to be born, um, we helped to birth them and we wrapped them. I said, we, you know, I told the women, you have to treat them like babies. We wrapped them. We walked them over to the fire. We cared for them. They didn't do anything. Then we cleaned them off in the spring. There are hot springs on the property. We cleaned them off and rewrapped them and sat them by the fire. And after some time went by, then the guards switched hands. They became the midwives to those of us who buried them in their death ceremony in the first place. So we can teach men that. We can teach men what it means to be integratively a part of the birthing process. We can teach them that. I have a friend who um, told me the story. He, he and I worked at a spa together. He, was, he is a, uh, a massage therapist. And um, he was telling me that he was... Um, he was telling me that um, he was having, he, he and his partner were pregnant with his first child and how he wanted to play a, a really integral role in the whole process of their child being born. And so he was like, well, look it, I'm a massage therapist. I'm going to go become a certified doula. And so he went to several, he's in San Diego. He said he went to several locations trying to, you know, enter into these groups to become a doula for his, for his partner. And he said, and this guy is a total like hardcore rigid alpha male. Okay. Like he don't call it outside no land. You feel me? And so he was very, he was very angry because he said that the women were gatekeeping pregnancy and like, 
you know, the process. And all he wanted to do was be in a, a more effective partner to his to his partner while she was going through the birthing process. And he felt like him becoming a doula would be the best way for him to advocate for his partner. But he said he kept, he went to three different spaces that were, you know, all, they only allowed females to become doulas. He said, ironically, because he is not progressive, you guys, he is that, okay? So he said, ironically, the only space that would allow me to come and take their doula certification was a space that was primarily uh, LGBTQIA plus people. It was a doula program for LGBTQIA plus people. And here he is, here he is, this black nationalist, hardcore, not progressive at all being invited into this space by gender non-conforming people and the like um, to become a doula when he had been turned away by these other spaces to get his doula certification. That is a very clear example. And the way, when he, when we talked about it, the, the emotion that he had was rage. It was resentment. It was, he was really frustrated that there was no space for him in these spaces where women were, where he wanted to get access to this information to be a better partner to um, the woman that he is having a baby with. And again, there's two things that are true at the same time, can be true at the same time, especially without an explanation. These women in general, women do not trust men in spaces. They always trust that men have ulterior motives and all of this stuff. And so now, nah, Oh, you can't come up in here talking about being no doula. Like, what you want to be a doula for? What are you, a creep? Like, what's your angle? You feel me? And yeah, these are go to. He is demonstrating in real time what came to me in this in in this download that I got from the mother. That he was really frustrated, and that frustration turned to anger and resentment because. His only motive was to be able to advocate for his partner, to be a better to be a better partner during this process, especially as they had already been having some medical issues with her anyway. Right. And so that what is that going to do for him? Is that going to force him to kind of like hanker down on because he he is a cool guy, sweet, very well intentioned person, really, really, really big hearted, great therapist. He still has some very deep seated, uh, like like um, misogynistic beliefs. I've always been working with him over the years and he yields a little, you know, he's young, very young. He yields a little. He's like, oh, I never thought about it that way. I never thought about it that way. He's open to be malleable. Right. But what does an experience like this teach him? It, it makes him hunker down on any misogynistic tendencies that he has. Well, fuck them bitches. They wouldn't let me come do this thing that I wanted to do. And I, I, my partner is a woman who's having a baby. Like, why you got an attitude about me wanting to become a doula? Why I got to have ulterior motive? I just want to be a better partner to my boo. You feel me? So what? So you can see, even in this short story, how what she said last Saturday gets replayed in a lot of ways. Now, I'm not talking about entitlement. Because there are ways that males, because of this power dynamic that already is in place, attempt to force through entitlement. So being able to navigate these spaces and create new solutions that open up the space, that make men more able to hear and receive what might be a very valid solution to this condition that we all suffer from, which which opens up a way for women to be able to say, okay, I don't have to control everything. I can trust some men right now. And so in that trust, what will I allow them to do? How will I allow them to show up for me the way that I need? That's trust that, that does that, not force. Trust is what allows men to show up the way that we say we need them to show up. That's what it means to love as the mother. Trust, trust, trust. The baby fully is the expression of trust. She just trusts. That's the only emotion that they have. Mama's there. That's it. As long as mama's there, everything going to happen. All the needs are going to get met. Allowing men to show up in the same way. That's how they experience that love that we're talking about, where perfect trust exists. 
my in my estimation. I, I ain't saying now I'm the authority. I'm not. I'm just saying what was communicated to me and how can we how can we implement that in real time to begin to establish trust, at least in those spaces where men demonstrate that they want to be able to show up in the best possible, in the most um, integral and possible way for this, this mission that we're on. Too many males have contacted me. Too many males have contacted me and I had not yet created um, an idea or of a solution other than what I'm talking about when we're in space together, how to um, honor, how to honor each other's sovereignty, but it's deeper than that. It is how to, how to, well, the destructive rage that exists in males in, in general and how to get to the origin of where it comes from in the first place. How we as women, too, have work that we need to do with self and among each other. That doesn't mean that we don't have sacred spaces that are for women. We have sacred spaces that are for women. We have sacred spaces that are for males. We have sacred spaces that are peculiar to LGBTQIA people who have this very specific um, set of lived conditions. This is that's no different than support groups. You benefit from support groups by people that can empathize with your lived experience, right? So I'm not saying that. I'm saying, yes, those things are important, but it is also important for us to come together in real time to create the microcosm of the world that we say we want to make real at the same time. Yeah. And so in our day-to-day -day life, just seizing ownership of the moment, recognizing that all the power of the universe is in every moment. And we have a responsibility to be conscious creators of the future in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. That's all I got to say about that, child. Now I got to take a nap. This shit was deep. <laughs> <laughs> I still ain't read all y'all comments. This is, this is my back for your God video. I have somebody, I think my homegirl was saying there's an app or there's a way on this app where you can have people like moder moderate or like moderate for you or like read your comments and point out good ones to highlight or something. I might have to do that because this was Y'all was up in here. Y'all was like, bitch, you've been gone for a week. We got some shit to say. <laughs> <laughs> we are the mothers of our civilization, the carriers, uh, the mitochondrial blueprint. Yeah, nope, that doesn't demote that. It's just to say, how do we make it so that males can recognize this? This here is talking about the harmony, the harmony of the divine feminine and the sacred masculine. The harmony of the divine feminine and sacred masculine. What does that mean? The balance of the divine feminine and sacred masculine. It is, it is exactly what I'm talking about. It is, it is covering our signs. I used to say subdue. I think that is the language, you know, of like the dynasty with which this was I don't think subdue anymore. Anchor may be a good way to describe it. Some say anchor, some say subdue. But I say cover at the same time allowing to cover. You feel me? Like the, think about the yin and yang moving in and out of each other all the time, five dimensionally moving in and out of each other, making small. Because that's, that's what it does. That's what it looks like. It's the moving in and out. It's the ebbing and flowing. That's what the yin and yang looks like if you could see it as it exists, constantly moving, adjusting, shaping, right? Influencing, right? Um, that's, that's the only thing. I mean, that's all she said. She was like, look, they have to experience the love of the mother from the other direction. They experience it as, as, as infants. Can they experience it as adults to feel the difference in their bodies of what it means to mother the empathy, the love, the, the bigness of that love um, as the administrator? What does that mean? It means all the things that mothers do, the covering, protecting, nourishing, caring for, making laugh, making whole, making happy, always watchful, always protecting, always showing up for, always present, even while giving space to move about and to do, to be covered, to be protected, to be nurtured, to be supported, and not to do that in some top-down patriarchal father figure type way, to do it 
as the fully embodied, supporting, loving mother way. Doesn't it's not a charge against your masculinity. It's not. It's not calling you calling on you to be female like to administer mater, your mater, your ex half of what you are. Your maternal potential to love that way, to love that deeply, to love that embodied. No, you cannot give birth to humans, but you still carry a portal in your throat that is the the seed of your of your creative capacity. You still can you you can. I am convinced. A lot of people got mad. When um when I read that book by uh, Bell Hooks and she said that males have a have the uh, an equal capacity to uh, to experience and demonstrate love and a lot of women were like mm -mm, not biologically mm -mm, not biologically yeah they do I, I had an attitude with that too I was like no we just more so, we more biologically predisposed because we got to secure the progeny we got to make sure that the species continues. And so we experience this crazy love. And even Chinese medicine talks about the same thing, the bao mai, the uterine vessel that collects the uterus to the heart, to the this and to that, la, 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 right? Yeah, 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 I teach all of that. And yes, biology may play a, a role, but guess what? Mommy and I are one. They are born of our bodies. All the creative potential that we have, save one, they have. All the creative potential that we have, save one, they have creative potential, the empath empathetic potential to care, love, support, and nurture. But it is something that has been taken away from their conscious memory for 6,000 years with the rise of patriarchy that teaches them that love is synonymous with possession, power, dominance, the acquisition of territory. Right? And so I, yeah, I, I believe I believe that we are on the precipice of something extraordinary. The, the undoing of millennia's worth of mythologies teaching us that the sun always had to sneak about pretending to be female in order to get the mother's attention, in order to feel worthy of the secrets of the mother. Here she is. She didn't gave birth to me and then won't tell me nothing, but she going to tell my sister. She going to tell my sister everything, but don't tell me nothing. She don't share nothing with me. Well, I'm going to go create my own rituals. You got a period to come out your body, but let me go do something to myself so I can have ritual and I can have ceremony and I can be connect connected to the mother too. Since you're going to deny me access, then our, our daughters get mad because we done imposed motherhood on them as some right that we must go to to be fully women. We have a, we have a world to create now. And part of that, it's probably a story for another day, but I feel like we need to take five years. I think we, I think we need to make a pact among ourselves. We women, I think we need to pay, make a pact among ourselves for the next five years that no one, no one have a baby, no one gives birth. That's my position. I think that I think that we need to take a whole pause, a whole break. Yeah, I do. I think we all need to take to make an oath mm -hmm. to cease having babies until a world is created where our babies are not commodities. I think we need to I think we need to shut the motherfucking factory down. Yep, I think we need to pump the all the because as soon as motherfuckers like Elon Musk start talking about the, the crisis of population and how people aren't having enough babies, is bitch because he sees a future where his motherfucking cars can't get made by cheap labor who do not benefit from the fucking um from the um uh, from the from their labor. When motherfuckers. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos talk about the crisis of the human population and now people are not having enough babies. I say we need to pump the brakes on baby making. It's the power that we still have. It's the power that still enrages them so. It's the power that enrages them so. Because if we were disciplined about it and women, the globe over decided, yes, this resonates with my spirit. I ain't 
having no babies. Now, if I still have sex, that's fine. For whomever. Uh, but I will be the condom queen. I will put it in the spoon. I will do whatever it takes, but no, I ain't having no babies. Even if I want nothing more than to have a baby, I ain't having no babies. I am not creating a human to be born into a fucking machine where human beings with desires and dreams and a destiny have been turned into a serial number and a fucking commodity on the um, on the um, assembly line. I say we need five years of just a percentage of the population. 10% of the global population say, I ain't having no more motherfucking babies. <clears throat> Until y'all motherfuckers get it in y'all mind that we have to create a world where human beings have, a, have the right to thrive as soon as they are born. I ain't nobody having, ain't nobody having no babies. I have to go back and rewatch that movie, The Children of Men. I'm going to rewatch that today. That was Children a great movie. Man, that shit was off the chain, baby. That shit was off the chain. In so many ways, it's worth it's move it's worth a movie review. I need to rewatch it because it's been some years. But even my memory of it, how these how these megalomaniacs will literally watch the world turn to rubble and still live in high rises, completely divorced from the suffering of the world below. They will live in you know arm arm protected penthouses with art and classical music playing as if the world is well. Wow, there is literally chaos unfolding in the streets below. They will literally let it get to that. That was that was really that was really poignant for me. So much about it, but interesting how they never say what caused the global phenomenon of women no longer being able to conceive. That's what I say. I say we need to take a hold. We need women. That's what we still have control over. Whether you recognize or not, we still have control over that. Legislation or not, we still have control over that. We still have control over that. When I was a child, essentially, I was 22. I was poor. I was struggling and I didn't have nobody. And I got pregnant. And in my desperation, I went to Google and was like, alternatives for abortion. I think that's why I Google alternatives for abortion. And I was thinking it was going to bring up like adoption agencies or something like that. Right. That was what I was looking for. It was like, okay, well, if I have to have a baby, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just give it up for adoption. And the first thing that came up were a list of all the, the abortive fashions and how, you know, like what are the potential risk factors for these abortive fat? Do you know what abortive fashion is? I've never heard that term. An abortive fashion is any herb that causes spontaneous, um, spontaneous, mis what they call a spontaneous okay. miscarriage. Gotcha. So any herb, any plant that causes a miscarriage causes mm -hmm. abortion. It's called an abortive fashion. And it gave a list of all the abortive fashions from mild to strong um, and what the potential side effects are of those of those herbs. I didn't have a clue. I was 22 years old. I didn't know anything about any of that. I was looking for adoption agencies. And that was the first thing that came up. And I went home at 22 years old. I went to the local health food store and bought several of the herbs and made a very strong tea out of those herbs. I didn't know what the fuck was going to happen. I was a baby. I was 22 in Birmingham, Alabama by myself. And I was, I was far along. I was far enough along for it to be dangerous. I was over three months pregnant. And, um, and I drank that tea, not knowing what to expect. And a few hours later, I started having severe cramps. And a few hours after that, I passed the fetus at home. And after that, I went to the hospital because I wouldn't stop bleeding. And they did um, a DNC at the hospital. And that was that. First of all, no woman should be in that level of desperation to get the kind of health care that she needs that allows her to terminate a pregnancy safely. But I was desperate and I didn't have the money to I didn't have the money to go and get an abortion. 
And um, and at the time it was like three hundred dollars. So. But I was poor. I was really really poor. And um, but nobody should be a should have to suffer through something like that alone, and should not have to be put into a situation where they risk their health or their life to um, um, you know to end a pregnancy that they don't want. Um, first of all, it shouldn't get to that. They should have regular access to quality um, pre preventative care so that they don't have to. They don't have to even consider an abortion. It's a non-issue because, I, bitch, I ain't getting pregnant, right? Um, but I was always fearful of um, birth control because birth control is very toxic. I've never taken birth control. I took birth control pills for one week in my whole adult life. I took birth control pills for one week. And I was like, at 19 years old, I was like, mm, I mean, 20, I was 20 years old. I was like, uh-uh, this is wrong. Something's wrong. I didn't, I tr I've always trusted that little thing that nags on me. And I took them birth control pills for one week. I'll never forget it. Right after I had my daughter, because what do they call it? Planned Parenthood be treating you like shit. Well, your little black ass gonna be having too many babies. You need, you really need to be taking birth control. This is the counseling that I got after I had my daughter. This the, you need to be taking birth control or something. It's like I don't want to take birth control. Well, what are you gonna do to, for, to prevent getting pregnant again and again? This is my counseling, and um, they really make you feel like shit. And uh, I was like, well, I guess I'll take the pills then. So I took the birth control pills. And I took them for a week and something in me was just like, no, ma'am, this is no, don't do this. And that was the only time in my whole adult life I took any kind of internal contraception ever, ever. I, I became the condom queen. <laughs> Couldn't nobody come over to my house talking about they left the condom at home or no shit. That's all right. Pick your flavor. I got a whole drawer full, right? <laughs> got a variety pack. Huh? Got a variety pack. Baby. <laughs> no, what you need is what I got. You feel me? No, but that was that was that. After I after I um after I you know administered you know my own abortion it was so terrifying. It was really scary. Um, after I did that, that like I became neurotic. I was like a dude. I would carry. <laughs> I had condoms. <laughs> My car, I had condoms in my purse, bitch. I had condoms in my bedside table. Listen, no, not today. And um, and then I'm saying that because uh, I, I'm, I've really been sitting with this thing about women not having babies. I've really been sitting with it. Because what does the great cosmic mother say in the machine, in the chapter called The Machine, about babies? About um, the first labor is um, is a mother's labor and what that has been turned to instead of it being a magical ritual of life, it has become controlled by patriarchs for the bottom line. The listen, let's let's throw multiple wrenches up in the in the matrix or multiple wrenches up in the system and say, OK, well, we just ain't have no motherfucking babies. We ain't have no babies. For five years, we ain't having no babies. Nobody. None of us know where. We ain't having no babies. We ain't having no babies. <laughs> Child, she don't send a sock wave to this motherfucker like nothing we've ever seen. Well, that'll definitely hit the restart button. You know? You know? Stop telling your daughters that this is a natural part of what their duties are. To become women. No, it ain't. No, it's not. Your destiny is not to become a mother to a human. You understand? It may become, it may to become a mother to a new idea, to give birth to a new invention. <laughs> you understand? But there's 8 billion people on the planet. Stop telling your daughters that their destinies are tied to giving birth to another human. Stop doing that. Stop denying males access to these ceremonies of childbirth, the magic and the majesty of childbirth and the pregnancy process and being able to show up as an advocate for your partner or your sister or your mother or, or some woman that's just your friend. Stop 
teaching males and females that love is synonymous with possession, private ownership of human beings. Yeah. Anyway, I got to stop. God, woman. <laughs> it's, it's fun. But God. <laughs> hey, I still got so many comments by three through these telekinesis powers. Y'all went all over the place. Sounds like marriage. Um, so we must make it not taboo. Yeah, exactly. Who said that? Country kid things. Yes. Yes. End all taboos. God damn it. Yes. Mm hmm. Um, I remember my father. Wow. She said, I remember my father would get maxi pads for, for my mother my from my granny. She would wrap them in foil so he couldn't see them. Always saw that was weird. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, what it was it Zeus that imagined having a child of his own creation? Yes, and gave birth to Athena out of his head. Yes, that was Zeus. He gave birth to Athena out of his head because again, being born from your filthy ass mama is not sacred enough. You have to be reborn in the male mother, aka Jesus. Right. But uh, wasn't our secret sacred spaces created in part because biologically, naturally, men are not set up to understand them unless they're reborn as daughter, mother, to fully understand their mother? No, they don't have to be reborn. They're born. They're born. I think that the secret sacred spaces may, I, all I can do is, all I can do, I might need to take a fistful of mushrooms and go a little deeper on this on this question. But um all I can venture is that there is a less thanness, there is a secondariness that they experience, whether that was the intention of the mothers or not, that there is a secondariness, a less thanness that these males experienced collectively. So when it when they became when they came into the knowledge of how babies are actually made, when they became the husbands, the divine husbands over the domestication of animals, and they started to take the the sperm of one bovine or one, um, you know, goat or whatever to create the goats of their preference, right? They started to see the role that they actually played in the birthing process, and that emboldened them. That that broadened their ideas because all this time they've been told that their only role in the birth giving process or the life giving process was to open up the womb for spirit to embody the mother, to inhabit the mother, right? And that can change your perspective, especially if you feel less than, secondary, not as useful or whatever, right? So I don't know. I don't think, again, uh, this was LYM Sheik was saying, um, because biologically, naturally, men are not set up to understand them unless they are reborn as daughters. I don't know. Nah, I believe they exist in this life as male for a reason, and we have something to teach them. And the only the only way to teach is for them to uh, to be allowed to experience firsthand. Yes, they cannot give birth, but they can experience the love that comes from that. They can experience it. Trust is the factor. That's that's my that's what I'm feeling because I want males to show up for the mother. I've been saying that from day one. So there ain't nothing I'm telling y'all new, but not on some twisted gold digger. I want to be a kept housewife type weird shit because I'm opposed to that. Right. What I want is that same feeling of trust that comes from someone who recognizes that I need to be cared for in order to become my best self, like a mother does for her child. It is not some weird kind of top down, you know, force in either way relationship. Just like I mentioned with Einstein, his, his wife became his mother. That is not the way that relationship should have played out. That's how it's always been played out with men of genius, where we as women say, oh my God, this man is a genius. He's going to do so much. He's so amazing. He's so radical. That's always been my weakness is I've always been attracted to men who are geniuses. I love a brain. I love brilliance. I love it. It is my weakness 
because typically because everything in the world is made malignant because it exists in the world the way that it is genius accompanies narcissism typically in males so that's always been my experience i've always been attracted to brilliant men and every brilliant man that i've been in a relationship with has been a malignant narcissist so i get up i get caught up on their potential Oh my God, we, you know, his brilliance where I can be his lover and his student and teach him things that he doesn't know. We can change the fucking world. Blah, 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 blah. And it always ends up being something that's just really gross and exploitative, just like Einstein and his wife. She sacrificed all her genius to support his by becoming his mother, where if he had done what he needed to do to support nourish, pour into, uh, you know, surround, cover while she, while her genius was grown like a baby, like her, while her genius was grown and developed. Who's to say where we would be right now? We wouldn't be reading stories about how Einstein probably didn't write all these theories and come up with all these theories. He probably jacked half of them from his wife who was being exploited, reduced from physics genius top of her class to um, his housewife slash his, his um, what do you call it? His surrogate mother. You understand? And isn't that been all the relationships? That's what I was saying. We have been mothering our partners too long and can't figure out why we're exhausted. We don't need to mother them. They need to experience the love of the mother as giver, as supporter. When I say I want males to understand the necessity of them covering, surrounding, supporting fully. Yes, fully. Some woman did it for you for a long time, for 18 years. Covering, surrounding, supporting, pouring into the potential of who you are and can be in the world. You need to do that for women now. That's what I mean when I say they need to be able to experience the love of the mother as the giver, not the recipient. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. What this dude who owned this property did was the very tiny beginnings of that. He didn't question. He said, what you want to do, whatever it is, I trust you. You got the full reins of the land to do that. And however I can support that, I will. And didn't ask a question, didn't challenge a thing. Volunteered, offered. That's just the, the beginnings of what I'm talking about. Support what you see as the seed of, the, of a future. Once women are unleashed, cover it, protect it, support it, pour into it, and know that only good can come to you. Only good, only good, You can only be fed by what happens when you cover, surround, support, pour into, nourish, feed women. I ain't talking about, it's not, listen, hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about within the context of this shit that we're trying to build. Not talking, well, mm. <laughs> mm. you know what I'm saying. Those of us who are being purposeful in the direction of what it is we're trying to build in the world, because there's still, there's as many women who are on top of their shit who are trying to work out how and what role they need to play in the execution of this future. Are, there are equally just as many, if not more, women who are broken, who are downtrodden. And in that broken and downtroddenness, they are malignant. They are toxic. They are progenitors of terrible, terrible things. So I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the world needs to be healed. There are those of us who are conscious and aware and plotting and scheming about how that can happen. And then there are men who are looking genuinely interested in a, in a role that they can play in the, in the creation of this future. And I'm telling you, that's the future. That's what you can do. That's what you can do. We've tried everything else. You name it, we've tried it. We've tried everything else. Now the mother is saying, you need to experience love. You need to experience what it feels like to give love the way your mother gave love to you, the way she covered, protected, secured, poured into, fed, housed, clothed, 
rubbed on, gave unlimited love to, took care of every aspect of your being. And she knew she could only be made well when you were made well. And what happens? You know what I'm saying? These, these women are kept. They are, they in general, sometimes, whatever. Anyway, now I'm rambling. But anyway, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Yes, that is what it is. Yeah, okay. I think I've gotten through everybody's comments. Nope, not even close. <laughs> I'm going to have to read these later. Let's see. This is the longest I've done a live. Now, this ain't the longest we've been on, like, a Zoom. Like, I think I we hit our, our um, what you call it? The book we club? Our, what? What'd you say? The book club? Yeah. I think the longest we did was, like, six hours or some shit. That shit was crazy. It was good, but it was crazy. Spiral is the seed. Spiral is us being born in the womb. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I hope you can see it. In your mind's eye, cover the mother, cover the mother. Yes, cover the mother, baby. Yes. Let her relax so she can she can do what she do. <sighs> yeah, y'all had a lot of comments, massive hysteria. There's another movie y'all all need to watch. Um, I think you can watch it on Amazon Prime. You might be able to watch it on YouTube. It's called We're gonna do a, We're gonna do a study on this movie. We'll probably do a Zoom on this movie. It's called um, No Men Beyond This Point. No Men Beyond This Point. It is a very funny movie. Um, it is a very funny movie about um, this dystopian future where uh, it's kind of like um, picking up on kind of like where was it Children of Men? Is that what is that what the movie is called? Children of Men. Um, where in this future, the youngest person on earth, oh no, that's in Children of Men, the youngest person on earth just died, right? He was like 18. In this movie, The Land, uh, um, No Men Beyond This Point, um, it is this dystopian future shot like a documentary. So the way the movie is made, it's like it's a documentary interviewing all these people about this period in history where women stop giving birth to males. They were calling them the um, the epidemic of virgin births, right? Oh yeah, and I've seen this movie. That's say that wild. Again. I've seen this movie. It's wild. It's great. <laughs> it's about parthenogenesis, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But what's interesting is how, first of all, you know a man wrote the movie. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, a Canadian man wrote the movie, which explained a lot, by the way, which explained a lot. Once you go into it deep, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right? Because at first, I was like, either a white woman wrote this movie or a white man. I thought a white I was woman really leaning, I was really leaning towards a white woman, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I was too. But when I found out it was a white man, I was like, ah, yes, yeah, so much more makes sense. And so Because this is their worst nightmare. He wrote this movie because a, uh, you remember the, you remember, I don't know how old you are. You might, it might be before your time, but in the late 51. 80s, early 90s, say that again? 51. Oh, okay. You might know then. I would have never guessed. I would have thought you was like very young. I mean, not that you're old, but like, you know, like my daughter yeah. age young. You have a very young sounding that. voice. I get that a lot. It's wild. It might be because I'm a Capricorn because the older we get, the younger that we get. Younger. We I love get. that. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm aging backwards, girl. I'm a Capricorn moon. Oh, hey. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so in the late... 80s early 90s you know there was all this crossover in the music there were hip-hop artists doing tracks with like heavy metal groups and punk rock groups and all this, all this kind of overlapping in the culture right 
Well, um, Chuck D from Public Enemy did um, did like a cameo on um, on a Sonic Youth song. The, the name of the the name of the song was Wild Thing. I think was it Wild Thing? Shoot, what was the name of this one? Anyway, in in the um, in the the song. He has, you know, he has like a little cameo, a little rap cameo. And the whole thing was about fear of a female planet, fear of a female planet, fear of a female planet, right? It was supposed to be like this really edgy, you know, feminist anthem featuring Chuck D, right? Mm -hmm. When I watched um, this movie, uh, No Men Beyond This Point, this was years ago that I watched it when it came out. I showed it to my daughters, showed it to my stepson. Um. I was like, yeah, it makes sense that it's written by a white girl, a white guy because this is the fear, the fear of the reemergence of the matriarchy. But the problem was was the it was still from a very Eurocentric perspective of what this world would look like. What were some of the things do you know behaving the way males do respond like you know um <laughs> The scene where they decided that the only way that they could be safe while the few men were left to die out, child, was to put the men on reservations around the planet. <laughs> I said, oh, my God. Um, the radical guy from Australia who was like leading the movement. Right. Remember him? And uh, yeah, this this one is really worth a rewatch. Yeah, I'm gonna have to rewatch it. I am you know, because is I remember a that the do like a story. like a, a viewing party or something online. Yeah, we need to do a view, viewing party. That's that was it was hilarious and ridiculous in so many ways, but it so is the expression of the fears and the irrational beliefs that males have about what it means for women to become empowered not even to dominate, for women to become empowered, they automatically make it synonymous with some regression on their part or some some great loss on their part. And it was demonstrated all throughout that movie. The other thing was the movie was very racist. It was extremely yeah. racist. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting that in this, this happens a lot though, not just in this movie, in every dystopian movie about the possible terrible future, Mm -hmm. Like, there's never a black couple that survives together that, you know, maintains the possibility of black people going on in the future. Yeah. Name a dystopian movie and they all have like an interracial couple or the um, the androgynous asexual black woman in the sea of people that are couples in relationships, but she's by herself. Right. Or um, uh, it's just interesting how this plays out over and over in dystopian movies, how dystopian movies mean the end of the black race. And it's it's subtle the way they do that, but it's in there. This movie was not separate from that. This dystopian, you know, movie about um, about women taking over the world and shit and then tossing men on reservations <laughs> throughout the world. <laughs> it was interesting. There were only three women of color in the whole movie. <clears throat> you didn't see a single man of color, by the way. I didn't. You're right. There were no men of color. There were only three women of color. There was an Indian woman who was the intellectual explaining this process that occurred over this long period of time where women began slowly to become parthenogenic again. She was the one that they interviewed the most, right? Because she was the scientist. She was the intellectual. There was the um, the um, androgynous. They made her deliberately, purposefully androgynous woman who was the lesbian, who was um, an activist against the government because the government where the other um, um, woman of color was <clears throat> and the, the activist, the lesbian androgynous actor, uh, activist was 
uh, racially ambiguous. So she, you couldn't tell if she was like black or if she was mixed race or if she was mixed race, what she was mixed with. They deliberately made her racially ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And then the um, the other woman of color who was an obvious black woman was on the government. She was on the side of the government that was opposed to all sexual activity. Now that males are no longer needed to procreate, then it means there's no need for sex. And so the government had this whole campaign telling young girls, when you get that funny feeling, ignore the feeling, ignore the feeling, right? So the three women of color in this whole movie, one was the intellectual, where sexuality was not a part of her intellectual um, understanding of how this came to be. What was the trigger to parthenogenesis in the first place? Mm -hmm. Was it a breakdown in human sexuality and sexual relationships, at least those re sexual relationships that are responsible for procreation? Uh, there was no sexual analysis on her part. She was purely there for the intellectual understanding of what happened as a consequence of parthenogenesis, right? right. Um, then the other one who is the deliberately androgynous, I mean, she wears a suit and tie, androgynous um, sexual activist who is saying that, yes, even though we spontaneously procreate now, we still need human affection and connection. And sometimes that involves human sexuality. And women should be thinking about not only partnering with our best friend to, uh, to co-raise our babies, but we should be actively encouraging human sexuality in the female population. But they deliberately made her masculinely presenting androgynous. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. that, wasn't, that, wasn't, that, wasn't, that wasn't subtle. And that was very deliberate. She's the only one talking about human sexuality as a necessity, despite however human relationships or human dynamics change, right? <clears throat> and then the other was the opposite extreme, was this Black woman who was very rigid, almost like pious, right? In the government that's making the laws, telling young girls to ignore the feeling and avoid sex. These are the only women of color. While all white women are living dynamic lives, navigating how to co-parent girl children, because you, you know, as a parthenogenic procreator, you can only produce clones, right? So mm -hmm. girl children and re revisioning the rituals around, you know, your first menstruation and the expectation that soon after you would get pregnant and seeing all these girls in high school and middle school who are walking around pregnant and it's no longer a stigma. It's a rites of passage. Very interesting, this movie. Yeah, we should read. We should revisit that one. And break it down. Break it right. down. Because it was it was funny. That that was the takeaway was it was written to be, you know, a comedic. A dark know, comedy. Possible, yeah. Of this possible future especially from the male perspective, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, like even the little girl was so rude to the old men. She was like <laughs> laughing like dinosaurs. You guys aren't supposed to be in more than groups of twos, right? Right. It was, it was really <laughs> interesting. It's the same way white people think about people of color, that if we have power, we're going to do to them what they've done to us, right? Yeah. So that narrative is in there too. If women have power, they're going to do to us what we did to them, right? type of thing. Anyway. Yeah. It was very fascinating. There are a lot of those little movies, though. Lithia. Um, that you have to watch on Amazon Prime. Lithia was old school, though. It came out in the 90s. And uh, <clears throat> it was more about, like, I don't even think this is going to save, child. This is so long. I only had so much time left on my stream. Um, I got so much shit. I got to break down. Anybody want to help me um, edit some videos? <laughs> I'll send them to you. Anyway. Um, yeah. Lithia is another one you should watch. It's L-I-T-H-I-A. Lithia on Amazon Prime. But it, was, it was a part of a series. It was called um, Outer Limits. It was an Outer Limits series called Lithia. Yeah. I'm going to close this down. I know y'all could stay with me as long as I'm talking. I appreciate that. It's flattering. It is. But now I have to go make some money and bask in the sun, 
will make some offerings to the water. Heavy, heavy, yeah, 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 yeah. This was good. I'm glad you I, I'm glad you joined me on the call, sis. Well, Girl, thank you for good. having me come up here. You know, when I when I watched your video yesterday and then you sent me the the email about today's stream, I was like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna be on there. And then I couldn't sleep all night long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be on there. I'm gonna talk today. <laughs> Today's okay. the day. I'm gonna get the time. Yeah, y'all, y'all are killing me, girl. I'm still, I'm still reading comments. And she says, uh, "Lym Sheik says I'm. I guess I'm still confused because it sounded like we need to release control and yield to the son to discover how to become, uh, how he can become the mother at our expense. That is not even going anywhere close to what I'm saying. I'm no, no, no." I am saying multiple things can be true at the same time. There are few among us who can males who can receive and understand the essence of this message and show up accordingly. Me talking about how this man showed up for us in the desert is a very small version of what I am talking about, not at our expense to our benefit, not at our expense to our benefit we create the we create the program if you're going to if somebody is going to be a mentee you create the mentorship you create the program you say these these are the parameters these are the this this is what the program looks like this is what it means to execute it this is what it looks like in real time and can you comply can you comply? Not to our expense. We still set the terms and see if men can meet the bar. And then if they can't meet the bar, then we can assess and say, offer them the opportunity. Those that we know right now in our circles, there's a male on the founding committee of the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence. This is a goddess worshiping temple centering the uterus, the uterus as the temple of the original temple of evolutionary emergence. That is not some shit I came to lighthearted. I recognize this African, not by what he say out his mouth, by our relationship. I've known this man since 2003, by how he interacts with the women around him, organizationally, the women that he's raising and these daughters that he has, the relationship with his mother, his sisters, how he shows up for women he does not know to say, okay, and to, and to even see how his ideology has been transformed by the works that's transformed us. I say, okay, well, you know, we going to need male representatives of the mother. You on board with being on the founding committee of this organization. He's like, damn straight. Tell me what I need to do. So there are males that we know that even if they aren't all the way there yet can be taught this language that is being a, this. She is attempting to communicate to everyone. You know what I'm saying? So no, sis, I'm not talking about, I guess I'm still confused because it sounded like we need to release control. Yet that's the trust. The releasing of control is the trust. To give direction does not infer control. To be able to lead and still yield is not synonymous with control. So yes, I meant what I said. To release control, to yield to the sun, to allow him for the first time in a millennia to experience what we say is naturally occurring to in us, that he being a part of us has the ability to experience too. We have to be the mentor while still relinquishing control, trusting that once, once we give direction, once we give a clear vision of how he can become one with the mother, how he can reunite with the mother by experiencing the love of the mother from the other side. And then trust, just like the mentor does with the mentee. I taught you everything you, know, you need to know. Now it's time for you to execute in the real world that which I have taught you. And I let go to watch you do that. Did you do how you were trained to do, how you were taught to do? Did you execute with this information that you have now being asked to implement it in the real world? How did you do? Did you comply? Did you follow the directions? Did you follow your teachings? Did it change you in the process? 
That's all we can do. I'm not saying make ourselves vulnerable. I'm not saying that. I'm not. I'm saying release control and let, we have to teach, but teaching is not enough. It is, what am I always saying? It is the deliberate application of that which we learn in the real world. Discernible action is what transforms knowledge to wisdom. We have to allow them to do that. And they may fail sometimes, or they may not get a good grade on the test. But we have to, the, the, the teacher has to say, okay, now I'm letting go of the reins. I done taught you everything I know. I done demonstrated. I done showed you. I done let you in these spaces. You understand? Now it is time to act out that which you have learned. I'm not saying at our expense. I'm not saying that. That's why I see it. I still tell women in real time, every single woman should learn self-defense and how to use a gun. My daughter was eight when I enrolled her in the gun club and mixed martial arts. I'm deadly serious. Everybody that has babies should be enrolling their babies. I'm already having that conversation with my daughter. Her, ki her kids are four and six. And I've been having that conversation with her for two years. They need to be in some type of baby self-defense classes. Yes, they're not going to overcome an aggressor, but they can free up time, enough time for them to scream, enough time for them. To, you know. I'm deadly serious about that. I recognize the world we live in. I'm not, I told you, I don't, I'm not into flowery, frou-frou shit. We create the future while still do, while still doing the things that we have to do to survive in this world that exists right now, visualizing the future in every moment. So yes, get pieced up. I have a machete that I keep sharpened. I'm not joking. I have a machete that I keep sharpened and keep close by. Mm -hmm. You can't get licensed. Well, you can get licensed to carry, but it's a whole rigmar rigmarole in California, right? Um, I have taken many self-defense classes, survivalism classes. Yes. So do what you have to do, but we still, we have, all we can do is offer what we see as a solution. All they can do is take it or reject it. But we can't keep running around in circles. No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. Women ain't shit. No, men ain't shit. No, women ain't shit. No, women. We, we ain't winning nothing like this, man. We are not solving a fucking problem. There ain't no amount of debates between men and women that are going to change this shit. None. Absolutely none. And I have watched them all. I can't. I don't do that shit no more. <laughs> that shit is exhausting. Yeah, it's getting exhausting now, but I've been <clears throat> A, a it's demoralizing. Part it's years. gross. Yeah, mm -hmm. just trying to understand, like, what is this gender war thing? Like, what is this? What is at the root? What's the cause? Where is this coming from? And why I know where it's is it? From. Well, I, this is what I was, you know, trying to figure out while I was watching all of these podcasts and, you know, just trying to get it, trying to understand. And it is very exhausting. And there is no middle ground. Mm -hmm. There is no. There, there's mm -hmm. no meeting of the minds. There's no like, okay, mm -mm. yeah, we we get it now. There's that has mm -mm. not happened, and mm -mm. I don't see that happening. Mm -mm. And you know why? Because my position is still is still unchanged. Yes, we can talk about the thing that we're talking about. You know, like the mother speaking to us, whispering to us, go deeper, go deeper. Just when you think you've had an epiphany, go deeper. Just when you think you've had a breakthrough. Go deeper. Don't, she has been saying, telling me that for eight years. Go deeper. Yes, that's a breakthrough. That's a monumental point that you needed to understand. Now go deeper. Go deeper. Go deeper. Just when you think you've had a breakthrough, bitch, there's more. Go deeper. Right? So the noise that we're hearing that is articulating itself as these gender wars, especially among, um, among black and brown people, um, but not exclusively in the manosphere and all of this. Aldous. Now you have me tell it 20 years from now, just like they did with the black power movement, they going to um, open up these, these papers that were previously classified documents and show how this shit was police shit. This shit is the state. This shit is police shit. I'm telling you 90, 99.9% .9 of all this bullshit you see, this so-called gender wars is the desperate. 
If the ops. Hell yeah. It's the desperate attempts of, a, I'm telling you, a dying, wounded beast trying to salvage life. And the best way to do that is to pit men and women against each other. Doesn't mean that men don't fall in line because they have historically. Anything that gives them some sense of power in a world that, off, that, that, that where they're powerless, black men, mm-hmm. brown men, in a world where they're powerless, anything that gives them any feeling or sense of power, they latch onto that shit. So the manosphere makes sense. Patriarchy makes sense to them. Yeah. Because even though I ain't shit out in the world, in the white man's world, at least I can dominate my woman. At least I can dominate my wife. At least I can own my children. At least I can dominate my daughters. You feel me? Yeah. So it's an, it's a, it's an, it's what she said in the great cosmic mother early on was the easiest thing for the Romans to do is to come into these Nordic regions where men and women had equal footing and, you know, they fought side by side and tribal conflicts and shit. And all of a sudden the Romans come in and was like, who the fuck's let, let they women fight in wars? You motherfuckers is panties. Y'all weak and shit. You feel me? And the men were like, damn, maybe they got a point. Like, maybe we is panties and shit. Meanwhile, the Romans having sex with boys, but they gonna come into somebody else's shit talking about y'all panties because y'all let y'all women fight side, fight side by side with y'all. And guess what? They appealed to that little noise inside of them. Maybe we is weak. You know what I'm saying? Maybe we is punks. Feel me? Cause we y'all women big as we is, and you like wheel swords like we do and shit. You feel me? And it's it's been an age old weapon that they have always been able to use, baby. Always. Now we need you to be men for the mother. <laughs> God damn it! Now we need you to be warriors for the mother. Now you did this shit, and it ain't one you shit. Y'all motherfuckers been fighting for the Roman Empire for goddamn two thousand years, and it ain't one you a motherfucking thing. Nothing. You ain't no better off than you was 2,000 years ago, child. (laughs) Now, all that energy you got, all that angst you got that you got to get out, you feel me? Turn that shit on the system that dominates the whole planet so we can overturn this shit. You want to be gladiators, bitch? Be gladiators for the mother. You want to be warriors? You understand? You want to be skilled warriors? Do that shit on behalf of the mother. And then get the rewards for that. Because she's got rewards. And I ain't talking about women's bodies or no shit like that. I'm talking about rewards for these actions. She's rewarded me for compliance. Say this shit shit out your mouth you don't want to say and everybody going to give you shit for it. Everybody going to grind your ass up for it. (laughs) Because on the surface it's going to seem contrary to everything you've ever said. But multiple things can be true at the same time. Men have debts to pay. Yes, they do. Uh huh. Men have reparations to pay. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. White people got debts to pay. Yes, they do. Absolution is not in her lexicon. Mm -mm, Ain't no absolution. What is it? Equal and opposite reaction for every action. So, Multiple things can be true at the same time. She said, but baby, even while you're even while you're saying, okay, this is what justice looks like, you talking about, oh my God. You talking about this lunar eclipse. Oh my God. You talking about this lunar eclipse tomorrow is in Libra. And <clears throat> here I got, y'all ain't seen the rest of my apartment. Okay, so I'm a Virgo. So you know, the Virgo is always pictured holding a sheath of wheat and the scales of justice in her hands, right? The scales of justice is a nod to her mother who is Libra. The goddess of justice. Who is Libra? You see this big ass uh, print on my wall of my eye? Y'all see that long? Y'all see that? You see it, sis? Frida Kahlo? Um, You see this big old... My arm is hurting. Hold on. You see this big old print over here of my eye? Oh, my eye. Long? Yes, I see it. Now. Yeah, yeah. It's about six feet long, but five feet long. Okay. Of my mm-hmm. eye, right? Who is my eye? The holder of the scales of justice, right? I'm a Virgo. Libra is my mother. My eye is in my living room. And then I showed y'all the picture not too long ago. My homegirl put me in a mural. Didn't tell me she was putting me in a mural. And she said, this was on this was on the day that Oya entered into her first Pluto returns. It was on February, it was on Feb 2, 
20, 2022. She called me in the morning. She was like, yo, um, what you doing today? I was like, I got a ton of plans because it's all y'all's all y'all back on the scene. Today is a big day. I've got scare, ceremony, praying, blah, 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 blah. She was like, you got time this morning. I want you to see some. So I took a ride. She was like, I'm, they're doing, a, I did a mural and they're doing an unveiling today. I would really love for you to be there for me. I was like, awesome. Yes, I'm so excited. Yay. She didn't tell me she was going to put me in the mirror, y'all. I drove all the way out there. They do. It was big. Like there was media everywhere and the, the president of the school and the, you know, the chair of LAUSD was out there. It was a big deal. They did the unveiling of this big, the whole front wall of the school it was a massive mural. And girl, she has me. The name of the mural is a better uh, a better world is possible. That's the name of the mural. And on the mural, she has an indigenous woman who is like the mother god, blowing out of her mouth the winds of change. The winds of change. Right? She's big, blowing out the winds of change. And below, there are hundreds of people of all complexions holding picket signs. But the picket signs all say a better world is possible. The future is near. Blah, blah. It's all like affirmative messages on these picket signs. And below the picket signs, not as big as the woman blowing the winds of change, but below is me as Lady Justice, Lady Liberty, holding the scales of justice. That's what I saw when I went out there this mo that morning on February 20th, 2022, the day that Oya made her transition um, back to where she was 248 years wow. ago. Wow. You couldn't even deny it if you tried. I, I called her. I said, do you know my birthday? She was like, no. I said, do you know my sign? She was like, no. I said, so it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't like something that you went in deliberately when you made me the lady, when you made me Lady Liberty holding the scales of justice, she was like, you know, I was, I really wanted somebody that I felt like represented, you know, the work and like, you know, like revolutionary movement. And I was like, yeah, Iapo. I was Iapo at the time. Yeah, Iapo. Yes. She said, I was thinking about a lot of sisters that I know. And I was like, yes, Iapo. She said, girl, I found a picture on your Facebook page and use that. She didn't know I was a Virgo. She didn't know the story of Libra being the mother to Virgo, the holder of the scales of justice. Who is the holder of the scales of justice? My eye. Who else is the holder of the scales of justice? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, I'm telling you, that's how spirit speaks to me. She is loud and butt naked in, in your face. Like, there ain't no mistaking what's happening in this moment. Right? Mm -hmm. And, um... Um, and so tomorrow is this this lunar eclipse in Libra. What were we just talking about? The lunar eclipse in Libra. What were we saying just before that? You said something. Oh, fuck. It was, um, oh, it was important. Damn. Mm. Oh, 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 it was, um, you know what else has occurred to me? What else is important about my aunt? Do you yes. know the story of my aunt? Yeah, if I remember correctly, she's the uh, Egyptian deity who weighs the soul or the heart of people who passed away. And if your heart or soul is, um, if the weight of it is greater than the feather, then you have to recycle back into reincarnation. You have to be reincarnated. And mm -hmm. if it is lighter than the feather, then you get to go into what you heaven? Get to transcend. Transcend. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So all of us, it goes back to this thing about the heart here, right? The heart being burdened, the heart being heavy, the heart being what we call in Chinese medicine harassed. That's a that's a um, that's an actual diagnosis. Um, um, heat harassing the heart, right? And um, the scales of justice, the heart, 
And what there was some, oh, there was a point I wanted to make. Damn. But anyway, on the eve of this, uh, we're talking about the scales of justice. We're talking about like males. Uh, she said something about um, the mother at our expense. No, we still have to be the administrators. This is calling on women to be them full, their full selves. There was something I read earlier about how patriarchy was okay in the great cosmic mother. And it said patriarchy is okay with the, um, what did it say? You remember that? It said patriarchy is okay with, um, okay. It says under patriarchy, all life is dualized and women are dichotomized, cut into two. There is the good little ovulating wife who is supposed to be passive and not very sexual, right? And then there, it's um, it's hard for women to feel sexy while she's cleaning a toilet bowl. And then there's the witch, the sex fiend, whore, scarlet woman, right? The bleeding woman, the dynamic menstrual bleeding woman, right? Who is forceful and dynamic and active and aggressive, right? And so- um, Well, that is Virgo. Right, Virgo is both the virgin and the whore. Yes, exactly, exactly. But what I was going exactly, but what I was going to say about that is, um, the, in the dichotomization of the female, what is the resolution to that? Is wholeness. That's what I've been saying all along. Is wholeness in the female experienced in the female and experienced in the male? Right? Is wholeness, and um, and so. Oh, God. Um, and so what in the dichotomization of the female, it will, it limits wholeness because the dichotomization creates the opportunity to disempower, right? You're either, or, and no, and in no way are you empowered. You're either ovulating housewife, right? Or you are the wildly woman who everybody calls crazy because she's a sex fiend or whatever, Right. And what the mother is calling for is how do you become whole? How do you how do you become comfortable with all aspects of your presentation as a female? Is it in is it in direct forceful opposition with the male? Is that how that happens? Males make up uh, almost half the population, just a little less. Than half the population between you know infants all the way up to, to elderly, right? It is it to experience wholeness in direct forceful opposition to males to half the population of the planet, right? Um, or is it to harmonize the dualities? They're not antagonistic dualities, they're not supposed to be antagonistic dualities between the yin and the yang. They're mutually antagonistic, meaning they exist as separate entities within the whole. Because the yin and yang, most people don't know, is also a representation of the cosmic egg. It is a, a different way to tell the same story of all the potentialities that exist in the cosmic egg, right? Um, the Mashika people have a version of it. I forget the name of it. It's um, um, uh, Hanu, uh, Hunabku. Hunapku is a is a Mashika Mayan version of the same story, right? Hunapku. I think I, I think I said that right, right? It is a representation of the same thing that I talked about. The moment, all potentialities existing in that moment, right? And so, with the the female being able to be experience the seven phases of the moon. Right. That's what that's what the seven phases are about is how we we are a direct uh, replica of the phases of the moon. Our big, round, bright, white self, the ovulating self and the dark moon representing the other pole of that, which is our dark, radical, mysterious self which is the menstruating self and all of her expressions in between. Every goddess on earth and in history is a representation of this relationship that we have with the moon, that we have with the earth cyclically and how to win males back into cyclical resonance with the earth and all of her inhabitants. They've been severed. 
They are the outcast child burning the shit, raising the shit to the ground. How to bring them back into cyclical harmony with the rest of the environment. We have a role to play in that. We have a teaching role to play in that. And we have a role to play in, in yielding them enough trust to, to win them back. I'm not saying make ourselves wide open and leave ourselves bare. That's not what the fuck I'm saying at all. I'm saying set the terms, state the standard, state the will, and see who will comply. And once a few comply, this is science, once a few, there'll be one that complies and he'll be the oddball out and everybody around him call him a simp or a punk or a sellout or whatever, whatever. And then there'll be three that will comply. Like, damn, that kind of makes sense. You know, I have been feeling real lonely, even in my marriage. I love my wife, but why I feel lonely? Why I feel desperate, even though I'm married, even though I got kids, why I feel desperate? Because our marriage does not answer the question. Our interpersonal relationships within this madness does not answer our questions. It, there's still a lack, what, what, it, uh, what did Morpheus call it? A splinter in our mind, constantly nagging away. Mm -hmm. It's a question, unanswered. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That no matter what we do, no matter how much wealth we acquire, we're still on medications. No matter what we do, no matter how many vacations we go on, we still have this nagging feeling of incompletion. No matter what, no matter how good our boo is to us, we are still seeking and searching something that we cannot articulate. Right? And so, yeah, for women, we have to say, that's why I say, remember I said a while back, men's response, it hasn't changed. Men's responsibility is to support, defend, pour into the spaces that women create. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. The way we see ourselves in that relationship is what's changed. Not as top-down directors of males, but as the yielders of trust in community with human beings that take a sacred oath to say, I want to make right my relationship with the mother and this is how I must administer that. It is to learn the love of the mother. To learn the love of the mother is to experience being the giver of mother's love, not just the recipient, the giver of mother's love. How can I do that? By complying to my mother's will and covering her daughters, supporting her daughters, pouring into her daughters, corralling around her daughters while they receive the rest and support that they need to change the world completely while we nurture them as the baby being born, reborn the dragon, reborn the primordial mother. We cover the space. We protect the space. We build the space. We pour into the space. We secure the space. This is what it means. We make sure they are fed. We make sure they are cared for. We make sure that they have everything that they need so that they can be reborn. Yeah, no, I ain't talking about nothing crazy. I ain't talking about nobody, none of us getting laid bare, taken advantage of, none of that. We still lead. We still lead from the center. This is our collective destiny as women. That's my personal position. Our collective destiny as women is to be the mother reborn. That does not require us to be mothers, to have given birth to human beings. It doesn't. But all the radical, wild, boundless potential of the portal that we carry in our bodies to give to to give birth to the new age. That's what she told me in ceremony. That's what she told me the first time I did ayahuasca. She said, yes, I meant that literally. Y'all are going to give birth to the new age. Be ready. Yes, I meant literally. Yes, y'all are going to give birth to the new age. Be ready. Yep to be the mother and the child at the same time. To what did, what about what are our um to to create now the future that we will be born into. In our tarot deck, the medicine woman guidebook, the woman medicine woman inner guidebook. She said that's our responsibility right now is to teach 
that all can be transformed. To give hope where no hope exists. To speak beauty in spaces where beauty does not currently exist. To change the laws that create human suffering. That's in our inner woman guidebook where I read y'all tarot from. To change the laws that contribute to human suffering. To speak life into the young, knowing that they have the hope, they have the vision, they have the enthusiasm to create the world that you speak into them. That is us as the mothers becoming the children of the world that we will be reborn into. Do we create a world where we have recreated all the ails of the past or do we purposefully, consciously, willfully and deliberately execute something so radical that, that it will sweep through people's hearts and consciousness? I'm telling you instantly because we're in an ear sign age that guarantees itself. So me talking about AI liberating us from human from human labor, I am certain that that is what these motherfuckers are fighting against. They see the writing on the wall, even if we don't, because they need blood, they need tears, they need grief, they need our emotions. That they aren't just thriving off our labor in general; they are thriving off the power of our emotions. Yeah, our energy. Yeah. Yes, and so that's why us deciding consciously not to have children, to channel that energy into creating, giving birth to the world, that is some scary shit for them. That's why making a call for a million women in the United States to make a commitment for one year to collect all their moon blood and every month offer their moon blood back to some water source or some tree and see if we can actually heal the damage done to the actual physical planet with them stem cells that's run amok and unused up in our menstrual blood. Can we do that? Can we have women and men and others execute a ceremony like the one we just executed in this desert? And I invited everybody. The only women that the only people that heard the call were women. But I invited everybody. I was like, you know what? After that download, as a matter of fact, because I was like, yeah, it's just going to be a goddess retreat out in the desert. La, la, la. After I got that download, the next day, I spent six hours emailing, texting individual male human beings that I know, not gender conforming LGBTQIA people that I know, to say, look, I know it's short notice and I know it's radical. I know that you guys only know me in one way or another, but this is what I want to execute. This is what I want to offer as an opportunity. You can choose how you participate. If you are participating strictly as an equinox ceremony, it's still a great ceremony to go to, through to plant your new intentions for the next year, blah, 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 blah. But if you want to eventually see yourself aligned with as a, a participant in the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence, this is what we're about. This is what we're trying to build. Then you can see this as the initiate what will be the initiation process that everyone goes through to become a certain level or type of member in the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence. That ceremony will only happen once a year, right? Um, so you can choose all throughout the process. I kept saying, this is what I have created. But you being a sovereign being and me honoring your sovereignty in this space, me honoring your sovereignty in this space, um, you being a sovereign being and me honoring your sovereignty in the space, you create the ceremony that you want to create for yourself. If at any juncture in any part of the ceremony you are not comfortable with, you bring it to my attention and I will walk you out of ceremony. You can set the terms. That's what it means to be sovereign. That's what it means to be sovereign. This is what I am executing. And if at any time you want to change it for yourself, what resonates with you is for you. What does not resonate with you, you do not have to put yourself through. And what religion you know telling you that? I ain't found one yet. You understand? Because sovereignty is the religion of the new age. God damn it. Individual sovereignty that honors individual destinies of every incarnate on earth. That's the, that's, the, that's the religion of the new age. God damn it. There ain't going to be no need for national sovereignty if every inhabitant on earth is guaranteed sovereignty by the collective. 
And that's something that we've never seen. And I think that's one of the, the main reason why I kept asking the question, what does it look like? Is because we've never seen it. And the idea of individual sovereignty, oh, I'm, I'm down. I'm down for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you said it. What am I always saying about why we need artists? Why this movement has to be shaped and molded by artists of all kinds? Just what you said. We haven't seen it, so we cannot imagine it. In my mind, it's crystal goddamn clear. Crystal clear. How the houses look, how the neighborhoods look, how the communities look, how the world looks, how the, how the animals feel, how their behavior changes is crystal clear for me. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I artists, know, now right. artists need to create it in mass so that I'm not the only one that can see it that clear. Everyone can see it. Because what am I always saying? People cannot create what they cannot imagine. They cannot create what they cannot see in their mind's eye. We have to give them the vision. And we have to create that together. It's not just my vision. We have to create that together. Everybody has something in their life, whether it's through their culture or their traditions or their upbringing or where they live in the world that is peculiar to their experience that I would never be able to understand. They need to bring to this idea. We need to grow this idea based on the lived experiences of others to say, this is what I would like to see happen or contributed to this world. This is the things that are peculiar in my area that I want to see done away with, buried and the ails of history, never to reemerge. This is the world that I want to see for me and mine over here, and how it contributes to this vision that you're trying to that you're trying to um, to grow, right? So, still honoring human beings where they are with their lived experiences and how their lived experiences can uh, inform what they don't want to recreate in the future. Go ahead. You were going to say something. Um, I think I forgot. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, please don't. I know it's a lot. This is great, though. Let's see, because a lot of us are just beginning to understand what the hell has been going on with us in the first place. That I understand. Yes, sis. L Y M Chic. I understand. I think it's because we are just hoping to hold this, the space a little longer just to just exclusively us. That I get too. So I am not um, everything, everything and everyone else can be introduced later in small doses. <laughs> I yeah, get it. The idea of giving up our feminine space, because we have feminine spaces, again, as a reaction to patriarchy. So the idea what? of what giving I'm saying. up your, your I am space not is saying giving up feminine spaces. Well, let me, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. What but I'm you're saying, not the only one saying that, because that, right. that was just what these women were saying. That's <laughs> well, not well, what that's I'm saying. What, but that's what, because when we say, and I'm, when we say, we you have to do, right? That hits this programming that says, me doing for humanity, for men, or whatever. That means I have to give up myself. I have to give up something. I have to lose something. So what is it? What is it that you're giving up? What is it that you're losing? Sovereignty. How? Okay, in a relationship, right? We're I'm told listening. that we're told that there's roles, right? We're what? And there, there's roles in 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 romantic relationships. I'm just going to use that as an example, right? Okay. So, if you're going to be in a relationship as a woman with the man you have to give so much of yourself and you don't get to even know who you are fully because of the relationship, right? But what I hear you saying is that this new world that we're going into, even if you're in relationship, you can still be fully and authentically who you are. And that's something that we don't know. We haven't seen. We don't we don't even know how to walk down that road. We can't even find that yellow brick road yet, right? But so so right now in these our our spaces that we're coveting, right? The ones that we're not allowing men into, right? Because of because we need to feel 
protected from the patriarchal world. And it seems as if we're going into a world where that is no longer necessary. And the idea of letting that go is scary because it's been our safe space for so long. Okay. So I hear the essence of what you're saying. And I can understand what these other women are saying. I think for me, I think for any woman, it, do you have children? I do not. Okay. I've never been pregnant. Okay. For any woman that has had a male child, right? I feel like I haven't had a male son myself, but I carried my grandson in my belly. You feel me? When I was pregnant with my baby. For And that doesn't matter as much because... I love him. I've held him in my arms. I I feel him, even though he's 3,000 miles away, right? And the same love that we give to our daughters, I'm talking about in the space of time, zero to two, the same love that we give to our daughters is the same love that we give to our male children, right? Deep, profound, protective, covering love. And in that space of time that we all mostly experience, I know the world is messed up. I feel like what you're expressing is a legitimate concern. I am not saying that we have to be a genderless society. I am not saying that the future that I am envisioning is one where the only way we can we can respect each other's sovereignty is to be a genderless society. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that those things, that the mothers, not just in us, gender exists in every creature on earth. There is something there that she saw fit to make happen, to create, to develop. So I don't think that we all, like, you know, there was um, one of the many dystopian movies. Uh, it was called uh, Divergent. You remember that movie? Yes. And in these dystopian movies that are supposed to be fronting as utopian societies that have figured out how humans can interact with one another, what is the thing that's always kind of a, a theme among them all? Where it's a it's a it's a dystopian movie, but it's actually fronting as a utopian society, but underneath there's something insidious happening, right? What is There's it, always what is a it? hierarchy. Say that again? There's always a hierarchy. Simpler than that. Okay. To me, it's it's it might even seem subtle to the on, but think about all these kind of movies like just divergent. What was the other one? Um with the with the mocking jay. What was that? Hunger Games. Hunger Games, right? It seems subtle, but it's obvious for a reason. It's how they dress. That the only way to respect a person's sovereignty is to remove these these things outside of us that distinguish us or give mm -hmm. us flair. So all these utopian, dystopian movies, everybody wears the exact same color. Everybody wears the exact same outfit. Or in Divergent, you had the five groups, right? Yeah. They, but each group wore all the same clothes and they different they only differed slightly based on which group you were in. They still look like sackcloths. You mm -hmm. feel me? Right. <laughs> but dystopian futures are somehow synonymous with an, a, a lack of fashion. <laughs> and we just forget all sense of fashion because fashion <laughs> is how you distinguish yourself. And then that creates hierarchies because you aren't, or whatever reasoning they have for that. But divergent is what stood out the most for me. And so when a person, what was the thing that made a person divergent? Um, if they had more than one um, what skill, I don't know what they called it, but more than one attribute or whatever. Yeah, yeah, there mm -hmm. there were more than one faction. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It's a person who was realized, a person who was whole, a person mm -hmm. who could embody all. This is problematic. Wow, now I'm seeing it. Oh my God, there's five factions. 
Yep. And the divergent girl, she had all five. Yep. Mm -hmm. So she was in total homeostasis, just like your star. Okay. <laughs> okay. I told you five elements theory help you right. see the whole world different, child. Exactly. Everything you see, everything. <laughs> you was <Right>? not lying. <laughs> you was not lying. And in Bang. order for those types of societies to exist, you have to be sick. Yes. Yes. So here we are we are made to believe like this is what the utopia looks like. Everything seems peaceful on the surface, right? Everybody wears the same color, so it creates no conflict. Nobody's better than the other because of they Jordans or whatever the fuck. Like we really that shallow anyway. These mm -hmm. things are imposed on us. These antagonisms of comp competition are imposed on us based on hierarchies that already exist. Hierarchies of have and have nots, right? And our oh. proximity to either haves or have nots. Right. But I find it interesting because in this dystopian future where everybody has to dress alike in order for harmony to exist, <laughs> in order for um, um, what you call it, um, sovereignty to be um, honored in space. There's still something just below the surface that makes everybody uneasy or in the movie Divergent. There's this wall that they can't pass. There's this unknown wildness outside the pristine cities that were built mm -hmm. by these factions. Remember that? The big yes. walls that nobody should cross? Yes, it was electrified. So you they really want to keep the going. wild unknown. That's yeah. always a theme in those movies, too. You don't mm -hmm. want to go past the wall to the wild unknown. What's the wild unknown? It's your subconscious. It's the power, it's the mysteries, it's the secrets of the wild and unbridled that exist out there beyond our logical mind. See, this is a representation, again, of patriarchy, the logical mind, the thinking and the structure, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't even know how we got on this, but the virgin is one of the things that reminds me of um, what you, I remember what you just said, right? I'm not, that's not what I am envisioning. I am not envisioning some fake ass, um, you know, hidden dictatorship fronting as a utopia, because that's what those movies represent. A hidden dictatorship manipulating the population, keeping the peace, even though everybody there is has this nagging sense that something's not right, right? Um, and it's because there's a hidden dictatorship that has created its version of a utopia that keeps people in place, not challenging or bucking the system, right? That's not what I envision. So when I'm talking about how um, um, I'm not talking about, when I talk about um, harmony between the divine feminine and the sacred masculine, that means that once those poles are harmonized within themselves, that all the others that lay between the spectrum of race and gender and all and all these expressions that rest between the poles of black and white, right? Mm -hmm. um, that when I talk about the harmonizing of the divine masculine and sacred feminine, I'm not talking about the disappearance of individuality. There is a reason that the mother saw fit to have to treat us, to use us as what do I say? As peculiar expressions of herself. Each one of us is a peculiar and necessary pers um, personification of the mother. Each one of us is a peculiar and necessary expression of the one. We're all one. Mommy and I are one. We're all one in our relationship to her, in her body. We are all one. Just like all the billions of cells in our bodies make up the one personification that is me, right? We are the cells in her body each one with a necessary, because if we weren't necessary, we wouldn't be here. We would have died through miscarriage or we would have been aborted or we would have died in infancy. There are a million different ways that she can get rid of that, which does not belong, right? And so for me, it is, she is a peculiar and necessary, we are a peculiar and necessary expression of her in this period, in this time, right? Mm -hmm. And and in all time. So even the future that I imagine, fashion will not be some weird ass utopian, dystopian, blandlessness, like we forget how to fucking use color or some shit. It's not going to be like um, 
we all have these weird separations. We're talking in the in the party. We used to say that the world that we want to see made real is the eventual withering away of borders to be able to explore the mother to and fro with ease. How is the only way that that can happen? Through global sovereignty. How to ensure global sovereignty? Through the guarantee of individual sovereignty. I mean you no harm. But I mean you no more harm than I would harm myself. That's what sovereignty is. I honor your sovereignty because I honor my sovereignty, right? And um, and so the world that I see is not about like women not being able to be fully embodied expressions of females in this incarnation. And every expression from the maiden to the mother to the crone, right? And all the things in between, she can express exactly how she feels and needs to, and it be accepted and respected and honored in all spaces. She can have, because even when she talks about um, matriarchal societies, um, having the menstrual hut, right? I'm not talking about letting men into every space. Some things are peculiar to us. Our bodies do what others' bodies don't do. And yes, she was saying, yes, we can have space to honor where people, what she say? She said men supported the menstrual hut in this period. They covered, they take care of the babies, they surround so that the mothers can have a break and the mothers can be still so she can she can enter into, what did she say, ceremony in, this, in the menstrual hut, right? So I'm not talking about relinquishing space. I'm talking about letting them in on the secret that they have envied. I'm saying inviting them into spaces that we have kept from them. Like the story that I told you about the brother who wanted to become a doula. That is something that is very realizable. That is to me a very modern example of certain spaces that we can open up and say, yes, we invite you in. This is the way that you will learn. You will witness, you will be able to experience and participate in the giving of the mother's love that balances you as a man, that balances you to be able to give love the way that you received it from your mother. Right. Remember the story in the great cosmic mother where she talked about how if a man in a certain period, like Katal Hayuk or something like that, if he had had a dream, a certain type of dream, I forget what the dream was, but if he had had this kind of dream and he told the diviner that he'd had this dream, the remedy for this dream was that it was an omen that he was not that he was out of balance with his feminine principle. And that he would be told to dress like a woman for seven days and take a male lover until it brought him back into harmony. Why? To experience the receiving nature of the woman. Right? Because male is an external thing. It's an external pressure, external um, expression for him mm -hmm. to take a male lover and be the recipient of that kind of sex. It was said to bring him back into harmony with his feminine, feminine essence. Well, I'm not asking men who don't, who are not interested in having sex with other men and telling them that's the only way that they can harmonize their feminine principle. We can create new cultures and new society. And I'm saying, if a man says that because my partner is having a baby and I want to be an advocate for her, I should be able to scientifically, I should be able to enter into these spaces that have been previously reserved for women to show up in a better way for my partner, instead of just being reduced to an observer. Because a lot of males experience that. I did a whole um, workshop years ago on birthing alternatives for um, black and Latino women. This was back when I was in Tampa. And I marketed just as heavily to males as I did to females. I said men need to be in this discussion around the, um, the maternal and mortality rates of Black and Latino women, this is not a woman's issue. This is an issue that is challenging the ability for the community's children to thrive. Males and females need to be marketed to. So I marketed heavy. And I'm telling you, in a room that only had maybe about 50 people, half of them were males. And half of those males were not there with partners or booze. They were there, well, because I asked them to. You understand? Mm. I can I can be like that because I asked them to, but they showed up enthusiastically and I had a man on the panel. So when I, I had four people on the panel, myself, 
um, a woman who was the first licensed um, black acupuncturist in Florida. I had a woman who was a, an engineer turned midwife and her husband, who was an engineer who was teaching engineering. Right. And so people were like, why is he on the panel? Because she had become a midwife. So she talked about, you know, how she became a midwife, why she transitioned out of engineering, whatever, whatever. I said, because I wanted males to be able to hear a man's perspective of how he experienced the birth of his children. They had two children in the hospital and they had one child at home and their experiences in the hospital were what one prompted her to become a midwife and two um, um, prompted him to be fully supportive of them having their third child at home. Right. Mm -hmm. I wish in hindsight, because this was years ago, maybe 2011, 2012, that I had recorded this this um, presentation this brother made. Because we rarely, if ever, hear how men experience this whole process of inception, pregnancy, and the birth of their child. And it's typically as an observer. Yeah. And typically as an observer, and they are typically treated by their partners, they are typically mothered in this relationship. The mom is just directing the potential mother, the future mother is just directing her husband. I need this. I need that. Do this, do that. It's more like a mother son relationship than it is this man being able to fully show up for equitably this partner that is about to change both of them in this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So to hear this man talk about how he experienced the birth of his sons, both of his sons were born in hospitals, and to hear about how he experienced the birth of his daughter where his two sons and him were fully allowed, they had a midwife, were fully allowed to be actively uh, particip participative, if that's the word, um, participatory, maybe. I don't know. Uh, they were allowed to fully participate <clears throat> in the birth of their daughter and how his the birth of his sons, he said his words were, I felt completely disempowered. I felt useless. And the doctors made sure I felt useless. Wow. Was, and I know that this is the experience of a lot of men because we as women treat childbirth and a lot of issues as women's issues. I had a whole throwdown with a friend of mine when we were supposed to, we were all supposed to be going to this um, Women's History Month event. This was a couple of years ago. And I called him, I was like, yo, are you coming out to this March for Women's History Month? As a matter of fact, Roe versus Wade, the overturning of Roe versus Wade had just come down the pike. And uh, I was like, are you coming to this thing? And he was like, no, nah, um, that's a woman's thing. Y'all got that. Now this is, a, this is not no lay person. This is a very well-known, well-respected spiritual political leader in the city. That's some women. That's a women's thing. Y'all, I'll let y'all handle that. I said, brother, you are fucking way the fuck off, sir. You are way the fuck off. Yeah. I said, and it shouldn't be that you have daughters and a mama that allows you to at least empathize with things that that are important to women. This is not a woman's issue. The overturning of Roe versus Wade is not a woman's issue. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there are no women's issues. Everything that is important to women impacts the whole planet. Everything that happens to us impacts the whole planet. There are no women's issues. Y'all need to be brought into every, y'all need to be rallying behind everything we say is important. That's a woman's thing. Y'all got it. I'm going to let y'all handle that. No. And so the same thing with these events, even when I was in Tampa, um, I would do these uh, Women History Month events. I had a relationship with this brother who had this big, beautiful event center. And um, he never charged me a dime, this brother. Never charged me a dime. He said, make sure people come. Make sure they eat and drink. You can have the space as often as you want. He never charged me a dime for any event that I did there, not once. And so uh, every year for Women's History Month, I would do a Women's History Month event every Saturday for the month of March, every year that I was in Tampa. Every Saturday for the month of March, it was a different focus on the gifts and contributions or celebrating the gifts and contributions of women of color. Every every year, we would do one Saturday would be a whole marketplace of uh, 
uh, women of color entrepreneurs. The next week would be um, artistic gifts. We would have poets and musicians and dancers. That whole next one would be straight up musical and artistic performances, and there would still be a marketplace. The next one would be focused on education, the gifts and contributions of women of color in spaces where education is concerned, and um, so on and so on. And so health and wellness. So every week we did that every year for the month of March, right? Every year I marketed just as heavily to men as I did to women. And every year all the brothers were on deck far and wide to and fro from all races came in to center and show support for what women had created for the gifts and contributions of women. Understand? I think that's what's shaped <laughs> because that didn't happen that way when I was in the party. Right. And so I think that's why I've come to the conclusion that I've come to even where the temple is concerned is I know that the potential is there because I've seen it. Every time I organized an event, before I could even start making phone calls, if I put the article out in a paper, like put the event out in a paper, brothers from the Nation of Islam, brothers from different organizations from other cities would be calling me, say, sis, how you need us to show up, what you need us to do. You need some security. You need us to hand out some flyers. But, but that was the reputation I built out there. They called me, how do you need us to show up in space? So I know the potential is there. Even when we have backwards ass ideologies, we still are humans and we can still speak to each other's heart. I do not co-sign on the nation of Islam, never have. No doctrine, no ideology from the nation of Islam, never have. But the unifying point with me and these men and women that I worked with in Tampa in the nation of Islam is points of unity. What are our points of unity? You give a damn about black people? Cool. We both agree on that. You want to see black people thrive, living well, benefiting off the fruits of their labor. We all agree on that. Cool. You want to see an end to the violence and oppression against black people. We all agree on that. Cool. We don't have to agree on everything. We can we can establish points of unity to start with points of unity and doing the work together is what changes us in these spaces. I don't have to go toe to toe with the ideology of the nation of Islam or why I don't fuck with Louis Farrakhan. These brothers and sisters on the ground in Tampa, Florida who love black people and do the work every day that is indicative of human beings who love black people. They weren't proselytizing. These brothers and sisters in Tampa and the nation of Islam were doing work. They taught, they taught self-defense classes, brothers and sisters in the nation of Islam. They taught practical shit like how to preserve food how to do canning and um, jarring of food. The women would come and teach wellness workshops, how to take your own um, blood pressure, how they were doing active work. And that's all, that's all, that was enough for me. I don't have to talk to you about Louis Farrakhan or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or none of that. We don't have to go to war over that. That's you. You love black people. You want to see black people made well. You want to see black people empowered. We can get down with that. Cool. That's all right. Let's go. Let's go. We did radical work in Tampa. We did radical work in the whole state of Florida. I created this organization called the uh, Florida, uh, the Florida Black Empowerment Collective because we were so spread out out there in terms of organizers where we started connecting regionally because I, I was going all over the state. I'd go to Miami, I'd go to Fort Lauderdale, I'd go to Orlando, Tampa, Gainesville, Jacksonville, bigger cities in Florida. Meet all these organizers from all over the area. So we started collectivizing our events. They're building in their local areas and they'd have these small organizations, 10, 15 people, 20, 20 people, whatever, whatever. But we started doing events where one quarter, everybody from the state would come to that one region to support their event. They could branch out, they could grow their ranks, right? They could meet other people. And then we'd go over here to Orlando where they do an event and everybody from the state would pile up over there. Same thing in, uh, same thing in Fort Lauderdale and Miami. It was really radical work. You understand? So I know the potential is there. I know enough men who, even if they still hold on to some lingering backwards ways, they love black people. I know Mashika men who, even if they're still holding on to and lingering in some, some misogynistic ways, 
I believe that they love their people. Indigenous men, they love their people. There's evidence of it. Even if they're still holding on to some of their conditioning, how do we find points of unity, work in those spaces, set the terms that the mother has set, and see who will, as a consequence of working together in spaces where we have set the terms? Like I set the terms in Tampa for every event. I set the terms for every event that I organize, every single one. And men always came in humbly and gracefully and complied. Yes, we, we see this work you're doing, Sister Iapo. What you need, tell us what you need. And I ain't got no blowback, blowback from any of them. They showed up. So I know the potential is there. We have to set the terms. We have to say what the vision is and see who will comply. Because at the same time, we're telling them that they have to be a mother to us. They are complying to the will of the mother. <coughs> this way. It's not a one way. It's not a one directional relationship that I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about us ceding, conceding no space or no territory. I'm saying that multiple things can be true at the same time. Women need to be safe. We still, And I said that earlier. We still yeah. need to have women's circles. We still need to have men's circles. We still have to have spaces that are peculiar for people who have a very similar lived experience. I would imagine we still have to have spaces where it may just be me. It may be me and three other women or something who, um, who lead circle for white people, for white women, for white men, because these are two peculiar lived experiences. Mm -hmm. Right? So I thought about all of this, like, yes, we'll have temple service. That's our general service. And we take the oath to say that we're going to honor each other's sovereignty. That ain't no shit that's going to happen overnight, honoring each other's sovereignty when we got all these preconceived notions and ideas based on lived experiences about how we perceive everybody else in the room. So we're going to need these spaces that are peculiar to each group and help chisel away their conditioning by constantly bringing them in the space and saying, if you want to be in this space, you have to honor the oath. You have to honor each other's sovereignty. This is the future in the now. This space that we got for two hours is the future in the now. This is what it, this is the image that we can give to the world. This not some, oh, we're all in this together because we're all standing in space. Mm -hmm. We're all standing still. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. Deconstructing imperial white power in these spaces deconstructing isms in these spaces so that we go into these spaces and say, this is what the potential for the future is. Not absolution, not as long as there's peace on the plantation, peace is, things are peaceful. As long as people ain't fighting back, things are peaceful. That's not what I'm talking about either. This, this idea is so radical. I know what it is. That <laughs> you, I think you're going to, in, in the near future, I think you're going to spend a lot of time fighting against the constructs of people in people's minds because it's so out there. It's, just, it's, it's, it's huge, it's big, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, but it is, it's, it's, it feels intangible, it feels ab abstract, right? And, and only because it's hard to wrap our current minds around this, this new idea, this new way of doing things that we, like we've never seen before. Then you're going to spend a lot of time hitting up against that construct. Well, I'll tell you what makes me confident. And Not to say that you can't do it, but I'm just, I can just. Oh, no, 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 no. I accept that. I accept, I get what you're saying. I accept that. Um, but I'll tell you what makes me confident. Um, I'll tell you what makes me audacious is that everything that we are experiencing right now in the world, everything has an origin, has a beginning. Mm -hmm. Everything, every religion has a beginning, has a starting point. Somebody had to come up with the idea yeah. before Hinduism became an organized religion. It was a bunch there of people a... sitting around talking mm -hmm. about it. Like Damn, this sounds good. Let, let me tell you about this dream I had last night, bro. You right. feel me? <laughs> I had many arms. What does that mean? You feel me? <laughs> yeah. Everything that we accept wholeheartedly mm -hmm. do not even challenge it it is just what it is because it always has been well it hasn't always has been hinduism hasn't always has been right. hinduism is six thousand years old right 
Traditional Chinese theory in medicine is 5,000 years old. Comedic tradition is what? That, that we know. The dynastic period started mm -hmm. in 5,000 BCE, uh, 6,000 BCE, 5,000 BCE, something like that. Um, so in the scale of human history, it hasn't always been. It hasn't always been. There is an origin for everything that is. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm audacious and confident. Everything that ever started, everything that ever began, began the same way this is. Radical and oh my God, there's nothing like this. Where the fuck did this come from? Motherfuckers talking about having dreams and getting downloads and shit. And then it comes together because more and more people are saying all throughout this feed today, oh my God. I was just thinking about this. This is amazing. I couldn't articulate it. I couldn't put it to words, but I felt it over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Somebody has the audacity to speak what hasn't been spoken out loud and recognizing, oh, just like we was on the book club. Remember what happened mm -hmm. when I did the introduction on the book club? And over and over and over again, 20 some women on the call. Damn, I thought I was the only one. Like, yeah. why there ain't no, nobody around me that's thinking the things I'm thinking or fe feeling the things I'm feeling? Well, I sound like a weirdo every time I open my mouth. I thought I was the only one. And then I get on the call and everybody's saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have to suffer in silence and isolation because the mother is using this instrument to expedite the process of bringing us together. It's not going to take us a thousand years to build this something new that it might have taken to build, to create Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's a couple hundred years, a few hundred years for Christianity to become a force that was acknowledged and to be reckoned with. It took mm -hmm. hundreds of years for that to happen. Yeah. Right? Islam, the same way, 300 years it took for it to become a, a consolidated, accepted idea, a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. Right? It ain't going to take that for us because we have instruments and technology and lived experiences of all that came before us that expedite this process. So, yes, it may sound foreign and insane. And, oh, my God, we've never seen anything like it. And we don't have a frame of reference for it. But that's what the uncovering of the secrets that have been kept from us about women's contributions to half of human history there's a reason that it's kept secret is because we do have a frame of reference. If we look deeper, if we go deeper, right. some things have been lost, but that's okay. Cause guess where they exist in our motherfucking cells in our goddamn cellular <laughs> memory <laughs> in our motherfucking DNA. mitochondrial DNA. That's where they still exist. So yeah, they might've burnt down the libraries at Alexandria. They might've destroyed the, the universities at Timbuktu, but guess what? Every professor, every teacher, every every seer, every magician, every wizard that ever existed, guess what? They had a mama. <laughs> they had a mama who gave in them her mitochondrial DNA, which came back from the one which connects every last one of us. All of us have this information locked, lay dormant in our genes, waiting to spring the fuck open. But if we're constantly in fight or flight mode, we're constantly restricted, we're constantly exhausted. These cells are only functioning at the base level of survival. They are not relaxed enough to let loose that which they are holding secret, still locked inside all the cells. They're all there. So when we think like some people will reduce what happened to me last week to, oh, that's just your imagination, girl. You've just been eating too many mushrooms, whatever. What? I didn't eat mushrooms that night. I went out to the club. You feel me? I went to have a couple cocktails, get my swerve on. And she woke my ass up at five o'clock in the morning, seeing fractals as if I had eaten a fish fistful of mushrooms. Now get your ass up and hear what the hell I got to say. But, but it's because I've done this for so long. I trust me. So even if it's quote, my imagination, where my, where my imagination came from, where does it emanate from? Where do these images come from? The there ain't no reducing what I say. <laughs> There's no reducing what I see. I trust it. Mm -hmm. I trust it. Because I trust me. I trust my mama. I trust my big mama. I trust my grandma Helen. I trust all they sons. I trust my daddy, my uncles, my grandpa. Because I trust all they mothers. 
So that's that's why we're, even when I'm talking about men need to cover, protect, support, support into, secure that which women create. That's why. Can we free this shit up and make this shit pop already? Yes, it's because we need a break. Yes, it's because we earned a break. Yes, it's because we need the rest. But it is still purposeful. It's still purposeful. And that's all I'm saying is like, I envision the radical unleashing of the genius that has been locked, trapped inside the bodies of women. That once that she says it over and over again, it is only through a well-rested you that I can do my best work. It is only through a well-rested you that I can do my best work. It is only, don't get busy, baby. Don't get busy in the brain. See where you can take rest. Don't be busy on purpose. Don't get busy to avoid me. We do that. Because this shit be deep. Sometimes it's so deep. I'm like, I don't want to know right now. Okay. I don't want to see shit right now. <laughs> I don't want to hear right now. Okay. So I'm going to just get busy. Don't avoid me. Don't avoid me. Be still. Be still. It is only through a well-rested you that I do my best work. And so that's the call is can you support, corral around, surrender to while covering, protecting, feeding, nourishing, pouring into the mothers. Knowing that you can only benefit from the outcome. You can only benefit. And yes, it's radical. It's the most radical and outlandish thing imaginable. And maybe aren't we at a point, point in human history where that's what we need? Yes, we are definitely in a crisis. And it's that's what we take, need. It's going to take the most radical. awesome, radical, extreme, imaginable to that which has been presented to us as the only way forward. That's what we need. That's what people need. They need to be like, you motherfucking right. Everything she said. It's hit me in the chest. Like I just got kicked in the chest by a donkey. Damn. So simple. But makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Because we've been told struggle is the only way. Not simple. Not taking the path of least resistance. That you need to struggle. You need to go through the path that's the hardest. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. No. What do they say? Go with the flow. Like when JFK said, we don't do things because they're easy. We do things because they are hard. <laughs> Wait, say that again? When JFK said, we don't do things that are easy. We do things because they are hard. Coming from a real Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like some real Catholic shit right there. <laughs> that sounds like some real Catholic shit right there. Yeah. Yes. Breakthrough has always come that yeah, I will say breakthrough has come through periods of ease, but they were, they were still their struggle because we resist what's easy. We're like, Oh, that's too easy. What do we say? That's too good to be true. We have all of these ways that we're conditioned to accept that struggle is the only way struggle is the legitimate way. Cause it's noble. Mm -hmm. That's like, what martyrism, it, that's that's what what martyrism does. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what martyr syndrome is. That's what, uh, what is it? Um, uh, asceticism teaches you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it's the more you can suffer, the more righteous you are. Yeah. At least if you're a man, <laughs> you know <what> I'm saying. <laughs> if you struggle as a woman, it's just your lot in life. Right. But if you suffer as a man, this is really something to be upheld. I mean, shit, we can make you a saint depending upon how deep your struggle was. Cause that shit's only reserved for females. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yo, this was this was awesome. We need to have these kind of really if I had if I had it like that, we'd be doing this every day. I ain't gonna lie. It would be just straight up open lives. Let's let's go ahead and figure out the future. Let's go ahead, take notes. Everybody, can we get a dictator? Everybody take notes. I, can we get an artist? You know, one of them artists in real time that be drawing people faces and shit. Mm -hmm. uh, we need you to draw the future. You know what I'm saying? If I say this is what an animated workforce looks like in this new age that is, um, you know, that is liberating human beings from the toil of labor to earn a right to exist on this planet, uh, draw that. What do the homes in the future look like once we have decided that we have all the scientific 
all the scientific evidence, data, and experiments necessary ever to, to really do away with all waste. Some young person somewhere in under urgency has created some way to eliminate the planet of waste. Now, how do we go to all the landfills in the world, uh, dig up all the waste and transform it into energy surplus that we can use without having to use oil, gas, petroleum, shit like that. Every problem that exists right now, there's a solution for. Not in my imagination. I've seen it. I've seen it. I can give you video after video after video of people solving the problems. Native American young people creating um, um, generators out of shit that they get out of landfills uh, polluting the reservation. Uh, the man, Michael Reynolds, in New Mexico creating beautiful mansion-style self-sustaining homes all completely off-grid out of 85 to 95% recycled materials, tires, cans, glass, bottles, beautiful. What about those earth ships? Yes, baby, yes. Yeah. Yes. Gorgeous. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. And he's going around to countries in the third world um, creating workshops for the creation of earth ships um, for free so that people can start to eliminate, one, waste, that's dumped by these corporations in the third world, Haiti, and he did one in Jamaica and uh, some other place, conflict regions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, and then the little white kid who found a way, created this little like thing that filters the microplastics out of the ocean. A little high school kid created that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the woman in, um, what country was she in? There's story after story after story on the continent. One woman was um, working in plantain fields and they would get, you know, all the, the waste from the plantain fields was primary the leaves and the stalks and, and some of the peels and stuff were drawing mosquitoes. So it's causing a multiplicity of issues. It was a waste issue. It was drawing mosquitoes. So it was creating, you know, causing malaria, whatever. And she was like, man, we're getting rid of all this waste. And there, there has to be a way for us to use this waste. Start, started a paper, a, um, a paper company out of the waste from the plantain, the plantain plantations. Mm -hmm. I forget what country, but her paper sells all over the United States, all over European countries and all over Asia. She was able to hire hundreds of people by taking this waste and turning it into um, turning it into paper. Another brother who was working in the fishing industry in Africa and turned um, the byproducts of these fishes, these fish into um, a more sustainable type of leather, fish leather, right? People are solving the problems in a state of crisis. Th these are people who are in, in, in places that are in crisis Saying we gotta we gotta solve multiple problems at one time. The brother in um in um was he, it wasn't Bangladesh, it was uh Tibet. He was in Tibet and he went to school to become an engineer in Europe and just so he could come home and solve the primary problems of impacting his people in Tibet, which was uh pollution, um, because they don't have great um infrastructure waste removal infrastructure, deforestation, because it's trees are still the primary, we're still the primary source of cooking for the poor people, the poor people out in the rural communities. And then for the people in the rural communities, death by respiratory distress, because they were, cook, they were burning wood indoors to cook, which was causing respiratory diseases, right? The leading cause of death at the time was um, death by respiratory distress. Hmm. And he created a technology that addressed and resolved all three. A brother in Haiti who, because people don't have access to fresh fruit and vegetables, their primary staples are beans, rice, and um, meat, were suffering from all kinds of delayed development. Um, hair wouldn't grow, teeth wouldn't cut, uh, all kinds of like serious nutritional deficiencies because they didn't have access to clean uh, to um, produce because of the deforestation in Haiti. And he started going out to the, the, the beaches where all these companies will dump their tire waste, tires. 
and start having people take the tires back into the inner cities and started doing trifold um, upraised gardens. He would um, petition companies to send bags of organic soil and would take these tires and put them on a tri uh, triframe and he would have three or four tires on each triframe and um, put wood, a big wood panel down in the bottom, fill the tire up with organic soil through companies that he had reached out to in the, in the north and organic seeds, heirloom seeds, and plant seeds in individuals' homes so that they could have, solve two problems. They could have fresh fro produce for themselves to eat and then take the excess into the market to now have a new market, a new um, item that they can sell on the market, this fresh mm -hmm. produce. That's what I want the temple to do. I want the temple to galvanize. I want us to make a lot of money. I want us to get all the grants. There are so many big, massive grants out here. A friend of mine who um, works for this um, project through the um, LAUSD just got a $16 million grant disseminated over five years to create programs in the city for certain um, certain groups of kids, right? So there's massive grants out here in California. That's one thing that we have access to as a, as a religious 501c3. <laughs> but we have to build the programming that, that justifies, you know, writing these grants. And I want to raise a lot of money. I want to have big fucking parties like that bullshit in the desert, Burning Man. I want to yeah. do them kind of parties where all the proceeds except what it takes to execute the event, what it takes to pay the executors of the event, all the profit are split three ways or four ways, uh, quarterly or biannually to our three biggest, you know, our three biggest um, organizations or individuals doing this radical work that can't get the same kind of uh, financial support. I would love to send money to this brother in Haiti. I ain't going to participate in all the things, but people change in the world. We, we, focused here in the Americas, in the North, where we have access to wealth. Yes, we've got our own particular problems, but we do have access to currency. How can we support the work people around the world are doing, knowing that that's a direct line contributing to what it is we want to see made real? Because there are people out here already solving the problems. We don't have to have an answer to all the problems. The world is being, the world is being created. How can we pour into it? How can we? I want to do that. I want to, today simple service is me talking. This ain't going to be temple service for forever. Hopefully not, not even the rest of the year. Temple service for me, if I had my rathers, 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. with live bands, with uh, party favors, like mushroom cocktails, <laughs> you understand? Um, <laughs> I know you telling the I'll truth. Clear <laughs> so funny. Let me tell you where I got the idea from. There's a documentary called um, "Music Is the Weapon." Have you seen this? It's about the life of Fela Kuti. No. Music is the weapon. I saw this documentary. I don't know, ten years ago, twelve years ago. And Fela Kuti, I love Fela Kuti. I love the music of Fela Kuti. Fela Kuti was a problematic human being, child. <laughs> problematic in so many ways, but I love the music and I love the vision. Music is the Weapon is a good documentary, but there's a scene in the documentary. Uh, they used to perform at this club in Nigeria called The Shrine. Okay? And The Shrine um, was an indoor, outdoor. It was like covered and uncovered. And they would just, they would go. But in the shrine, on the wall, on one of the walls of the shrine, was a massive altar. Ceiling to floor, wall to wall, massive altar. It had everybody on it. It had his mom and daddy on it. It had uh, Marcus Garvey. It had Malcolm X. It had Harry Tubb. It had everybody, everybody on this big-ass ancestral altar inside this club called the shrine. Huge. And so they'd be jamming, ah, doing their music, da, 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 right? And then at a certain hour of the night, the music would stop. The lights would go down. The candles would be lit. And he would um, initiate ceremony. 
He would do an ancestral veneration ceremony at a certain hour of the night. Straight up ceremony. Everybody participate. After the ceremony was over, lights come on. Band commits to playing. Women commits to juking. Party on. They don't leave till seven o'clock in the morning. That moment, I was like, oh my God. That is what church is supposed to be. We're all the things embodied in one place. Not you go out Saturday night and got to repent on Sunday. Mm -hmm. No. No. Fully embodied ceremony. Dance, worship, praise, libations, ceremony. That was the day. That was the day. I was like, if I ever, if I ever create some shit, that's what service going to look like. That's what temple going to look like. That's what Temple going to look like. That's coming soon. That's coming sooner than you think. <laughs> that's coming, whether we got a building or not, that's coming sooner than you think. Yes. Yeah. So once we grow the temple, and I, I even, when I went out and went to the dirt the other day, you know, I had prayers in my mind, things that I want to be made real. Like the temple, I we want brick and mortar this year. That's, I guarantee. I know it seems ambitious. I don't need to know how it's going to happen. That is, We're going to have a space that has ours this year. We are. I'm certain of that. I have some, I have some, I have some desires in terms of buildings. There are some really beautiful abandoned buildings in this city that I would love to see us posted up in. I ain't going to, there's a building three blocks from my house called the Cinerama. It was built in 1969, I think. It is a geodesic dome right in the heart of Hollywood that used to be one of the most famous theaters. It's shaped like a half wound, like a uterus. I was like, wouldn't this be perfect for us to be set it up in, at least to do the ceremonies, at least to do the services. That's a beautiful building. I would love that building. Mm -hmm. um, another building down across the street from MacArthur Park. I am obsessed with this building and it is empty. And it is gorgeous. It's beautiful art deco, like turn of the century architecture is gorgeous. It's been mm. sitting there for so long. Mm -hmm. it, this would be, be the administrative building. It's like it's like that. It has like event center space in the building, but the majority of it is it's offices, administrative. Mm, I want this building, right? Um, so we have to put that out. I have to put out the things that we need, right? Yeah. Uh, I want a lot of access to this space that we just did the ceremony in the desert. Like, I want a lot of, like, if I had my way, now he told me that he has partners, the guy that owns the space, he has partners, and his partners want to sell, right? Um, he doesn't want to sell. And he said, you know, he's always looking for a way, contemplating how, like, to buy them out. The property is appraised at, at eight million. But he's like, the way the market is right now, we probably couldn't get six for the property. I don't want to sell. I would love to buy them out. And the whole time, because he's giving me the numbers. I'm like, bitch, okay, so we need to be focusing on how to raise this money. We need to get, we need to raise it. We need this money to come. I would love to own this property. I just got to put it out there. I would love to own this property. Yes. And build like a shrine right on top of the the peak where the fault line is and have that be a divining center for the Sybils. Mm -hmm. Just like in the old days. Yes, baby. Construct a freaking temple right on top of the peak portion of that damn uh, fault line that that shit sits on top of. And yes, invite Sybils to come and sit in ceremony with the mother on this fault line and see what, see what comes through. See what comes through. That would be a radical ambition. It would require a lot more than $8 million. Mm -hmm. But it's not outside the realm of possibility. I know that. And even if it was an, a working relationship, even if we could create the opportunity for this dude to buy out his partners, I'm okay with that. As giving as he is, as open as he is to the more radical aspects of what it is I'm trying to create. I'm okay with that. Yeah. So, yeah. We still have to do an event, two more events. Because I'm, I'm, I've been invited to speak at two events. 
But in terms of me organizing any events for the rest of the year, I'm telling you, the only thing that I can focus on is us doing an event on November 19th, which is what I've been talking to y'all about for four years. Yeah, and that's then, the big one for me, too. Yeah, that's the big one. We have to, we, uh, maybe I need to do like a, I don't Especially know. Especially being a Capricorn and it finally even my sign. And I've been contending with the planet Pluto for the last 30 years. So to see it finally um, move on, <laughs> you girl, <laughs> move on. Yeah. Hell, I mean, I've had so, so many lessons. I mean, Pluto is a very giving, um, generous. Yes. Yes. The lessons are hard like yep. with the planet Saturn, but there's, there's slow moving, you know, it takes, cause, but it, cause, cause it really gets down in the crawl, right? Mm -hmm. It gets in that place where your regular scrub brush can't reach. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it pulls everything up to the surface, you know, and, you know, and that is the, the job of, of Scorpio to go deep and, and, and it goes deep to reveal what's hidden and bring it to the surface so it can be seen and dealt with or for whatever. But mm -hmm. um, so Pluto is currently at the moment out, but I know it's coming back for that month. And I'm, I'm kind of like on pins and needles, like, okay, what are you going to do to me in this last month? Because, mm -hmm. because the last six months that it came back into the sign, I knew it was coming back in to tie it loose ends. And I knew that, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so, cause I have had done so much work, especially in the last four or five years, I've done so much work. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, you're gonna come back in, tie up these loose ends. I didn't realize what that meant until I went through those six months. And it was things mm -hmm. that, I, that I knew I had dealt with, but it was like, okay, yes, you dealt with this, but you hadn't tied this off. And that was, <laughs> that was some, that was some hard work to do. Baby, it's brutal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I yes. told you I got a Capricorn moon, so I was mm -hmm. clear. As soon as I started <laughs> learning about this transition, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> it was like yeah. everything, no wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, it is such a laborious and we've all been experiencing it because Pluto moved into Capricorn in 2008. Mm -hmm. So all of this harsh, sharp yeah. edge changes mm -hmm. over all these revelations, the Me Too movement and, you know, the Occupy Wall Street always revealing these things that have been hidden, mm -hmm. supposedly kept secret, the Epstein yeah. thing and the if all this, the subprime mortgage scandal, all of these things is indicative of this mm -hmm. relationship between Pluto and um, and Capricorn, Capricorn yeah. resistant, digging mm -hmm. its heels in. Like, I'm a bitch. These are the institutions that are here to stay. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you yeah. mean you came here to, to change some shit? No. And she's like, bag, yeah, I did. I came here to wreck all this shit. Mm -hmm. All this shit you didn't build, I came. I came to change it all. I came to change everything. So, mm -hmm. yes, you're going to give me about 10 years of fighting and resisting, but yeah. it's inevitable. Yeah. It's inevitable. I have a I have a stellum in Capricorn and a stellum in Sagittarius and Mars is at the at, at the far end is at the end of um Scorpio. Mm. So Pluto has conjunct almost every single planet in my chart for the last Ooh. 30 years. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Oh, let me see if I, I've been fighting with my chart lately. Let me see if I have it over here. I may not. Oh, yeah, I do. Hold on. Because my chart is is pretty wild. I still need to find somebody to help me interpret. Because I got all kinds of wild shit on my chart. Um, in my fifth house, I have, um, let's see. I got Pluto. 
I got Mercury, and I got Uranus. This is a conjunction. In your fifth house, you have Mercury. Mercury, uh, I have Mercury, Pluto, and um, let's see, Uranus. Mercury, Pluto, and, Ur and Uranus all in my fifth house. In your house. fifth house. How? Uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then I have in my sixth house um, the North Node. And what's in, your, what's in your 11th house? My 11th house is jam packed too. It's a conjunction. It's, um, it's, um, I think it's a, is it a meteor palace? Is a meteor, right? Meteor palace. Yeah, I think the, um, the oh, woman had. Oh, I know you're talking about the meteor. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I got palace, Jupiter, and, um, Palace, Jupiter, and Chiron <laughs> in my 11th house. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, so those are the two big conjunctions. So I got Palace, yes, Jupiter, and Chiron. Is Jupiter and Chiron conjunct? Yes. Yes. And in the fifth house, Mercury is Pluto, Pluto Uranus, and... Um, Pluto, Uranus, and Mercury. Are they conjunct? Yes. Ooh, mama. Mm-hmm. And then I don't have any movements whatsoever in uh, any planets, any at all in my seventh or my ninth house. What do you have in your first house? Um, my first house, I have... Uh, Mars. I have Mars. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mars at 17 degrees, um, 36 degrees uh, Aries. Yep. Yep. I can see why you, um, you're, I, I, can, I can see why you're a sapiosexual. Sapio -se um, person, how the the brain is what turns you on, um, mm. because your first house, your house itself, um, you have a very strong masculine self, so you don't necessarily need that from a man. You yeah. need the yeah. intellect. Yeah. Yes. Um. I'm multitasking. I'm still listening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm I'm seeing your chart in my head. That's why I'm, I'm pausing. Um, I would love to send it to you if you can help explain some shit. Sure. Uh, I know that. Um, like I got, I just got my chart done maybe three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, four four years ago. It's still a mystery to mm -hmm. me. I still I know that there are mm -hmm. things in it that if I understood it would like be revealed to me. I told you I went through like. Um, I went through piece by piece, just kind of Googling, okay, what does it mean when, you know, um, you have a, oh, it wasn't Gemini. And when you have a Mars at 17 degrees in my first house, Mars at 17 degrees, um, uh, Gemini 36, uh, 36, um, what is it? 36 degrees, right? And I would Google that. What does it mean? What are the characteristics of this placement in your first house? And I would do that. I probably could just do that all the way through. But um, I told you when I did that, I didn't write notes. I just did it like on a whim. Mm -hmm. That two of the things that I'd always been joking about actually showed up in my chart. One, yeah. I'd always been saying I wanted to do movie reviews, mm -hmm. like old school, uh, what is it, C School and Ebert movie reviews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my chart actually said you would do, you would make a lot of money doing movie reviews. And then I always joked about jumping up on a pole somewhere. Not one of these days I'm going to be a stripper and girl, <laughs> did you know, it said I would have a thriving career as a sex worker. My chart said that. Mm -hmm. Right. I was like, wow, that's amazing. 
Yeah. So this yeah. is like a puzzle that I have to solve. So this is my attempts at solving the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Like I got my chart <laughs> and a kind of like brief breakdown of it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, this is my attempts at trying to understand it the way I understand you. So it's kind of <laughs> chaotic. All right. Now I've got to go. Now we at seven okay. hours and I got to go to work. Are we at seven hours for real? Girl, six hours and 43 minutes. <laughs> six hours and 43 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Wow. I'll tell you, okay. if I didn't have to go to work, I'd probably get up, go to lunch. Take a little break and come right back. And do come back. Over again. <laughs> this is this is fun. This is medicine for me. Right, me too. Yes. Well, I appreciate you rocking with me. Yeah, I hopefully appreciate this you thing. having me on and, and um say that again. Gave, I said I appreciate you having me on and giving me a space to talk. I really appreciate that. I really and I really appreciate appreciated the input and the breakthrough. That was pretty fucking genius. It had not occurred to me the whole Jerome Saint Jerome thing and, mm-hmm. and mimicking the mother's process. I was like, damn, yes, oh my god, yeah, yeah. that's deep. Yeah, and it just the 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 thing about there's another thought that I had. We probably I'll probably talk about it a, a, another day, but just the 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 fact that men. And, and women, of course, but men and men, they're both male and female, right? But they, it, we look at them as suppressing the female and they have this rage and everything. And I'm, and I'm thinking, are they really suppressing rage or are we experiencing the Kali through men? Girl, We're giving them Durga I'll love and they're, they're responding to us in, in, Kali. Well, so 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 are so is it? Are we? Are we experiencing the wrath and the rage of the mother through men? What I say the last week, last week, I was like, oh my god, I said Shango is Oya's ego, right? Um, Shiva who lays himself at Kali's feet, right? Mm -hmm. Kali, Kali. That's that's what that was one of the things I was like, damn, because we're in the Kali Yuga right now, right? And they say that Kali, where is that book at? They say that Kali, you know, is the destroyer of the male ego, mm-hmm. right? That's the, that's the legend. Is right. that the demon that she is slaying is the male's ego? The demon that that th- the male ego, the demon that threatens the existence of the world. Hold on. I know it looks like chaos in here, but it's organized chaos. You feel me? I know exactly where everything is. So um, it says that, let's see here. You would bring up something deep and profound as we close it. You know, that's just the Pluto in me. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> probably why i let you it's the pluto with me okay all right so it says um she is earth she is the source of all life all creating and all consuming she who gives victory of good over evil um she gives the gift of freedom especially from fear freedom from fear Ask for clarity and perceptiveness. She removes all mental obstacles. The destroyer of inner demons. She is the destroyer of inner demons. Rebirth, cycles, joy, courage, hope, cleansing, change. Then it tells you what you can offer to her. She protects uh, against violence against women. Um, She aids in letting go of old patterns. Um. Hmm. Yeah, we need to be doing tons of rituals to um to Kali. Yeah, yeah that, I can see. That's, yep, that's my girl. Yeah, yeah. It seems like because that's what everybody's talking about now. Is we're leaving the Kali Yuga. We're leaving the Kali Yuga, but I don't see how that can happen if we don't learn the lessons of the Kali Yuga. And that's not what's happening. We're not learning the lessons of the Kali Yuga. Mm-hmm. 
You understand? We need to be doing a lot of rituals to Kali, I see. And to Oya. All the destroyers, because all of them are in play right now. Um, yeah. All Eris is in play right now. Um, Pluto, as Oya, is in play right now. Kali. Kali is actually said to be um, Saturn, I think. Which would make sense. If it's um, I think, yeah, I think they say Kali is like as a planet, Kali is uh Saturn. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I might be no, I think that's right. I think it's Saturn. Um, yeah, but let's 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 table this for another day. I got a shift yeah. brain to get ready to <laughs> go rub on people's backs and shit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's revisit that. Put a note in that so I don't forget because yeah, I want to talk about that. I like that. Um, I'm working the rest of the day, but I heard that. I like, yeah, these comments, man, they just kept coming, kept coming. I've never seen y'all comment this much. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, these comments are actually freaking great. Damn, and there's still more comments. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm just going to have to leave this open so I can get to them all. Man, there was a gang of comments. Yeah, we needed this. This is great. All right, so I'm going to go. I'm going to pull myself together, but we're mm -hmm. going to revisit this. I'm going to make a schedule for the rest of the week because I still, it is my commitment to finish reading uh, the parable of the sower this week. I think we can do it. We're more than halfway through the book. So I want to do that every day. Um, and so, yeah. All right. This is awesome. Love you for it. This was great. Yeah. This was thank great. You. We've, we've been trying and, to say uh, goodbye for the last couple of hours and we're like, no, wait a minute. What? <laughs> we'll, we'll I know, right? Uh, right? But it'd be like, like, I, I don't know. Because these are the spaces that if we were, you know, if we were closed, we would be we would be doing regularly. That would be right. like whole, how the old heads did it. You know, they get together every day on the mountainside and talk about what the religion going to look like, what it is going to tell people. God said, you feel me? What came in yeah. your dream? What came in my dream? Now we are we are actively doing that. So I don't mind that it's been seven hours. OK, we yeah. need this. Um. Yeah, so I'll make the schedule for the week. We are definitely doing the book club this Wednesday. So I'll send out the information about that. Um, I'll do that tonight. So we have at least, you know, a couple of days to kind of review, listen to the listen to the readings that are going to uh, cover what we're going to be discussing. And um, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. This is so good. This was so good. All right, y'all. All right. Have a good one. All right, sis. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Peace.